1997 Royal Rumble was held in San Antonio, Texas on the 19th of January 1997. Around 60,000 fans packed the Alamo Dome to see hometown hero Shawn Michaels try to win back the WWF Championship against Psycho Sid in the main event, and fans would also see the 30-man Royal Rumble match featuring stars of the WWF and a few competitors from the AAA promotion. The amount of fans who attended the Royal Rumble is quite surprising when you consider the WWF were having trouble selling out Raw venues in late 1996. It's incredible to see a crowd of around 60,000 people like this when business was so down and when the television ratings were so bad in comparison to WCW Monday Nitro. But competitive prices, family discounts and comp tickets helped out a lot here. The Alamo Dome in San Antonio, Texas looked good on TV and it gave the impression that fans were eager to see the event, so it's a win-win really. If perception is reality, then the perception was that the WWF could fill up a dome venue with over 60,000 fans. The free for all show featured the quote mini wrestlers in a tag team bout, and we had a mini Mankind and mini Vader competing inside the ring. La Parquita also competed in this tag team match, a mini version of La Parca, who by this time had signed a deal with WCW. Our opening match is for the Intercontinental Championship, Goldust challenges Triple H. This feud began back at the In Your House 12 It's Time Free For All when it looked like Hunter tried to make a pass at Marlena. The video package before the match puts forward a question to viewers at home. Is Triple H really attracted to Marlena or is he doing this to provoke Goldust? Goldust's character at this point really lacked what made him so controversial just a year prior. The gimmick had been getting toned down since the summer of 1996 and by turning Goldust into a babyface, a lot of things that made the character interesting to watch had been taken away. Triple H meanwhile has a new heater saying as the Mr. Perfect thing didn't work out. Mr. Hughes, Hunter's butler, escorts Helmsley to the ring and yeah, this wouldn't last long. A certain female superstar was going to debut in a matter of weeks and Triple H would end up with a much more interesting bodyguard. Goldust attacks during Helmsley's entrance and we get a great shot of the venue as the action gets inside the ropes. Goldust throws Hunter out of the ring and Triple H gets dropped on the guardrail and when the action resumes inside the ropes, Goldust goes for 10 punches in the corner. Hunter gets out by performing an inverted atomic drop and he tries to end it with a pedigree but a slingshot counter sends Hunter to the outside once again. Goldust then drops the ring steps across Hunter's back, Mr. Hughes does absolutely nothing, and the referee also allows the match to continue. Goldust continues to use the steps to gain an advantage, but it's all for nothing. Triple H manages to snap Goldust's nag across the top rope, and Hunter then goes on offense inside the ring. It doesn't take long before we go back to the outside again when Triple H lands a double axe handle. Hunter keeps the pressure on by throwing Goldust into the ring post, but Goldust manages to dodge a knee strike and Hunter crashes hard into the guardrail. Goldust again goes back to using the steps before the match resumes inside the ropes, and from here the bizarre one begins targeting Triple H's knee and leg. Goldust applies a figure 4 in the middle of the ring. The steps once again come into play when Triple H takes a knee breaker, and Jim Ross says that this might as well be a non-sanctioned match at this point. The flow of the match has been really strange too. Not too long after both competitors get back in the ring, they end up back on the outside where they fight at the guardrails and again they use the ring steps. Even more strange is referee Earl Hebner grabbing Marlene's chair when Hunter was about to use it as a weapon. It just doesn't make any sense. As the match continues on, Todd Pettengill interviews country singer Colin Ray because this is exactly what WWF fans of 1997 want to see. Pettengill even gets Colin to yeah, sing. Which one? Little Rock. I think I'm on a roll here in San Antonio. It's, it's <laughs> it's the word. Triple H drops a knee on Goldust and he remembers to sail the other knee after hitting the move. Goldust then fires back with a clothesline as Jim Ross admits on commentary that this has been a strange match. The challenger then goes to the top rope, but Hunter manages to crotch his opponent on the turnbuckles. Goldust then reverses a superplex attempt, but his follow-up elbow drop completely misses its target. Curtis Hughes passes the IC title to Triple H, but instead of immediately using the belt as a weapon, Hunter decides to give Marlena a kiss. 
Goldust wakes up, he grabs the belt and he uses it on Hunter, but Mr. Hughes saves Hunter from getting pinned. While the referee and Goldust are distracted by Mr. Hughes and as Goldust pushes Marlene's cigar onto Hunter's butler, Triple H jumps back into the ring and Goldust takes a hard clothesline. We then see the pedigree and Triple H successfully defends his Intercontinental Championship. This one was quite physical, but it's also quite messy. The unconventional style of the match was a risk and I don't really think it paid off. It was pretty underwhelming. We go backstage and Bret Hart says he knows he's a marked man tonight, but that's nothing new. One man is going to be left standing in the ring tonight, and Bret Hart says it's going to be the excellence of execution. We then go to the boiler room where Mankind says most people see the Royal Rumble as a step towards the World Wrestling Federation Championship, whereas Mrs Foley's baby boy sees the Royal Rumble as an opportunity to hurt a lot of people he doesn't like. Ahmed Johnson's huge push after debuting in the World Wrestling Federation led him to the Intercontinental Championship. A ruptured kidney put a halt to Ahmed's rise to the top and he was forced to vacate the IC title. To explain his injury, Farouk attacked Ahmed Johnson on WWF Raw and Johnson was taken off TV, though upon his return, Ahmed made it clear that he wanted revenge. Johnson made his in-ring return on Shotgun Saturday Night in a match against Crush, and this match here with Farouk would serve as Ahmed's in-ring return on pay-per-view. There was a decent amount of heat here with this rivalry brewing up since July of 1997, so let's see if they could capitalise. Thankfully, this one was booked more like a fight than a wrestling match. Ahmed destroys Farouk with a ton of right hands right at the opening bell, and Farouk takes a beating on the outside. Johnson then kicks Farouk as the nation leader crawls on the mat, and the crowd reaction here compared to Goldust vs Helmsley is like night and day. The audience breaks out in a loud Ahmed chant as the match continues on. Farouk targets the kidney area and this slows Ahmed down for a moment. A member of the Nation of Domination passes Farouk a belt but Ahmed dodges the attack, leading to Johnson taking control of the belt and Farouk gets whipped over and over again. The referee lets it slide. I I'm not complaining by the way, it fits the match. But it's a bit odd how the rules are being thrown out the window during the first two matches of the Royal Rumble. And also, this has to be intentional. With the introduction of Shotgun Saturday Night the week prior and just the overall tone of the WWF's programming over these past few weeks, you can tell the company was trying to get a little more gritty and this is something that's going to continue throughout the year. Anyway, the match spills to the outside again where Nation member D'Lo Brown gets thrown into Ahmed. D'Lo was just a no-named lackey of Farouk at this point who took bumps, but thankfully, we'd get to see his talents inside the ring very soon. Farouk then drops Ahmed across a chair while still targeting the kidneys. I thought this looked good because it looked believable. The referee then allows Farouk to swing the chair and nail Johnson on the back, and the nation's leader continues to target the kidneys when the match gets back inside the ropes. Farouk has managed to get a good amount of heat here and the targeted attack has worked well in terms of getting the live audience a little invested. The pace gets slowed way down with a camel clutch, but I like how Farouk begs for mercy when Ahmed lifts him up for an electric chair drop. The move hurts Ahmed more than Farouk though. Farouk is able to get back to his feet before Ahmed and he goes to the top rope. Ahmed counters the aerial attack with a power slam and the crowd loves it. Farouk hushes the audience by catching Ahmed afterwards and he hits a spine buster. Farouk then plays up to the audience and he begins bragging, but he doesn't notice that Ahmed has woke up and he's standing right behind him. Johnson gives Farouk a taste of his own medicine with a spine buster, and now it's time for the Pearl River Plunge. To ensure he doesn't take the move, Farouk calls for the nation to get involved, and now the referee calls for a disqualification. Ahmed has no issues taking out the whole faction, Farouk tries to escape up the rampway, and Ahmed tries to give chase, but he's stopped by a nation lackey. Ahmed decides to bring this poor guy to the French announce desk, and we see a Pearl River plunge through the table. The force makes the monitors sitting on the desk bounce in the air, and I thought this looked good too. This match gets totally ripped apart from the reviews I've read online, and I'm guessing that's because Ahmed Johnson automatically equals bad, but I thought this one was decent. The crowd absolutely loved it and they definitely helped to make it more fun to watch. 
The pace was just right for what was supposed to be a brawl and not a technical wonder. It'll never make anyone's top 50, but I've definitely seen way worse matches. Another brief backstage interview next. Terry Funk, who's gonna compete in tonight's Royal Rumble, says there's younger, faster, bigger and stronger wrestlers in the Royal Rumble tonight, but Funk is Texas bred and Texas fed. Fans should realize that Terry Funk was born to rumble. The Nation then get interviewed by Todd Pettengill and Farouk pulls two random Nation members in front of him and they both get tore apart for not helping during Farouk's match. This poor guy here really looks like he wants to go home. Farouk makes it clear that this rivalry with Ahmed Johnson is not over. Undertaker vs Vader should have felt bigger than what it was and it really comes down to the poor booking of Vader ever since SummerSlam 1996. The big man did get a big win over Bret Hart on Raw just a few weeks back but the focus was taken away from Vader when Psycho Sid attacked Jose's son afterwards. This feud with The Undertaker was plucked out of thin air also. Vader attacked The Undertaker during a promo that also featured Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and Psycho Sid and on the next episode of Superstars, Taker hit the tombstone on Vader's manager, Jim Cornette. Cornette does not bring Vader down to the ring at the Royal Rumble and it appears that Cornette's association with Vader may be over. Taker's entrance is absolutely phenomenal as always. The two men share right hands at the opening bell and Vader quickly learns that The Undertaker is hard to put down. Just when Vader thinks he has the upper hand, the dead man keeps coming back. Three times The Undertaker is able to sit up after taking punishment from Vader and this causes Vader to leave the ring. He's clearly having second thoughts. We get more fighting at the entranceway and Taker briefly loses his advantage after getting back inside the ring. Vader drops the dead man's neck over the top rope, but then Taker comes back with a unique leg drop that almost looked like a Famouser. Taker then hits a body slam with ease. We then see a leg drop and The Undertaker goes for old school but Vader shakes the ropes, finally giving Vader an opportunity to maybe do some damage. Vader then hits a low blow in front of the referee and Jack Doan pretends he didn't see anything. Todd Pettengill interviews a complete random fan in the audience while the match is still playing out. This girl saved up her money to attend the Royal Rumble and for whatever reason it's just as important as the match inside the ring. Oh, everywhere. You saved your money doing what? Babysitting. Baby, how long did it take you? How many babies did you have to sit? During the interview, Vader absolutely destroyed The Undertaker with his signature forearm strikes. Taker then gets crushed in the opposite corner and the Phenom gets sent to the mat after a clothesline. Vader keeps the pressure on with an aerial attack but Taker kicks out at two. Vader then applies a nerve hold but it looks like he's having a nice little break in the middle of the ring. The Undertaker fires back with some of those quick punches. Vader takes a back suplex and then Undertaker misses a follow up elbow drop. Vader then hits a surprise powerbomb but The Undertaker kicks out. There's a good pop from the audience after the kick out but this kind of stuff in my opinion seriously watered down what Vader was all about. Taker gets right back up, he hits his jumping clothesline, we see old school and then Paul Bearer makes his way down to the ring as Taker hits a choke slam. Vader gets clotheslined over the top rope and The Undertaker finally gives Paul some payback for what happened at SummerSlam 96. Back inside the ring, Vader saves Bearer from taking a beating but The Undertaker fights off both men. Bearer then saves Vader near the guardrails and The Undertaker crashes hard and then Paul hits the dead man with the urn from the apron. All of this interference leads to Vader hitting a Vader bomb back inside the ropes and The Undertaker takes a loss at the 1997 Royal Rumble. Vader has now defeated Bret Hart and The Undertaker in the space of 30 days, yet he hasn't been elevated at all by these victories and it's all because of outside interference really. The dead man chokeslams the referee afterwards, Taker then approaches Vince McMahon at the announce table and the dead man says there's a storm heading to the World Wrestling Federation and its name is The Undertaker. Yeah, this is okay but you could skip over it. Taker and Vader would have a better match on pay per view in just a few months time. Paul Bear would now also serve as Vader's manager. Steve Austin says he's not talking to anyone until he throws 29 pieces of trash over the top rope. 
so the cameraman can take his camera and stick it. We get an absolute classic next when Davy Boy Smith tells us why he's going to win the Royal Rumble tonight. This night's Royal Rumble tonight because I'm bizarre! We then got a six-man tag featuring superstars from the AAA promotion, Hector Garza, Kinect and Perry Aguayo, taking on Fuerza Guerrera, Heavy Metal and Jerry Estrada. The WWF fans in attendance took this time to get snacks and use the toilet before the Royal Rumble. A lot of moving bodies can be seen in the audience. WCW cruiserweights were stealing the show on Monday nights and I'm not so sure a match like this would have been featured on a WWF pay-per-view if the WCW cruiserweights weren't doing such a good job. But yeah, nobody in the crowd is invested at all because these guys have never been exposed to WWF audiences. The babyface team gets the win in the end. Some great looking moves during this one, but the guys in the ring were in a tough position too. WCW had the cream of the crop when it came to luchadors on American television. And let's not forget, fans in the Alamo Dome already saw three AAA matches during the free for all. The crowd was silent during this one and it's quite entertaining listening to Vince McMahon trying to commentate during the bout. And now it's time for the Royal Rumble match. The winner is scheduled to take on the WWF Champion at WrestleMania 13 and the smart money says the WWF Champion heading into Mania will be the winner of tonight's Shawn Michaels vs Psycho Sid match. The number one entrant is Crush and the number two entrant is Ahmed Johnson. So the Nation vs Ahmed feud continues in the Royal Rumble match. Crush gets the better of Ahmed to start off with but Johnson comes back and the two men roll around on the mat while trying to do some damage. Crush then tries to eliminate Johnson but he's unsuccessful. Our next entrant is the fake Razor Ramon. The countdown clock didn't show up here and Vince McMahon says there's some difficulties with the timer. Only in the WWF during this time period could a clock somehow get screwed up. Razor gets eliminated almost immediately by Ahmed Johnson and that's it guys. Say goodbye to the bad guy because this was Rick Bogner's final TV appearance in the WWF. The end of an era. Ahmed goes back to work on Crush but then Johnson decides to eliminate himself when he sees Farouk. Ahmed jumps over the top rope and he chases Farouk back up the rampway, so Crush is left all alone as we wait for entrant number 4. Why Ahmed didn't just slide under the ropes is anyone's guess, but anyway, here comes Phineas Godwin with all his hopes and dreams of main eventing Wrestlemania. The lack of a countdown clock seriously hurts the viewing experience because you don't get to see and hear the crowd counting down to the next entrant. It's incredible how such a small thing makes a lot of difference. Entrant number 5 is Stone Cold Steve Austin and Phineas goes straight to work on the rattlesnake. Austin decides to form an alliance with Crush but that doesn't last long. A failed clothesline attempt leads to Crush getting eliminated and immediately afterwards Phineas takes a Stone Cold Stunner and the Hog Farmer gets eliminated. The countdown clock appeared too during these eliminations so now it really feels like a Royal Rumble. Bart Gunn is out next and Austin initially has a hard time dealing with the former smoking gun but it doesn't take long for Bart to make a mistake. Gunn gets sent over the top rope and now Stone Cold is feeling confident. Austin performs a few push ups in the middle of the ring and he sits on the top turnbuckles waiting for the next entrant. Royal Rumble veteran Jake the Snake Roberts is out next and Jake doesn't have that many dates left in the WWF either. He's got one more TV appearance on Shotgun Saturday night and it's a very grim appearance. And then that's it, he's gone too. Give him credit though, the fans were still chanting for the DDT as Jake went to work on Austin's wrist. Jake manages to survive for 90 seconds and we see his elimination on the entrance screen as number 8 makes his way down to the ring, the bizarre British Bulldog. Does he have the balls to pull off a chin lock inside the Royal Rumble match? Let's find out. Bulldog and Austin have had problems for a few weeks now on Raw which has sort of led to Bret Hart supporting his brother-in-law. Austin attacked Davey from behind and he hit a stunner on the Bulldog on the previous episode of Raw so there's animosity here between these two men. Bulldog destroys Austin, Stone Cold takes a running power slam just before the next entrant hits the ring and it's Pierroth from AAA. There's a real awkward clash of styles here with the AAA guys and the WWF guys and it's very noticeable in the selling. No alliances here, everyone is an enemy. Bulldog and Austin briefly team up to take care of Pierroth 
and then Bulldog goes straight back to attacking Steve Austin. Entrant number 10 then hits the ring, it's the Sultan. The Iron Sheik is here too, no Bob Backlund, and I kinda wish it was the Iron Sheik who was getting inside the ring. Following the Sultan we have the legendary Mil Mascaris, and those who know the story here will have fun with this one. Let's wait until he gets eliminated. Mascaris gets a great reaction, though the fans know who he is. Hunter Hearst Helmsley comes out next and he goes to work on Davy Boy Smith. The ring has started to fill up a little now as we've got 6 guys inside the ropes, fighting for a chance to main event WrestleMania 13. 6 becomes 5 when Davy Boy Smith eliminates the Sultan with a clothesline over the top rope. Out next is the King of Hearts, Owen Hart. Owen goes straight after Austin but it doesn't take long for Stone Cold to turn things around. Davy Boy Smith comes to Owen's aid, and this results in Davy almost eliminating Stone Cold, but Owen comes from behind and he eliminates the British Bulldog. The tag team champions begin arguing, Owen says it was an accident but clearly it wasn't. Davy gets really hot on the outside but he's forced to the locker room by officials. Next out we have Goldust, and following Goldust we have Triple A's Cybernetico. Cybernetico goes straight after Mil Mascaris and Goldust eventually goes after Triple H. So Mark Merrow comes out next and Cybernetico gets eliminated by Pierroth. Mil Mascaris then eliminates Pierroth and Mascaris decides to dive from the top rope down to the floor, so Mascaris eliminated himself. What happened here was Mel Mascaris wasn't prepared to look weak and get eliminated by anyone, so the only person who could possibly eliminate the legendary Mel Mascaris was Mel Mascaris himself. Also, Mascaris technically went through the middle rope before climbing up, but that's irrelevant. The story here is that Mascaris really felt that getting thrown over the top rope by a WWF guy would make him look weak, so he threw himself out. Fantastic. Ross and McMahon say that Mil Mascaris made a mental error and he doesn't understand the rules, so while Mascaris may have saved himself from getting eliminated by an opponent, he didn't save himself from looking fucking stupid. Goldust eliminates Triple H, so we have 4 men left in the ring before entrance 17 comes down. Latin Lover is our final Triple A wrestler to enter the Royal Rumble. The first thing he does when getting into the ring, he literally kicks Goldust's ass. Latin Lover then hits Owen Hart with a super kick and Goldust reminds Double L where he is by punching him in the face. Goldust tries to eliminate Owen, Owen survives by skinning the cat, and the King of Hearts comes back in to eliminate Goldust. Out next is Farouk, the leader of the nation eliminates Latin Lover before having a wild fist fight with Stone Cold Steve Austin. But here comes Ahmed Johnson holding the largest, most impractical 2x4 you've ever seen in your life. Farouk jumps over the top rope to escape Ahmed, and in the middle of all this commotion, Steve Austin eliminated both Owen Hart and Mark Merrow, though the cameras didn't catch the eliminations. Out next we have Austin's old rival Savio Vega and another fist fight breaks out in the middle of the ring. Austin uses Savio's momentum against him, and Savio doesn't last long inside the Royal Rumble. Austin is once again left all alone, and he's looking really good tonight inside the Alamo Dome. The real Double J Jesse James is our 20th entrant. James gets in a few rights and lefts and he hits a clothesline in the corner, but he has to do his little strut. Don't ever give Steve Austin a chance to strike because Austin will take the opportunity and it won't be pretty. James gets thrown out of the ring, he tries to stay in but a back elbow sends Jesse to the outside, and just like that, Stone Cold is once again left all alone waiting for the next competitor. Out comes Bret the Hitman Hart, the favourite to win the Royal Rumble match, and the Hitman gets to work by making Steve Austin go through yet another fist fight. The audience stands on their feet as Bret gets the upper hand. Austin begs for mercy in the corner, but Bret is promised to do unto others tonight. Hart has talked about how the WWF is now a land without law, and Bret's happy to work inside this new landscape. While Bret applies a sharpshooter, the 22nd entrant gets revealed. It's commentator Jerry the King Lawler. King lasts all of 4 seconds. There's a great pop when Bret uppercuts Lawler over the top rope, and Jerry resumes his commentary duties immediately after getting eliminated. 
Brett goes back to work on Austin before our next entrant comes out, the fake Diesel. Glenn Jacobs here would set Royal Rumble records as the Kane character, but right here, and I'm just being honest, he feels like a waste of a Royal Rumble spot. Diesel attacks Brett as soon as he gets in the ring and Steve Austin also feels the wrath of Big Daddy Cool. Brett dislikes Steve Austin so much that he actually tries to help Diesel eliminate the rattlesnake, but that doesn't work out too well. Terry Funk enters the Royal Rumble and he goes straight after Steve Austin. These two mixed it up a little on Shotgun Saturday night and it was great. Here in the Royal Rumble, the two men go at it and there's very little reaction. It's kinda surprising really. There are a few fans from Amarillo though and they brought a big banner for the Funker. Good stuff. Number 25 is Rocky Maivia making his Royal Rumble debut and check it out, the first person he attacks, Stone Cold Steve Austin. Rock keeps the pressure on Austin while Brett tries to eliminate Terry Funk. Diesel just stands there. Mankind is our next entrant and Jim Ross points out that we're gonna have Bret Hart, Steve Austin, Mick Foley and Terry Funk all in the ring at the same time and anything could happen. Mankind goes after Funk, Brett and Austin slug it out and Diesel tries to eliminate Rocky Maivia. No eliminations happen by the time our next entrant enters the match, Flash Funk. Bret Hart lands a pile driver on Steve Austin while Flash Funk takes out Terry and Diesel with a crossbody. Terry also gets choked by Mankind's boot and you can feel the crowd getting on edge here as we approach the final moments of the 1997 Royal Rumble. Number 28 is the man they call Vader. Bret Hart gets annihilated by the big man and Vader also makes quick work of Flash Funk and Steve Austin. Stone Cold runs into a brick wall here. We have 8 men in the match as Hart tries to get a little payback on Vader. Henry Godwin comes out next and again we have no eliminations. Meaning that there's 10 men in the ring after number 30 makes his entrance, The Undertaker. Taker goes straight after Vader, picking up where we left off earlier in the show. The dead man then attacks Mankind before hitting choke slams on both Vader and Steve Austin. The Phenom is looking really good here. Vader gets up and he eliminates Flash Funk. The replay picks the elimination up better than the live footage. The Undertaker then eliminates Henry Godwin. Rocky Maivia finds himself in the mandible claw before Mankind dumps him over the top rope. Mankind then eliminates Terry Funk with a suplex before Foley gets eliminated by The Undertaker. And then Mankind and Terry Funk begin fighting on the outside, keeping the referees busy as the rumble match continues. Bret Hart eliminates Stone Cold Steve Austin, the crowd pops, but the referees don't see the elimination. Stone Cold gets back into the ring and he eliminates Vader and The Undertaker just as Bret eliminates the fake Diesel. And then Steve Austin throws Bret Hart over the top rope and Stone Cold Steve Austin is announced the winner of the 1997 Royal Rumble. Bret Hart is pissed. Stone Cold walks back up the entranceway leaving Bret Hart alone to complain to anyone who'll listen. Brett tells the referees he eliminated Austin, the hitman goes over and he complains to Vince McMahon about the finish of the match, but the referee's decision is final tonight, there's no replay rule in the WWF. Steve Austin goes into the history books as the winner of the 1997 Royal Rumble, and as for Brett, well, he's gonna make a pretty big decision tomorrow night on Raw. The ending of the match would really play into Brett's upcoming heel turn, an injustice was done to the hitman once again, he has every right to complain, but Brett was also coming across as a crybaby. I know most people don't think too highly of this rumble match and I can definitely see why, but personally I don't mind it as much as others. The match really picks up towards the last 10 minutes or so and the finish was really well done. Steve Austin winning the whole thing was a great move also. The rise of Stone Cold Steve Austin continues on WWF television. HBK lost the WWF Championship back at Survivor Series when Sid attacked Jose Lothario with a camera. HBK got booed out of the building, fans were seemingly tired of the white meat babyface Shawn Michaels and the MSG audience went crazy for Psycho Sid. Since then, the WWF done all they could to make Sid a full blown heel while trying to make Shawn a little more rough around the edges. Vince McMahon even called Shawn a real man's man on WWF TV. And HBK went out of his way to tell everyone that he doesn't really care if the fans cheer him or boo him. 
no matter what happens during a WWF card, Sean says he always gives the best performance of the night. Sid made things a little more personal when he attacked Jose Lothario's son on Raw, so you had a few things going on here that swayed some fans into backing Shawn Michaels over Psycho Sid. Many fans were still tired of Shawn, but not those in San Antonio. HBK was going to get a hero's welcome tonight. We see a Superstars interview with Sean beforehand and HBK announces he isn't feeling well. He's got a flu, but he's still going to perform tonight inside the ring. Why the WWF announced this, I do not know. Maybe they wanted an insurance policy in case the match was awful. But keep in mind that Sean is apparently sick when you see the match result. We see Sean and Jose backstage walking towards the entranceway. HBK's theme music plays in the arena and the crowd lose their minds. Man, if this guy really has a flu, then that's a lot of hands he's touching on the way to the ring. Still, it's a hometown welcome here for the heartbreak kid, and he seems to have a lot more confidence here in comparison to how he looked during Superstars. Amazing what some <coughs> medicine can do. Sid walks into enemy territory here, but to be fair, he does have some fans in the Alamo Dome. Not a huge lot when compared to the Garden, but you do see a few fans during the match who want Sid to win. I'm sure a lot of fans watching on pay-per-view wanted to see Sid win also. The champion pushes the challenger down to the mat and Sean smiles as he walks straight back to Psycho Sid. Sid decides he isn't going to play tonight and he goes straight on the attack. He screams at Sean's parents sitting at ringside before landing a big clubbing blow but HBK comes back with a crossbody. The crowd pops as Sean rocks Sid's head repeatedly on the mat. Sid gets booted out of the ring and the match continues on the outside. Sid ends up lifting Sean up for a press slam but HBK rakes Sid's eyes. This allows HBK to throw Sid back inside the ropes and try an aerial attack. The champ grabs Sean in mid-air and we see a power slam and then the pace slows way down when Sid locks in not just one camel clutch but three camel clutches. It feels like an absolute eternity but the fans in the audience make a lot of noise, hoping HBK can somehow get out of this hold. Sean dodges a sit down attack and the audience pops. Sean's offensive flurry gives the crowd a reason to keep cheering for HBK, but Sean ends up taking the flare corner bump and there's a hush in the Alamo Dome. Sid doesn't give Sean time to recuperate. HBK gets his back rammed into the ring post twice before the match continues in the ring. Jose tries to cheer Michaels back into the match, but maybe Sid is unbeatable tonight in San Antonio. Anytime Sean begins to build offense, Sid puts him right back down. And give it to Psycho Sid here, he knows the crowd is largely against him and he plays up to it brilliantly. A bear hug gets applied in the middle of the ring and Sean's parents watch on as HBK tries to fight out of another hold. The bear hug gets applied twice and you can tell that the match is getting slowed down for HBK's benefit. Still, the crowd doesn't care. Anytime Sean breaks a hold, they go nuts. And the match has been laid out in a way that gives the fans a reason to pop multiple times. The third bear hug gets applied after Sean tries a second rope clothesline. It's kept held in for an extended period of time as Sid brings it right down to the mat. The big man then hits a leg drop and Sid keeps it on the canvas as Sean tries to fight out of another submission hold. HBK counters a scoop slam with a slam of his own. We then see Sean's flying forearm. Michaels heads to the top rope and he lands his elbow drop. This all happens very suddenly. Sean then tries to finish it, he goes for the super kick, but Sid grabs his foot and Sean ends up getting thrown to the outside. Sid then lands a power bomb and that should do it. All Sid has to do is throw Sean back into the ring and it's all over. But he decides to go after Jose Lothario. This leads to Jose's son jumping the guardrail and Sid could have destroyed both these guys, but Pat Patterson manages to calm Sid down. The match resumes in the ring and the referee gets taken out. Sid lands a choke slam immediately afterwards. He has Sean beat, but there's no one there to count the pin. A second referee runs down, but Sean kicks out at two. Sid takes out the second referee. Jose Lothario jumps on the apron, and this gives Sean the opportunity to grab a camera. HBK gets revenge for Survivor Series by destroying Sid with the camera. He pins the champ, but Sid kicks out. Sean gets back to his feet, he nails sweet chin music, 
Earl Hebner gives one of his classic slow three counts and it's all over. Shawn Michaels becomes a two-time WWF champion. Just like that, Sid's run as champion comes to an end. And coming out of this pay-per-view, fans would think that we're going to see a Steve Austin vs Shawn Michaels WrestleMania main event, although some drastic changes get made very soon, so make sure to check out Reliving the War to see it all unfold. HBK celebrates with his family and friends at ringside before the show goes off the air. I thought the 1996 Survivor Series match was better and much of that has to do with the New York audience. You can definitely tell Shawn isn't 100% here also, but either way, a sick Shawn Michaels is still a good performer. It's definitely a match that would have been good to see live in the Alamo Dome, the atmosphere looks great, but as a TV viewing experience, it does fall short of their previous encounter. I used to really like this pay per view for some reason, but watching it back, it's just okay. There's good moments here and there, you can still feel a change happening in the WWF, particularly with the opening matches and how they're laid out, but the end result just isn't as good as it could have been. The undercard matches were a letdown, but to be fair also, I was quite surprised by the Ahmed vs Farouk match, it wasn't as bad as I remember it. The final moments of the Rumble were great too, and I also like when a story gets told in the Rumble match itself, so points there for the finish. Sid vs Sean was definitely a passable main event, it's just not as good as Survivor Series 96. I'd say give the Farouk match a rewatch just for the sake of it, not a technical masterpiece at all, but it might be better than you remember. And check out the last 15 minutes or so of the Rumble match. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view also being held in a dome is quite interesting and it does give the show a much bigger feeling. It's quite an oddity after coming out of 1996 in some incredibly small Raw and in your house venues, so credit to the World Wrestling Federation for filling up the Alamo Dome, even if it wasn't all paid customers inside the venue. Anyway, thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this look back at the first WWF pay per view of 1997 and I'll see you all on Thursday for Reliving the War. In Your House 13, Final Four took place on the 16th of February 1997 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, drawing in a reported 6,500 fans. The draw of this show was the Final Four match itself where the WWF Championship was up for grabs, we'll talk about this a little later on. Every other match on the card had no build up whatsoever. The special episode of Raw that aired on Thursday before the Final Four focused on the WWF Championship and therefore no other matches were built up which is kinda crazy when you think about it. It's a good example though of the importance of promoting matches beforehand, as many would say the only good thing about this show was the Final Four match itself. We're gonna watch the whole show today, plus the free for all. You don't need to watch Reliving the War in order to enjoy this upload. And just before we begin, I said on Reliving the War that I was actually gonna cheat here and use my previous Final Four video to save some time, but after hearing how bad the audio was in that video, I've decided to do it properly and talk about the Final Four match again and add new commentary. So let's get started. This is In Your House Final Four. The Final Four Free For All is a great companion piece for the pay per view itself, and if you're going to take some time out to watch the main event of the show, I highly recommend watching the Free For All also. The trend continues during the Free For All with the WWF only focusing on the Final Four match, but you get some good promos here from everyone involved in the bout, and the story of the main event gets completely laid out here. It starts off with Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler introducing us to the show, but they immediately get interrupted by Steve Austin. So before continuing on, I'll need to catch those who don't watch Reliving the War up on why this Final Four match is taking place. Stone Cold Steve Austin was eliminated from the 1997 Royal Rumble by Bret Hart, 
but Austin decided to jump back into the ring while the referees were distracted. Austin then illegally eliminated Vader, The Undertaker and Bret Hart, and Stone Cold was named the winner of the Raw Rumble match. The next night on Raw, Bret Hart quit the WWF. He was tired of getting screwed over and the Royal Rumble finale was seemingly the straw that broke the camel's back. A little later on during the Raw broadcast, Gorilla Monsoon came up with the final four match. Those three men who were illegally eliminated by Austin and Stone Cold himself would get another chance to headline WrestleMania. All they had to do was win a no disqualification match at In Your House. The match, named the Final Four match, would feature eliminations via pinfall, submissions, and also, you could get eliminated by getting thrown over the top rope just like the Royal Rumble. Bret Hart agreed to come back for the match, and so everything was going to plan. Shawn Michaels then lost his smile, HBK said he had a knee injury, and he vacated the WWF Championship. It was then announced that the winner of the Final Four match would become the new WWF Champion, meaning the stakes were raised big time for tonight's main event. Psycho Sid, who was scheduled to wrestle Shawn Michaels for the title at Thursday Raw Thursday, is gonna face the winner of the Final Four on the Raw following in your house. So make sure you subscribe to the channel if you wanna learn about what happens on the February 17th episode of Raw. Trust me, it's an interesting one. Okay, so now we know who, what, where and why in regards to the Final Four, so let's continue on looking at the free for all. Steve Austin interrupts Jim Ross and Jerry Lawler and he says tonight's match shouldn't be happening. Austin says he won the Royal Rumble fair and square and he should have been facing Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania, but seeing as Gorilla Monsoon made the final four match and seeing as Shawn Michaels vacated the title, things haven't exactly been going the way Stone Cold planned. Unfortunately, the promo gets cut short and the WWF decide to air a promo video all about Stone Cold's recent rise in the company and this is a shame, Austin was just ripping in the HBK for being a coward before the video began playing. When we come back, Austin is making fun of the fans in attendance but he gets interrupted by The Undertaker. We then get a look at the entranceway for this In Your House show and it's the superstar set that they've used here, not the classic house entranceway. And it does make the show feel a little cheap in terms of production. Taker says Austin made a mistake agreeing to this match. Austin tries to talk into his mic but it's been cut off. Taker says Austin's gonna get his ass kicked, Vader will get planted 6 foot deep, and the dead man plans on taking care of the hitman too. Taker says Austin shouldn't be in the ring running his mouth, he should be in the back making his final arrangements. Stone Cold is gonna rest in peace tonight. After an Undertaker video package airs, we get this arena shot where we can see a match is underway but it doesn't get shown. It's the Godwins versus the Headbangers by the way. We then get a replay of Sean losing his smile and the championship getting forfeited. And afterwards, Jim Ross says that Sean will visit Dr. Andrews tomorrow in Birmingham, Alabama for a consultation. We then get a look at the final four match rules and basically it's an elimination match, no disqualifications, you can get eliminated by pinfall submission or going over the top rope. A video package for Bret Hart then plays and it tells the story of Bret's WWF return and why things haven't been going so well for the excellence of execution. The final four match though will give Hart two things that he's wanted pretty desperately, a chance to get his hands on Austin and a chance to win the WWF Championship. Hart gets interviewed by Kevin Kelly next and Kevin wants to know how Bret Hart feels about Shawn Michaels. Hart says he assumes Shawn is legitimately hurt, Bret says he sympathises with Michaels but in this game you gotta be careful. Hart says he thinks Shawn will come back and Bret says when that happens he still wants a match against the Heartbreak Kid. Bret says he feels great, he's at 100% and he says he has no doubt that the excellence of execution will prevail tonight in the final four. Vader and Paul Bear then get interviewed by Doc Hendricks. Paul says it's a shame Doc isn't a real doctor because three men are gonna need one later tonight. Vader says he's beat Austin, he's beat Bred, and he's beat The Undertaker. That means Vader is the odds on favourite to leave the final four as the WWF champion. Hendricks then hypes up the crowd just before the free for all ends. Again, a great companion piece for tonight's main event. You learn everything you need to know by watching the free for all. Alright, let's check out this pay per view then. Our first match is absolutely random Leaf Cassidy vs. Wildman Mark Merrow. 
JR and King are going to call the whole pay-per-view. Hugo Sabanovic and Carlos Cabrera are at the Spanish announce table. And over on the French table, we have a fabulous Rougeau. No, not an amazing French Canadian. A fabulous Rougeau. Ray Rougeau and Jean Brassard provide commentary for In Your House Final Four. Mero pulls off a few arm drag takedowns at the beginning of the match and look at this fancy footwork here, what a guy. Mero follows up with a wrist lock before performing a fireman's carry. We then see an arm bar from the wild man and the arm bar stays applied after Mero performs a suplex. Mark begins slamming Cassidy down repeatedly by the head and Jim Ross says that Mark has gotten way more aggressive over these past few weeks, I honestly hadn't noticed. Leaf slides out of the ring where he's able to do some damage to Mero's knee. You'll notice Sable is wearing sunglasses tonight because her husband's future looks super bright. And Sable ends up kicking Cassidy, forcing Cassidy to lose focus on his opponent. Mero comes back with a double axe handle and he gets back inside the ring with a vaulting leg drop. Mero then tells Cassidy, you do not mess with Sable, but I'm pretty sure Sable was messing with Cassidy. And Leaf makes Mero pay for this unsavory comment by nailing a low running drop kick not once but twice. Cassidy focuses on Mero's left leg as the wild man hobbles around the ring. There's this awkward bit here where Cassidy just gives Mero his head for a right hand, but Cassidy keeps the pressure on by trying to hyperextend Mero's leg on the mat. The match then stays on the mat for what feels like an eternity with Cassidy maintaining focus on the left leg. When the two men get back up, Mero again tries to fight back in the corner but Cassidy puts him right back down and it's straight back to the leg. I hope Mero remembers to sell it afterwards. Another fight in the corner, Mero uses his good leg to kick Cassidy and then he pulls off an enziguri with his good leg, thank god. Cassidy makes Mero pay by hitting a knee breaker and then Cassidy pulls off a figure 4. Mero begins struggling towards the bottom rope and Sable helps Mark by pushing it about half an inch forward. Mark grabs the rope and so Leaf goes to the outside to give Sable an earful. Sable slaps Cassidy and when Leaf tries to retaliate, Mero jumps out of the ring and yes, his leg has completely healed up after around 5 minutes of absolute torture. This is pretty much the end of the match, Mark hits a few kicks, Mark pulls off a Samoan drop and then we see the wild thing. Mark Merrow wins via pinfall in what was an absolutely abysmal opening match. We talked about Dean Malenko and Ultimo Dragon at Starcade 96 being one of the unsung best opening matches in pay per view history, and this, well, it's the complete opposite. The Honky Tonk Man comes out next for absolutely no reason whatsoever. I'm guessing he cut a promo while fans at home were shown another replay of HBK losing his smile, but yeah. On the television broadcast, Honky Tonk Man appears and then he disappears following the replay. Psycho Sid promotes tomorrow night's Monday Night Raw broadcast, reminding fans that he's got a title shot against whoever wins the final four tonight. We have a six man tag next, the Nation of Domination vs Flash Funk, Goldust and Bart Gunn. Ross and Lawler try to explain that there's actually a little history between these competitors while ignoring Flash Funk. That history is based on Gunn and Goldust losing matches due to Nation members helping each other out, but that doesn't change the fact that this match feels absolutely random. The entrances, I'm not kidding, take up just as much time as the match itself. And Farouk can't find a working microphone in order to cut a promo. He gets visibly annoyed at this and Goldust decides to attack the nation's leader to save him from any further embarrassment. The babyfaces clear out the ring to begin with and Flash Funk performs a nice diving crossbody on all three competing members of the nation. When the match settles down, we get Goldust and Farouk followed by Goldust quickly tagging out, allowing Flash Funk to come in and allowing Farouk to pull off a spinebuster. Savio Vega gets tagged in afterwards and Funk pulls off a top rope Hurricane Rana and check this out. Gunn throws Funk over the top rope and Funk lands a crossbody on the outside to his three opponents and the nation decide to grab Funk afterwards and give him a beating. It's a small thing but it makes a lot of sense. Ross says the move was a calculated risk that didn't pay off. This little slip up leads to Savio briefly taking control in the ring. Crush and Farouk are tagged in and it looks like it's all over for Funk but Flash manages to get a knee up and he smashes Farouk's little dominators. Funk didn't buy himself enough time though, the nation stay in control and Flash takes a spike pile driver while the referee was distracted. 
The crowd finally begin making some noise when Flash Funk pulls off this double team reversal and he hits Savio and Farouk with a double clothesline. Bart Gunn then gets tagged in and he's all fired up. The match breaks down into another giant brawl but Bart manages to pull off a top rope bulldog. Crush breaks up the follow up pin attempt with a leg drop and that's how this match ended. Farouk pins Gunn after the leg drop and it's all over. Flash Funk had a few good little moments here but again it isn't what anyone would call a great match. You get the feeling that we're wasting time here until the final four match. Doc Hendricks interviews Steve Austin and Doc says Austin must be concerned that he doesn't hold a clean victory over any of his opponents tonight and Austin replies by saying he threw all three over the top rope and this jackass Doc Hendricks needs to understand that that counts as a clean victory. Austin says this final four match is all political, it's the same thing that's kept Austin down for 7 long years but tonight Austin is gonna win the final four and tonight Steve Austin will become WWF champion. Next up inside the ring we have Triple H getting a rematch for the IC title he lost on Thursday Raw Thursday. Helmsley vs Maya Vea wasn't bad at all on Raw so hopefully they have a solid pay per view match here at In Your House. Interesting stuff to start off with though, I said that the opening sequence during the Raw match was very crisp and they went through the moves well but here there's a failure to communicate when Raw goes for a drop toe hold and Hunter thinks it's a drop down. Thankfully the recovery is absolutely fine and Hunter slaps Rocky around a little afterwards just like the Raw match. Maivia composes himself and he pulls off his drop kick followed by an arm drag. Hunter is momentarily locked in an arm bar but he gets to his feet and he slaps Rocky hard. Rocky retaliates with a slap of his own and Hunter falls to the mat. Jim Ross says Hunter is playing Rocky here, Triple H wants to get Rock so fired up that the rookie ends up forgetting the basics. Maivia takes a few hard chops in the corner but he replies with a back body drop. He then goes to the arm bar again as the commentators talk about Rocky's dad and granddad. Once both men are back up, Hunter manages to throw Rock out of the ring and Helmsley performs a baseball slide that sends Rocky into the guardrail. Hunter then performs a body slam on the outside and an elbow drop from the apron finds its target and when the competitors get back inside the ring, Hunter performs a suplex. Jim Ross accidentally calls it a slupex and Lawler calls him out. A what? A suplex? You're the sworn. I could have sworn you said slupex. After hitting Rock with a knee drop, Hunter applies a chin lock. Yes. And when Hunter tries to use the ropes for leverage, Earl Hebner forcefully breaks the hold. This allows Rocky to get up but Hunter puts the IC champ right back down with a knee to the jaw. Rock then kicks out of a pin attempt and he tries to end the match the same way he did on Raw but Hunter just kicks out. It was very close to being a 3 count though. This infuriates Hunter, Triple H performs a backbreaker and he follows this up with another chin lock, that's 2 for those keeping count and Rock replies by performing a crossbody. Hunter holds onto the ropes when Rock tries to hit another drop kick but Triple H's follow up knee drop completely misses its target. Still Hunter gets back to his feet before Rock and Maivia takes a rake to the eyes. I just noticed our guy in the audience here wearing a sick hat and wearing a 4 horseman shirt. That's a man who conducts a lot of horseman business. Hunter almost takes Mavia's head off with a hard clothesline and the crowd are now cheering for Triple H. He goes upstairs for an aerial attack but Rock counters with a punch and I absolutely hate this bump Hunter takes afterwards. Mavia begins building momentum with a few right hands and Hunter takes the flare corner bump before getting floored with another big right and then Rocky hits a power slam. Rock stands up and the crowd boos, he tries to end it with a top rope crossbody that looked really good but it only gets a 2 count. Hunter slams Rocky's chin hard on the top turnbuckle during a 10 punch attempt and he tries to cheat again by using the ropes during a cover but Rock kicks out barely. Rock performs a float over DDT, Helmsley lands a neck breaker and then Goldust comes out the ringside. Hunter gets distracted, Maivia performs a bridging suplex and that's how the match ended, Rock wins via pinfall. So far this was the best match on the card and again these two worked pretty well with each other even back in early 1997 but I didn't like the finish at all. Marlena is now at ringside, it looks like Goldust wants to get in the ring and fight Hunter 
But then a fan begins choking Marlena at the guardrail and this causes quite the panic. Security guards escort the woman away and Marlena looks pretty shaken up by what just happened. But yes, this was the debut of China. Before we move on to our next match, Vader lets us all know what he thinks of his three opponents tonight, and Paul Bearer reminds us that Vader has already beaten his fellow Final Four competitors in singles matches. Paul says we are currently looking at the next WWF Champion and tonight we are all gonna know what time it is. Doug Furness and Phil LaFon vs Owen and Bulldog is our next match. Owen and Davey have been having problems, not only did Owen eliminate Davey from the Raw Rumble, but Owen has also been feigning knee injuries in order to win matches via countout. He even left Davey in the ring all alone on Thursday Raw Thursday and Bulldog took a beating from Crush and Farouk. The tag champs are weakened it seems, so this is a good opportunity for Furnace and Lafon to take advantage and pick up the tag team titles. Owen Hart and Doug Furness start this one off and Furness brings Owen down with a waist lock takedown. Owen quickly rolls out but he's unable to grab the wrist afterwards. Owen ends up taking a hip toss and an arm drag takeover before Doug Furness applies an arm bar. Phil LaFawn ends up getting tagged in and Owen gets a little cocky after a pin attempt. This leads to a series of pin attempts and neither man is able to pick up an early victory. LaFawn goes for a hip toss but when that doesn't work he successfully rolls under Owen and he applies a knee bar. Remember Owen was pretending to have knee problems so he argues with the referee when LaFawn won't break the hold. Owen made it to the ropes. Davey gets tagged in and LaFawn goes for a handshake, clearly not understanding that the British Bulldog is bizarre. Davey lands a forearm but he fails to maintain the advantage afterwards. After performing a sunset flip and after Davey kicks out, the Bulldog goes for a suplex but LaFawn counters and he hits a wheel kick. The referee then gets distracted by Furnace and this allows Owen and Davey to get in a few cheap shots just before Owen gets tagged back in. The champs continue to cheat as our match continues on. Owen pulls off a crossbody but LaFawn rolls through. Owen kicks out and he rakes his opponent's face to stay in control. Hart then nails a gut wrench suplex and a backbreaker but he can't keep LaFawn down for a three count. Davey comes back in and we see a double clothesline. LaFawn then manages to pin Bulldog after Davey made a mistake but Owen keeps the referee distracted and LaFawn ends up taking a clothesline. This match would be a great case study for up and coming heel tag teams. Owen and Davey are pulling off every dirty trick they can think of. Owen comes back in and he goes for a sharpshooter but LaFawn kicks Owen away. The King of Hearts decides to keep softening his opponent up and the fans are now getting behind the baby faces. They want to see Furnace tagged in. For a team that's supposed to be having problems, Owen and Davey are working extremely well together here and they have done a great job of keeping LaFawn away from his corner. Davey helps Owen during a roll up and Furnace runs in to fix the pin but Owen kicks out. And forget what I just said about Owen and Davey working well together because Owen gets angry over the pin attempt. This allows Furnace to bash Owen and Davey's heads together and things aren't looking so good for the chomps. Owen ends up accidentally hitting Davey with a spinning wheel kick and the challengers now have a real opportunity. LaFawn pins Davey but Davey gets a foot on the ropes. Bulldog gets up, Owen slaps him across the face and Davey nails his partner with a hard clothesline. LaFawn again tries to take advantage of this apparent breakup by hitting a top rope splash but Davey breaks up the pin. Bulldog is pissed off at Owen but he still wants to be a tag team champion. Furnace finally gets tagged in but the stuff with Owen and Davey has completely killed the potential hot tag pop. Owen takes a beating here due to Furnace and LaFawn quickly tagging in and out. And check this out, a tag team combo move that sees Owen get absolutely planted with a DDT. Fantastic stuff. Davey again saves Owen and Hart hits an enziguri on Furnace. Davey then gets tagged in and he does well in keeping his opponents at bay but it doesn't take long for all four men to end up in the ring and we have a brawl on our hands. The match ends with Owen and Davey getting thrown into each other. Owen goes to the outside and he grabs his slammy award and just as Davey was about to end it with a running power slam, Owen hits LaFawn and the referee calls for the bell. Furness and LaFawn win via disqualification. Owen and Davey then argue afterwards. Davey throws down the tag team titles and he even breaks Owen's slammy award. But just like Raw a few weeks ago, Clarence Mason and Owen sway Davey and Bulldog reluctantly accepts the outcome of the match. 
This was a good tag bout though that had a good mix of in-ring action, tag team psychology and drama. I enjoyed this one more than Maivia vs Helmsley. It's now time for the final four match, the big draw of the show. Again, this is where I would have added content from that previous video I made but hey, let's do it again, I love watching this match plus that previous video has some bad audio. The Undertaker gets interviewed and he says he's in the middle of rediscovering his edge and the old Undertaker is slowly coming back. This spells doom for Austin, Vader and Bret Hart. By hook or by crook, the WWF title will belong to The Undertaker tonight and Taker's opponents can only hope that the dead man spares their lives. Vader makes his entrance first, followed by Steve Austin and then The Undertaker. After Undertaker's entrance, we get a Bret Hart pre-match interview where Bret says all three of his opponents are tough and all three opponents will be a challenge tonight. The Hitman says there's no excuses, whoever wins this one deserves to be champion and Bret says the best man is gonna win this final four match and that man will be Bret the Hitman Hart. Bret then makes his entrance and check this out, Bret looks directly at this kid as he removes his pink and black glasses. The kid must have been super excited to get those shades, but then Bret totally swerves him and the kid with the glasses here gets the shades instead, absolutely brutal. All four men are now in the ring, the bell sounds, and each competitor takes the time to consider who they should attack first. Vader and Taker begin slugging it out as does Bret and Austin. Taker hits his jumping clothesline and then he decides to attack Austin and Hart. The dead man hits old school on Austin but afterwards Bret punches Taker and the dead man takes a belly to belly from Vader. The phenom sits up like nothing happened but Vader knocks him out of the ring. Vader then grabs a steel chair and while he's successful in using the weapon at first, the dead man gets a boot up and the chair gets pushed into Vader's face. The big man blades while he's down, he then gets thrown into the ring steps and Vader's face is already a mess that's going to continue to get worse. All four men are in the ring and Austin counters a Bret Hart sleeper with a jawbreaker. Austin tries to pin Bret afterwards but Bret kicks out at two. The Undertaker then performs a choke slam on Vader. Austin then nails Taker with a stone cold stunner but he doesn't get all of it. Taker's able to kick out as Vader and Bret Hart start going to work. Vader hits a low blow on Bret. This causes Hart to roll out of the ring as Taker and Austin continue fighting inside the ropes. Vader ends up using the chair again and Bret takes a few shots to the back. Afterwards Austin and Taker decide to fight on the outside and Taker counters a pile driver attempt with a back body drop. Taker then moves back to the ring where he goes after Bret and this means Stone Cold and Vader do a little more work on the outside. Vader ends up taking a beating as Stone Cold uses the ring steps on the big man but Vader turns it around with a few big right hands. We then get this moment I talked about in the previous Final Four video where Vader decides he doesn't want to take another bump on the ring steps so he gives it a miss and he throws himself into a member of staff instead. I like how Vader gives the steps a little pat while saying to himself, nah fuck that. Vader and Austin beat the hell out of each other by the guardrails and Vader comes out on top. The hitman takes a clothesline from the dead man back inside the ring and not a person on floor level is sitting down, the crowd are completely eating this one up. Vader pulls Brett out of the ring, the undertaker allows Vader to take the hitman up the entranceway for a beating while the phenom takes care of Austin. Brett ends up throwing Vader over the guardrail and Brett nails Vader with a few right hands in the audience before both men make their way back to the ring. Brett gets his head smashed into the ring steps as Steve Austin hits a flying clothesline on The Undertaker. We then see Psycho Sid watching the match backstage, eager to see who he'll be facing tomorrow night on Raw. Vader then applies a sharpshooter on Brett but it's broken up by Austin and Undertaker. This leads to Stone Cold again focusing on Brett while Vader and The Undertaker begin fighting once again. After taking care of Vader, Taker makes his way over to Hart and Austin and Brett holds Stone Cold up, allowing Taker to get in a few rights and lefts. Austin ends up in the ring where he performs a Luthez press on Vader and then Taker and Brett get back inside the ropes and it's just absolute carnage. Taker gets hit with a Vader clothesline, Austin gets hit with a Bret Hart pile driver, Vader then goes all the way up for a Vader salt but The Undertaker moves out of the way. Vader decides he needs a timeout afterwards but it isn't long before The Undertaker gives chase as Brad and Stone Cold continue fighting inside the ring. 
Undertaker and Vader choke each other with some cable on the outside and Stone Cold tries to throw Brett over the top rope, but Hart stays in. The competitors then change it up a little and they switch opponents, and Brett ends up hitting Vader with a low blow as we reach the final 10 minutes of this pay per view. Taker gets his knee smashed into the ring post before he and Stone Cold try to eliminate each other back in the ring, but neither man goes out. Austin very nearly gets sent over the top rope but he hangs on and he keeps himself in the match for another few moments, but he can't hold on when Brett dumps him over the top rope afterwards. Steve Austin is the first man eliminated. Hart, Vader and Undertaker take turns at beating each other up, but Taker ends up on the outside where Paul Bearer hits him with the urn. While the Undertaker tries to recuperate, Vader climbs the turnbuckles. The hitman wakes up and Vader ends up taking a superplex. Brett then goes for the sharpshooter, but for whatever reason, the Undertaker gets in the ring and he breaks the hold. Even JR says this is a strange thing for the Undertaker to do. With Brett now on the outside, Steve Austin comes back out and he attacks the excellence of execution. Brett tries to get back in the ring and the officials try to keep Austin out. And while all this happens, Undertaker hits Vader so hard in the balls that Vader flies over the top rope. Vader has been eliminated from the final four. Austin is now in the ring and this is something The Undertaker won't allow. Austin takes a clothesline and he rolls to the outside, allowing Brett and Taker to settle this thing. The Hitman takes a choke slam. The Undertaker signals for the end and he goes for a tombstone, but Austin is so obsessed with hurting Bret Hart that the rattlesnake grabs Bret's foot while Taker was trying to perform his finishing move. Taker attacks Austin, giving Bret a chance to roll up the Phenom, but The Undertaker kicks out. Bret then tries to get Austin away from the ring apron and Taker joins in. The dead man takes care of Stone Cold, but this allows Bret to eliminate The Undertaker. Bret the Hitman Hart wins the final four and he becomes a four time WWF champion in the process. What a match this was, and I said this previously, I feel this one doesn't get enough credit. The Undertaker looks pissed off at what happened and he watches on as Bret celebrates in the ring. Hart had finally won the championship after many setbacks in late 96 and early 97, but now he has to face Psycho Sid on Monday Night Raw. The challenger comes out at the end of the show to remind Bret about what awaits him tomorrow night. If you don't feel like watching this pay per view, at least skip the rest and watch this main event. It's such an entertaining matchup, and I'm actually really glad I watched it all again for this video. It's hard to recommend this show as a whole, but the main event makes up for the shortcomings of the first few matches. In Your House 13 does get progressively better as the show goes on, with each match topping the previous match, but it's still one of the weaker overall pay-per-views of 1997. The main event is fantastic though, it feels like a big reward for sitting through the opening bouts, and the two matches beforehand, the IC title match and the tag title match, those aren't bad at all either, but they certainly aren't essential viewing. Put simply though, if you enjoy wrestling from this era, then make sure you watch the final four match. Bret leaves the arena as WWF champion, but the story continues on tomorrow's Raw. Some big things go down on the WWF's flagship weekly show, so remember to subscribe to the channel and check out Reliving the War episode 71 if you want to see what happens next. Thanks for watching this one, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you join me again next week. WWF WrestleMania 13 took place on March 23rd, 1997 in the Rosemont Horizon in Chicago, Illinois, now renamed to the Allstate Arena. The show was attended by around 18,000 fans, and WrestleMania 13 has the distinction of having the lowest pay-per-view buy rate in WrestleMania history. A reported 237,000 homes bought the show on pay-per-view. 
WCW Nitro was doing great numbers during this time period and many fans got their wrestling fix over on TNT, but the World Wrestling Federation were now beginning to really fight back with the rebranding of Monday Night Raw and their focus on more contemporary storytelling. They still have a long way to go but WrestleMania 13 does have that 1997 pre-Attitude Era feel of WWF television, especially when compared to WrestleMania 12 and WrestleMania 11. WrestleMania 13's main event features Psycho Sid defending the WWF Championship against The Undertaker. We also have the critically acclaimed Bret Hart vs Steve Austin submission match, and a Chicago street fight is going to take place too featuring Ahmed Johnson and the Legion of Doom taking on the Nation of Domination. I was going to use the Coliseum video release of WrestleMania 13 for this upload because I'm pretty sure the network version is from the WrestleMania Anthology box set and I wasn't sure if those re-releases left anything out, but it turns out the network release actually has a longer runtime with the original video release cutting out content, an example being Ken Shamrock's backstage interview being much shorter on the video tape due to the removal of WWF Raw footage. So let's get started then, this is WrestleMania 13. The WrestleMania Free For All show featured a Billy Gunn vs Flash Funk match, Gunn won the match with a Tornado DDT. Steve Austin cut a promo where he said he doesn't know a whole lot of submission moves but he plans on beating up Bret Hart so bad tonight that the hitman will have no choice but to give up. Stone Cold also said that Bret's been complaining a lot about getting screwed and well, Austin said this. Let me just tell you this son. I ain't bringing a condom to the ring, I'm bringing a hell of a can of whoop ass. This really should have made it to the pay per view. Farouk and the Nation of Domination also had a backstage interview where Farouk said he's gonna tie a rope around Ahmed's neck later on in the Chicago street fight. Vince McMahon had to apologize afterwards. And The Undertaker also spoke to the crowd without making a physical appearance. Undertaker said WrestleMania 13 will be Psycho Sid's final resting place and tonight, in order to move forward, The Undertaker and the fans of the World Wrestling Federation will move back in time during the WrestleMania main event. The free for all can be skipped but the Austin promo is worth hunting down. The pay per view then opened up with a 4 team elimination match. The Godwins vs the Headbangers vs Furnace and Lafon vs the new Blackjacks. A tag can be made to any man, when a competitor is defeated his team is eliminated, and the last team remaining will be the winners and that team gets a title shot tomorrow night on Raw's War. We did get to see two members of the same team get tagged in at the same time. Mosh and Thrasher decided not to fight though and Jerry Lawler told Vince McMahon that what we're seeing here is a mosh pit. The first teams eliminated were the new Blackjacks and Furnace and Lafon. After Bradshaw performed this messy suplex to the outside, Bradshaw then pushed Mike Kyoda and our referee decided to disqualify Bradshaw and Wyndham. For whatever reason, this also led to Furnace and Lafon getting eliminated too. Jim Ross says that they could have been counted out. So our four team elimination match then turned into a regular tag match with the Headbangers taking on the Godwins and the Headbangers got a chance to show off what they could do while attacking the Godwins on the outside. Back inside the ropes, Thrasher misses a moonsault and Phineas Godwin almost won the match when he went for a slop drop on Mosh, but Thrasher saved the day, allowing Mosh to hit a top rope bombs away on a standing Phineas Godwin. The Headbangers get a shot at the tag titles on Raw tomorrow night. It's certainly not one of my favourite WrestleMania opening matches, but it was a good showing from the Headbangers. It's just a shame that Furnace and Lafon got eliminated so unceremoniously. Captain Lou Albano and Arnold Scotland are seen in the audience and Captain Lou dances to the Honky Tonk Man's theme music. These fans sitting behind the Hall of Famers don't have a clue what the captain is trying to do, but nonetheless, it looks like Captain Lou is having a lot of fun tonight. Honky Tonk Man is going to provide commentary for our next bout, the IC title match featuring champion Rocky Maivia and the Sultan. No story at all for this one, Bob Backlund and the Iron Sheik randomly announced that the Sultan was number one contender and Tony Atlas stopped Maivia from fighting the Sultan on the previous episode of Raw. The Sultan, quite simply, had done very little on TV as a character to deserve a IC title shot, but well, here we are. Both superstars don't get much of a reaction during the entrances but credit to Maivia, he does try to get them into it before the match begins. Sultan puts the champ down with a shoulder block and Maivia kips up afterwards. Rocky then lands a few punches before hitting the Sultan with a clothesline and a dropkick. 
Sultan ends up on the outside, and the referee stops my via from launching an aerial attack from the top rope. The crowd then begins chanting Rocky sucks as the Sultan pulls my via out of the ring. Rocky lays in more right hands, but he eventually ends up clotheslining the ring post. That's twice he's done that now. Honky Tonk Man gets all fired up, or all shook up, as Sultan uses the guardrail to hurt my via, and when the match gets back in the ring, Sultan floors Rocky with a few clotheslines. After taking this beating, Rocky kicks out at one. My via was good in the ring, but he was still doing things like this. The crowd continues to chant Rocky sucks as Sultan applies a nerve hold. The two men get back up and Sultan puts Maivia down again with a knee to the midsection, and then the Sultan pulls off a diving headbutt, the first move that got a decent crowd reaction. Rocky then tries a sunset flip and we get a little Aloha Sultan action. Sultan avoids getting pinned but he still manages to put Rocky down with a belly to belly suplex. We then see the wrestling bio's favourite, the dreaded chin lock and this one stays locked in for a solid minute and a half. The crowd chanted boring and they booed the match, and I don't remember the audience being so hostile towards the two competitors. Both men go down after a double clothesline and matters aren't helped when both guys stay down on the mat. Rock fires back afterwards and he gets all excited after a few punches. Sultan then takes a belly to belly which did look pretty good and Rock then hits his float over DDT. Again, this looked good. Rock takes to the skies for a crossbody but the Iron Sheik distracts Art Hebner when Sultan gets pinned. Rock is able to stop the Sultan from getting a cheap shot in, but he doesn't stop the Sultan from nearly kicking his head off with a sidekick. Maivia gets hit with a pile driver and moments later the match ends when Rocky counters a slam and he performs a schoolboy pin, scoring the 1-2-3 and ending a match that fans couldn't have cared less about. The Sultan attacks Maivia during a post-match interview and Maivia takes a beating from the Sultan and the Iron Sheik. This eventually leads to Soul Man Rocky Johnson hitting the ring to help his son. When the Sultan begins attacking Johnson, Maivia gets back to his feet and the bad guys get taken out. I'm sure this is a great memory for Dwayne Johnson and I'm sure he was very excited for this moment back in 1997, but you gotta be honest too, The Rock's WrestleMania debut was seriously underwhelming and the fans were rapidly turning on my via. It was getting worse week after week. Ken Shamrock gets interviewed backstage and we see clips of Ken embarrassing Billy Gunn on Raw. As mentioned, these clips were removed from the Coliseum video release. Shamrock talks us through the armbar and ankle lock submissions, saying he didn't want to hurt Billy, he just wanted Gunn to know who he was and who he was dealing with. Because he knows a thing or two about submissions, Ken feels he's the right man to referee the Hart vs Austin match tonight. He says he won't let Brett or Stone Cold intimidate him or sway him in making an unfair call. Shamrock is at WrestleMania to call the match right down the middle and raise the winner's hand when all is said and done. Doc Hendricks then interviews Triple H in China and Doc wants to know more about Hunter's relationship with China. Triple H says Doc doesn't need to know anything about her and he leaves it at that. As for tonight and as for Goldust, Hunter will make easy work of the bizarre one but the big loser will be Marlena tonight. This whole feud started when Marlena turned down Triple H's advances at In Your House It's Time and Hunter says Marlena had her chance and she turned it down. Now Marlena has to worry about China standing at ringside. These two also had an intercontinental title match back at the Royal Rumble and it was a pretty scrappy match. Let's see how they do here at Wrestlemania. Goldust surprises Hunter with a clothesline and he instantly goes on the attack. From here it's all Goldust and Hunter can't get started at all. Goldust brings Hemsley to the corner where China gets spat on and Hunter gets a big old kiss on the lips. And then Hunter gets clotheslined out of the ring after taking an inverted atomic drop. On the outside, Triple H gets tied up in the ropes, giving Goldust a few free shots right to Hunter's nose. And Triple H takes a big kick to the face before getting clotheslined back into the ring. I thought this spot looked great. Triple H finally fights back with a face buster. China keeps a close eye on Marlena as Hunter's short comeback gets stopped with a power slam. But Hunter is then able to counter a superplex reversal and Goldust gets dumped to the outside. The cameras focus on China again, making fans wonder if she's gonna strike. But Goldust ends up getting thrown back inside by Triple H and Hunter comes off the top rope with a diving forearm. 
Hunter then exposes the chest of gold dust and a few hard knife edge chops gets followed up by a mud hole stomping in the corner. Now in the driver's seat, Hunter hits a neck breaker before applying an abdominal stretch. The hold is broken by Kyoda and Goldust lands a hip toss, but Hunter comes back with a running knee strike. The crowd is absolutely silent here. Usual spots that would get good reactions, like Goldust getting the knees up to smash Hunter's little king of kings here. This is met with a smattering of applause, and it's not like Goldust and Triple H were doing anything wrong here. The fans just didn't care. It ends when China begins approaching Marlena. Hunter and Goldust counter pedigree and curtain call attempts, but Goldust ends up setting Marlena up on the apron for safekeeping, probably the worst place she could have been. Hunter hits another running knee strike and this causes Marlena to fall into a China bear hug. Hunter hits a pedigree in the ring while Marlena gets thrown around like a rag doll. And that's how this one ended. I think the WWF were expecting some sort of round of applause for Goldust and Marlena or some showing of sympathy, but there's nothing here. It's another painfully average match at WrestleMania. The tag team championships were on the line next, Vader and Mankind getting a shot at Bulldog and Owen's belts. The WWF played up to the underlying problems between Owen and Davey that began back at the Royal Rumble, with Jim Ross asking the champs if there's some jealousy here and asking who the leader of the team is. Owen says he's the leader, while Davey says that he's actually the leader. Clearly the champs were having issues, but they didn't want to address them. Owen is now a two-time Slammy Award winner also. He stole his second award at the Slammy show two nights prior. As for Big Van Vader and Mankind, they're simply a tag team because they share the same manager. I never thought Vader and Paul Bearer was a good pairing at all. And as I mentioned on Reliving the War, I think there were better ways to use all the excellent talent that's in this matchup. Fortunately though, this tag match got the fans back into the show. Vader and Owen started things off and Owen was able to keep control of the match during the opening moments, but it didn't take long for Vader to fight back. A big powerbomb put an end to Owen's offensive flurry. Davey and Mankind then came into the match and the crowd popped when Owen and Bulldog put both of their opponents down. Davey then hit suplexes on both Mankind and Vader. The Vader suplex was a sight to behold. And we also got a WrestleMania sized chin lock from Davey Boy Smith. You normally don't see these in Bulldog tag matches, so it was a special night indeed. And uh, it's WrestleMania, let's do it. Davey Boy Smith Chenlock. On the outside, Mick Foley tried to take Davey out with The Undertaker's urn, but Davey hit a drop toe hold. The referee was too busy with the one on the apron, so Vader rushed over and Bulldog ended up taking a shot to the head. From here, Vader and Mankind maintained control while keeping Davey away from his corner. Quick tags by the heels ensured that Owen couldn't get tagged in for an extended period of time, but when he did eventually get back in the match, the King of Hearts was all fired up and the crowd cheered for Owen. The tag champs definitely worked babyface here and this isn't the first time they've done that either. Eventually, Owen takes a beating on the outside while Stu and Helen Hart watch on from their ringside seats. The match gets back inside the ropes and this time it's Owen who needs to make a tag. The challengers have worked better as a tag team tonight and the champions have had to take opportunities to tag out rather than create opportunities. Owen ends up on the outside again and he hits a belly to belly suplex on the outside right in front of his parents. Mankind and Bulldog end up the legal men inside the ring, but Vader knocks Owen into Davey and this causes the Bulldog and Foley to fall out of the ring. Mankind applies the mandible claw and the referee ends up calling for the bell. We have a count out finish this time and the crowd weren't happy with the outcome. Owen has to pry Mankind away from Davey and Vader tries to attack Owen. Eventually the challengers are sent to the back while Owen and Davey hobble over to their tag belts and slammy awards. So far this was the best match on the card but that isn't saying much either. WrestleMania 13 was in danger of being a very forgettable pay per view. But then, it was time for the Bret Hart vs Steve Austin submission match. Since coming back to the World Wrestling Federation, Bret Hart has had a lot of problems with Stone Cold Steve Austin. At In Your House It's Time, Austin attacked Bret during a WWF title match, 
At the Royal Rumble, Austin got eliminated, but he jumped back into the ring while referees weren't looking and he ended up eliminating Bret Hart to win the match. But maybe the worst thing Austin did to Hart was cost him the WWF Championship 24 hours after the Hitman won the belt at In Your House Final Four. Not only was Bret dealing with Stone Cold Steve Austin, he also had issues with Shawn Michaels dating back to WrestleMania 12. Shawn too had played a part in costing Bret the Championship back at In Your House its time. And Brett had become very vocal about how he was getting screwed and how there was no justice in the World Wrestling Federation. Brett was right though, he was getting screwed over, but the constant complaining was highlighted by Steve Austin on TV, and fans were beginning to realise that Austin had a point. Brett was doing a whole lot of crying. Brett vs Austin was almost a WWF Championship match at WrestleMania, but Sid was able to beat Bret Hart in a steel cage match on Raw. Austin tried to help the hitman in order to get a shot at the title, but The Undertaker made sure that he stayed in the main event by closing the cage door in Brett's face. After the bout, Brett went on a verbal tirade, ripping into Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation and talking about everyone turning a blind eye to what's been going on. Hart has promised to beat Austin to a pulp tonight, and Austin said he will never give up. Something has to give in this submission match, and there was a feeling of unpredictability heading into this bout. Ken Shamrock looks all business as he gets ready to referee this match. We see the iconic Steve Austin glass shattering entrance as Austin makes his way to the ring, and it almost feels like we have a brand new audience inside the Rosemont Horizon. There's a real shift in atmosphere. Vince McMahon says Brett's getting a mixed reaction on his way to the ring, and I know Vince was trying to set up the story here, but from what we hear on TV, Brett gets a great reaction during his entrance. Brett steps inside the ropes and Austin takes him down right away. This won't be a wrestling match, it's gonna be a fight. The two men keep throwing punches as they roll out of the ring where the fight continues. Brett eventually throws Austin into the ring post, but Stone Cold replies by smashing Brett's little sharpshooter on the guardrail. Stone Cold then hits a clothesline while Brett's perched on the barrier, and Austin slams Brett's head into the steel right in front of Captain Lou and Tony Atlas. The two men then begin travelling through the audience where the fight continues, and Ken Shamrock has the task of keeping fans away from two of the WWF's most popular superstars. Austin takes a soft drink and he throws it all over the hitman, and Vince McMahon says that Brett's falling right into Austin's trap here. This is the kind of fight that Austin can easily win. Things get frantic and it's hard to see what's going on at times. Brett backdrops Austin just before security assists both men in getting back to the ringside area, but what Brett and Austin successfully done here was get the whole crowd back into WrestleMania 13. This was the loudest Chicago had been since the beginning of the show. Hart drops a forearm on Austin and Stone Cold replies by throwing Brett into the ring steps. Brett takes a phenomenal bump here, absolutely no fear in hitting those steps as hard as possible. Austin keeps the pressure on with a diving attack from the apron and Brett has to save himself from getting destroyed even further with the ring steps. Back inside the ring, Austin stomps on Brett's fingers, but Brett comes back with a swinging neckbreaker. We see the elbow drop from Brett's rope. And then it was time for Brett to begin working over the left leg. Brett does everything he can think of to weaken the leg, from using the ropes to his advantage to flat out punching the body part. The hitman is getting vicious and he begins screaming for Austin to stand up. Hart gets too confident though, Austin dodges an attack and the rattlesnake hits a stone cold stunner but pinfalls don't count here. Brett has to say he submits and the hitman doesn't give up just yet. Brett gets back up as Austin hobbles on one leg. Brett's able to bring Stone Cold back down by going after the damaged limb. The hitman then goes to the outside and he grabs the ring bell, but he ends up leaving it on the apron before grabbing a chair. Brett gets back in the ring and he places the chair on Austin's ankle. He wants to pulmonize Stone Cold Steve Austin. There's a loud gasp as Brett sets up the move. The hitman then goes to the top rope, but Austin wakes up and Hart takes a chair shot. Take a look at this next chair shot and look at how Brett sells it. Absolutely brilliant. Austin keeps the pressure on with a suplex. We see Stone Cold's elbow drop from Brett's rope. And we get to see the Hart family's reactions as Steve brings it down to the mat and Brett gets his neck and arm stretched out. Austin then applies a Boston Crab and Shamrock forces a break when Brett makes it to the ropes. And Austin tries a sharpshooter afterwards but Brett breaks it by raking Austin in the eyes. 
Austin throws Brett out of the ring and Stone Cold raises his arms up to the fans in attendance. There's a lot of support for Stone Cold tonight, but you can also hear a lot of fans booing Austin. Stone Cold goes to the outside and Brett manages to throw Austin into the guardrail. It's at this point where Brett blades Austin and it's an impressive job too by the way. Austin said he wasn't comfortable doing the blade job himself so Brett did it for him. Vince McMahon had no idea it was going to happen. Hart throws Austin into the ring post and Stone Cold is an absolute mess. The match gets back inside the ring and the fans give a round of applause for what they are witnessing. Hart hits a backbreaker, we see another second rope elbow drop and then Brett completely loses it and he begins destroying Steve's leg with a chair. Brett again gets vicious here, he wants to beat Austin into submission but Austin simply won't give up. Stone Cold avoids a sharpshooter attempt and when Brett brings the fight to the corner, Stone Cold gets out of danger by hitting a low blow on the excellence of execution. Brett then takes a turnbuckle bump chest first and Steve Austin seriously fires up. The crowd cheers as Stone Cold destroys Brett in the corner and Stone Cold hits a superplex. Austin then decides he's gonna choke Brett using some cable on the outside of the ring and although it initially works, Brett grabs the ring bell he left on the apron earlier and Stone Cold gets clocked. This right here was the game changer. Brett had done enough damage, he was able to lock in the sharpshooter and history is made when blood pours from Austin's face while locked in Brett's finishing move. Stone Cold screams in agony and he almost breaks the hold but Brett locks it back in and the torture continues. Steve Austin can't make it to the ropes, he can't break the hold, but he won't give up. Brett has it locked all the way in and there's no escape for Austin. Stone Cold ends up passing out. Shamrock shouts if Austin doesn't answer him, he will end the fight. Stone Cold is now completely unresponsive, so Shamrock tells Brett to release the hold. The match is over. Brett wins, even though Stone Cold didn't submit. There was nothing else that Shamrock could have done. The story of the match doesn't end here though. Brett celebrates and he gets a great crowd reaction too. All Brett had to do now was walk away, but all those times Austin screwed him over, all those times Austin took away Brett's opportunities, it all comes rushing back and Brett decides to beat Austin up while Stone Cold is still down. Shamrock has to step in to stop Brett applying another sharpshooter and the crowd pops huge when Shamrock hits a belly to belly suplex. Bret Hart and Ken Shamrock then square off. Brett considers his next move and Hart decides to walk away and leave the ring. The crowd then boos Brett. Not only did Brett literally kick a man while he was down, but he also backed down from a fight. Brett flips off a fan as he walks back up the entranceway and Stone Cold refuses help inside the ring. This right here was the icing on the cake. Stone Cold hits a stunner on Mike Chioda and Steve Austin leaves the ring all on his own. He's been beaten up badly, he's in a lot of pain, but he didn't give up and he didn't ask for nor does he want anyone's help. A loud Austin chant breaks out and Stone Cold lifts his head up to look at the audience before leaving. An absolute bona fide wrestling classic, the greatest double turn in the history of the business. Stone Cold Steve Austin was now a made man and a main event caliber superstar. And as for Bret Hart, well the hitman was going to answer a lot of questions tomorrow night on Raw. Bret may have won the match, but he just lost a ton of fan support. What a story and what a match, this was brilliant. Ooh, my my, Wrestlemania just got a shot in the arm and it isn't the next match that suffers, it's actually the main event that falls victim to the match schedule. Because the Nation of Domination vs LOD and Ahmed Johnson is contested under street fight rules, they can get away with getting cheap pops by just using weapons. Sid and The Undertaker have to follow two matches that were absolute balls to the wall and it makes things a little tough for the WWF Champion and the Phenom. Farouk gets interviewed backstage and Todd Pettengill comments on all the weapons the nation has backstage. Todd says the nation has everything but the kitchen sink and Farouk says just wait and see. Vince McMahon again says the nation has brought everything but the kitchen sink during the nation's entrance, so you just know someone's gonna have a sink with them during the match. And right enough, it's Road Warrior Hawk that brings it out. Ahmed Johnson is wearing some Legion of Doom spikes and interesting story, Road Warrior Animal accused Johnson of stealing the spikes after the match. 
Ahmed says they were given to him by Road Warrior Hawk, and he sent them away to be displayed in the Dolls Sportatorium, which by the way was demolished after a fire caused irreparable damage in late 2001. Whatever the case may be, I thought Ahmed wearing the spiked shoulder pads was a nice touch. And I'm not going to talk about this move for move because it's just pure chaos. Nation Lackey's PG-13 and D'Lo get taken out at the beginning of the match, Ahmed Johnson performs a fucking somersault plancha over the guardrail onto Crush, and check out Hawk's smooth recovery here when he loses grip of the 2x4. Good work. A pile driver attempt by Animal to Farouk doesn't go too well on the French announce table, and Farouk getting spread with a fire extinguisher doesn't get picked up by the cameras, although we do get to see it in instant replay. You kind of gain a new appreciation for the WCW split screen as the chaos unfolds. Ahmed finds himself getting tied up with a rope but Road Warrior Animal runs in to save the day. Ahmed batters Farouk with a parking sign a few times, but this isn't the worst thing that happens to the nations later during this match. This spot here ended up giving Farouk a separated shoulder and he'd be out of action afterwards for around 2 months. Ahmed hits a spinebuster on Farouk as Hawk uses the fire extinguisher on the outside, but the remaining members of the nation stop Johnson from performing the Pearl River Plunge. The babyfaces make quick work of their opponents though with Crush taking a doomsday device and this gets followed up with a 2x4 to the face, Animal pins Crush afterwards and that's how it ended. The fight continued after the bell, Farouk is kept away from danger as D'Lo takes a Pearl River Plunge and then we see a double doomsday device on PG-13, this was fantastic. This bout kept the fans pumped up after the submission match and those in attendance had a great time watching the Chicago street fight, but now Sid and The Undertaker had the main event to show by bringing it back to basics with a one on one match. Could they pull it off while keeping fans invested? Let's find out. Undertaker was named the number one contender after In Your House Final Four and Taker had to do all he could to protect his title shot even getting involved in the aforementioned Raw Steel Cage match. Before Shawn Michaels forfeited the WWF Championship, I'm not sure The Undertaker would have been in the running for a title shot at WrestleMania, but the Road to Mania 13 was one with many bumps and it all kinda worked out for the Phenom. This was The Undertaker's first ever WrestleMania main event. Not much story between these two at all, they had their standard run-ins on Raw and all that, but there's nothing substantial here at all, it's simply champion vs challenger to end the show. Shawn Michaels is here to provide commentary for the match, HBK is fond of sticking his nose into other people's business, so fans wondered how he was going to get involved in this one, but fortunately Shawn stayed away from the ring. Remember how The Undertaker said he and the fans were going to go back in time in order to progress into the future? Well, the dead man came out wearing his original grey and black colours, and he brought back the more slow paced, methodical Undertaker for this match. It was good to see, and die hard Undertaker fans I'm sure love to see this, but it's also a double edged sword. The Undertaker was trying to evolve ever since the 1996 Survivor Series, and he even talked about changing his attitude again after his match with Vader at the Royal Rumble, but instead of evolving he decided to bring it back to the beginning for WrestleMania 13. This isn't a complaint by the way, The Undertaker bringing back the original look of the dead man was a highlight of Mania 13. Sid cut a promo before the match where he said he's the one man who isn't afraid of the darkness, he wasn't afraid of the undertaker and Sid will still be the master and ruler of the world after this title match. After both men made their entrances they square up to each other, the match is just about to get underway, but here comes Bret Hart again and he has a few things he needs to say. Brad says that Sean's sitting out here with a pussyfoot injury and he should go back home and try to find his smile again. Brett then warns HBK to stay out of the match. The hitman then tells the Phenom that when The Undertaker closed the cage door on him during the Raw's War title match, the Phenom also closed the door on their friendship. From now on, Brett and The Undertaker will operate under a new set of rules. Psycho Sid is up next. Brett says Sid's WWF Championship belongs to Brett and Psycho Sid is nothing but a fraud. Everyone in the building knows that Brett's the best there is, best there was and best there ever will be, and Sid doesn't want to hear it, Brett ends up getting smacked and he takes a power bomb as well. The crowd pops and Sean laughs on commentary. Sid tells Brett to get his whining ass out of the ring 
and after Sid gets done kicking Taker's ass, he'll invite Brett back down to the ring. Undertaker decides to begin the match there and then, and the bell finally rings to start the WrestleMania main event. Sid whips Taker into the corner, but the Phenom gets a boot up. A flurry of corner strikes get followed up with a corner splash, and Sid takes a body slam in the middle of the ring. Undertaker then hits old school, he goes for another splash, but Sid catches his opponent and he applies a bear hug. A bear hug this early into the match isn't the best of ideas. Over a minute and a half of bear hugging action can feel like an eternity, and the WWF break up the broadcast by showing Shawn Michaels on commentary. Incredibly, Sid applies another two bear hugs when The Undertaker breaks free, but thankfully the pace quickens up a little when Sid hits a big boot before pushing the dead man out of the ring. Sid then tries to slam the Phenom through the table and The Undertaker gets his back rammed into the ring post. Vince McMahon then conveniently remembers that Sid and The Undertaker requested that this match be a no disqualification match. Back in the ring, Sid puts Undertaker in a camel clutch. The champ then comes off the second rope with a double axe handle. When Taker starts to fight back, he gets put right back down with a power slam. Sid then lines up a leg drop and before doing so, he walks over to The Undertaker to call a spot or tell Taker to move or something. Who knows, there's definite blatant communication here before Sid hits the dead man and afterwards, Taker gets choked at the ropes. The crowd gets a reason to cheer when Taker pulls off his jumping clothesline, but you get the feeling that the audience are pretty much ready to go home, especially when Sid instantly goes back in the driver's seat. The two men fight on the outside and Sid's the third competitor to take a bump over the guardrail tonight. Taker then throws Sid into the steps but as soon as the match gets back inside the ropes, Sid goes back on offense. Sid applies a modified chin lock using both hands to clamp down on Undertaker's face and man, this just hasn't been good at all. A power slam from the Undertaker gets a smattering of applause and the dead man applies a nerve lock. Sid then gets up and he tries a big boot but Taker counters with a clothesline. A double big boot floors both men and once again, to break up the monotony, the WWF show Shawn Michaels watching the match on his monitor. Sid takes to the skies with a top rope double axe handle and a flying clothesline. His third attempt at an aerial attack gets countered. Sid instantly comes back with a body slam but Taker counters another top rope attack and Sid gets slammed to the mat. Taker then pulls off a diving clothesline of his own that did look good. Taker signals for the end and he goes for a tombstone but Sid counters and the Phenom takes his own move. He's still able to kick out a two though. The two fight on the outside again and Bret Hart returns with a steel chair, getting some revenge for that power bomb earlier on. Bret gets pulled away by officials and when the match gets back in the ring, Taker hits a choke slam. Sid kicks out of the follow up pin. Sid then finds an opening and he goes for the power bomb, but Bret Hart shows up one more time and Sid ends up getting his neck snapped across the top rope. The Phenom takes advantage, he nails a tombstone pile driver and the match is over. The Undertaker becomes WWF Champion at WrestleMania 13 after a pretty boring main event, no other way to say it. I know this one has its fans, but for a WrestleMania main event, I felt it was an absolute slog to get through. The two matches beforehand didn't help matters either, but Sid and Taker also had no story going into this one. It felt like fans only stuck around to see The Undertaker win the belt. Taker celebrates with the championship as WrestleMania 13 goes off the air. It's a bit unfair to say that WrestleMania 13 was a one match show because the other matches really had a lot going against them, from their placement on the card, the lack of meaningful stories, and bouts being given way too much time with matches lasting between 10 and 20 odd minutes. It's a lot to ask of fans to sit through a series of long matches without a few shorter ones to break things up. Hart vs Austin saved WrestleMania from being a disaster though. The tag title match wasn't bad either. Watching this back today though made me realize that the Sid vs Taker match was actually worse than I remember it, and most other matches on the card were forgettable too, including the Chicago Street Fight. WrestleMania 13 is remembered for Bret Hart vs Steve Austin and Taker holding the belt at the very end of the show, and if I'm totally honest, this is all you really need to see from this event. WCW Uncensored the week prior might be an overall better show, but nothing could top the submission match. 
With that being said, I do have a soft spot for this show because this was when I was totally invested in the World Wrestling Federation again and I love this era of the company. But watching it back now and being truthful with myself, it's, it's not a great show. But that's going to do it for this one guys. Join me for Reliving the War on Thursday where we'll see what happens with the Hitman and we'll hopefully learn about The Undertaker's first challenger for the World Wrestling Federation Championship. Thanks for watching this one, I hope you enjoyed it and take care. In Your House 14, Revenge of the Taker took place in Rochester, New York on April 20th, 1997 in front of around 11,500 fans. A reported 120,000 fans bought the pay-per-view to see The Undertaker's first WWF title defense since WrestleMania and a rematch between Bret Hart and Stone Cold Steve Austin, the latter being the main event of the show in a match that initially wasn't planned. This In Your House event kinda retains the same low budget feel that Final Four had with the distinctive In Your House entranceway being greatly simplified, but things like this shouldn't matter, it's all about what happens in the ring. Just before we look at the pay per view, if you haven't checked it out yet, please take a look at the channel update video I put out last week. Reliving the War episode 80 and other videos on the channel might get delayed, so I wanted to keep you guys in the loop and stay transparent. Please watch that channel update so you know what's happening with this series and future videos over the next couple of weeks. The free for all kicks off with a match, we have The Sultan vs Flash Funk. Not a lot to say here really, you have a power guy vs the speedy high flyer and this time it's the big man who comes out on top. Sultan won with a power bomb from the second rope. Doc Hendricks hyped up the crowd talking about the three title matches we're gonna see tonight. One of those matches features these two legends making their way down to the ring for an interview, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog. What's notable here is the fact that Owen and Davey came out to Bret Hart's theme song for the very first time. Bret's entrance music would end up becoming the theme song for the Hart Foundation. Doc wonders why Owen and Bulldog came out to Bret's music and Owen said the family had a vote and because loving brother Bret is so inspirational, the family decided to use his iconic entrance theme. Bret then makes his way down to the ring and before the hitman talks, the Bulldog says he, Bret and Owen are the new Hart Foundation and they're gonna kill the World Wrestling Federation. When Doc says Bret's gonna face Steve Austin tonight and after the crowd pops at hearing Stone Cold's name, Brett says this is a perfect example of how far America's principles have sunk. The hitman still can't get over the fact that fans would cheer for someone like Steve Austin after everything Stone Cold's done to him. Brett says he's going to drive home the fact that family values do exist in the WWF and those values begin and end with the Hart Foundation. Hawk and Animal then show up and Road Warrior Animal has a bit of a Scotty Steiner moment on the mic. We've been jumped. We want to jump you. Hawk says the big problem here is the Hart Foundation and the Hart Foundation's problem is the LOD. Brett tells Hawk and Animal to go back and touch up their mascara and makeup because the Road Warriors aren't dealing with any tag team tonight, they're dealing with the best tag team in the world. And Animal then says at least LOD aren't the ones looking at men in magazines referring to Brett ripping into Sean for posing in Playgirl. LOD promised to win the tag team belts before leaving, and Brett says the Hart Foundation is here to stay until American wrestling fans realize the difference between right and wrong. Honky Tonk Man came out afterwards promising fans that his new protege will get revealed later in a match against Jesse James, and Mankind also cut a promo where he addressed The Undertaker. While holding a fire extinguisher, Mankind says we're gonna have a barbecue tonight at In Your House and The Undertaker will have to rely on others using the fire extinguisher to put out the flames because Mick Foley has no mercy to give. 
we'll talk about the build-up to the Mankind vs Undertaker match a little later on. Our pay-per-view opens up with the Owen and Davey vs Legion of Doom tag team title match, and the WWF may have inadvertently killed the Road Warriors pop by having Hawk and Animal also appear on the free-for-all. The Legion of Doom sided with Steve Austin during these early days of the Stone Cold vs Heart Foundation rivalry, and the Road Warriors find themselves getting a shot at the tag team titles tonight. Owen and Davey got the upper hand during the short build up to this match with the tag champs ducking out of the way and letting the Legion of Doom get slopped by the Godwins, and the week after that happened, the Bulldog made sure the Legion of Doom didn't win their follow up match against Henry and Phineas. The build up was very short. Animal and Owen start us off, and Animal takes control by kicking Owen multiple times in the corner and a jumping shoulder tackle sends the King of Hearts crashing to the mat. Not a great start for the champs. Owen tries to get it together, but his front face lock gets countered with ease. So, reliving the war favourite, Davy Boy Smith gets tagged in, and I'm still waiting to see him perform a chin lock during a tag team match. Maybe tonight's the night. Hawk gets tagged in and Bulldog takes a hard clothesline. He then gets brought to the opposition's corner where he takes more punishment. Owen tries to help but the referee sends him back to his corner, and Hawk lets Owen know what he thinks of him after hitting Davey with a shoulder tackle. Finally, the Hart Foundation get a chance on offense when Davey hits Hawk with a clothesline, and Owen performs a top rope forearm after getting tagged back in. Hawk breaks a sharpshooter attempt and Animal gets tagged back in. Animal performs a power slam, and then he performs a chin lock. We go to split screen and we see Steve Austin arrive, but check out Bulldog clopping for Animal. He doesn't care if his tag partner's in any kind of trouble, Davey just loves seeing a good chin lock. Owen breaks free, but he takes a press slam. Animal grabs Owen by the hair and Owen goes to the mat again, and Hawk comes back in after hitting a top rope splash. A collision in the corner sends both men down, but Owen manages to hit an enziguri afterwards. Davey gets tagged in, Hawk is in prime position here, and yes, it's a Davey Boy Smith chin lock. A pay per view Davey Boy chin lock and a tag team Davey Boy chin lock. This pay per view has already been saved. Five stars. End the video. The legendary British Bulldog only tagged in to perform the chin lock. That's brilliant. He tags straight back out and Owen applies a sleeper. The crowd start getting anxious and they want to see Animal get tagged in. And as Hawk fights his way out of the sleeper, we see Jerry Lawler and Jim Ross having an argument at the commentary table. They've been arguing since the beginning of this match about, well, about nothing at all really. Davey comes back in illegally to do some double teamwork, but Hawk pushes Davey into Owen. This sends the King of Hearts flying out of the ring. Animal gets tagged in and we see an impressive power slam from the middle rope. Animal pins Bulldog, 1-2-3. The Legion of Doom win the match and they become tag team champions. As Owen and Bulldog leave the ring, Mike Chioda comes down and he advises match referee Jack Doan that Davey Boy Smith was not the legal man, and so the match is gonna continue. Owen and Davey just want their belts back, but it's announced that the champs will lose those belts if they don't return to the ring. Owen and Davey rush back down the entranceway and the match resumes. The champs try to get it over with and get out with a quick victory after the restart, but the plan falls apart when Owen misses a top rope splash, caught on the split screen here. Hawk comes in, he wipes Owen and Davey out with a double clothesline, Owen then takes a devastating doomsday device and that should be the match all over. Now take a look at this, the referee delays the count because Bret Hart was late running down to the ring. Bret goes as fast as he can and he breaks the pin, meaning LOD win via disqualification but they don't win the tag team belts. The Road Warriors look extremely disappointed at the outcome and Vince McMahon says the last thing the Hearts want to do is get on LOD's bad side. Davey and Owen get interviewed by Doc Hendricks afterwards, and Doc says the champs must feel pretty lucky about what happened tonight, and Owen says luck has nothing to do with it. Owen and Davey are still champs because they're the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Hendricks then tells the champs that Steve Austin just showed up, and this seems to surprise Owen and Davey. We go to the superstar room where Brian Pullman whispers something to Sonny. Let me know in the comments what Brian says here. The two plug the WWF superstar line. It's good to see Brian back. 
and he's going to play a bigger role on WWF television very soon. Up next we had Savio Vega vs Rocky Maivia for the IC title. Savio beat Rocky on Raw from South Africa just 6 days earlier and it was one of the most boring matches you'll ever see in your life. Savio pulled off not 3, not 4, not 5, but 6 nerve holds in one match and I'm not prepared to put myself through that absolute torture again, but I do want to know if Savio pulled off a similar amount of deadly nerve pinches in this matchup. Check out these bad motherfuckers saluting the nation on their way down to the ring, don't fuck with these guys. Rock cuts a promo before the match where he says Lady Luck has been on his side since joining the WWF, but Savio's in for a fight tonight if he wants to take away the IC title, and Kevin Kelly gives us a real stern look after the promo for some reason, kinda creeps me out. Farouk came down once the bell rung, the nation's leader provided commentary for the match, and ok, we have Rocky pulling off the arm drag and arm bar, that was the same as Raw, Farouk talking some trash, Savio attacks while Rocky's on the mat, Farouk tells us to put up or shit up. If you've got a beef with me, you either put up or shit up and let's mix it up. And there it is, nerve pinch number 1, number 2, number 3, 4, 5, we stop at 5, that's unbelievable, especially seeing as their previous match had so many also. You'd think someone would say, hey Savio, ease up on the nerve holds man, it's boring as hell. But no, this plays out pretty much the exact same way as the raw match. We even see the rock bottom again, the only thing different is the finish. Rock gets thrown out of the ring and he lands on Crush. Crush decides to hit my veil with a hard punch, and this was a mistake. Maivia not only gets knocked out but he also gets counted out, meaning Savio does not win the IC title tonight at Revenge of the Taker. Savio and Crush have an argument, Farouk gets in the ring to sort things out, and Maivia ends up taking another kicking from the Nation of Domination. This leads to Ahmed Johnson making the save once again, just like Raw the previous Monday. At the end of Raw, Farouk challenged Ahmed to a match, if Johnson could beat all 3 active members of the nation, then Farouk would disband the faction. Ahmed accepts that challenge here on the pay per view, but the match wouldn't take place until next month. All of this did absolutely no favours for Rocky Maivia, he needed Ahmed Johnson to save him twice and while Johnson had no problems clearing out the nation on his own, Rocky was struggling to even beat Savio Vega, it's no wonder people were booing him. Those nerve pinches though, 11 in one week, my my. Ken Shamrock looks at all kinds of smut backstage on the internet as Vince McMahon says it's rumoured that Shamrock will challenge Mike Tyson tomorrow night on Raw. That's pretty interesting seeing as Tyson wouldn't show up in the World Wrestling Federation until next year. Doc Hendricks interviews Sable and Mark Merrow. Merrow has been sidelined with an injury but he says he should be back in the summer. Lucky us. Sable thanks the fans for voting her Miss Slammy 1997. We see Steve Austin walking into the restroom just behind Merrow and Sable and it sounds like a fight breaks out. Davey and Owen then walk out of the restroom and I can't get enough of Owen and Davey's reactions here when they realise they were caught. I must have watched this at least 10 times. Dave Hebner says he needs help, Owen and Davey attacked Austin, no shit Sherlock. And oh, speaking of shit, our next match features Double J Jesse James taking on the honky tonk man's new protege. This whole protege thing has went on for months and now it was time for the big payoff. A few weeks back, the real Double J destroyed the honky tonk man's guitar when James refused the services of the greatest IC champion of all time, so the honky tonk man wanted to get some revenge by unleashing his new pet project on Jesse James. Out comes honky tonk man, he's wearing a different outfit now, he was in a red jumpsuit during the free for all. And if you want to see an example of an announcement totally killing an audience, look no further than the honky tonk man announcing his new protege at In Your House 14. Out comes Rockabilly, Billy Gunn with a new awful gimmick that he doesn't look too comfortable with at all and man, the fans just don't react. Billy Gunn also refused the honky tonk man services just 2 weeks ago and it's pretty well known that the original plan of bringing in Disco Inferno to become the new protege fell through so here you go, 
throw Billy Gunn out there, give him a crop jacket and tell him to dance without looking uncomfortable. This is shit. To explain this, Honky Tonk Man says that when Billy Gunn punched him in the mouth, he knew he had to persevere and get Billy to accept the offer. Billy got a money offer he couldn't refuse, and that's it. There's a light at the end of this dark, dark tunnel, though if this didn't happen, then the New Age Outlaws may never have gotten together, but yeah, Rockabilly vs Jesse James, fucking awful. Rockabilly dancing in between moves continues to get zero reaction, but you still can't deny his work inside the ring. He takes a few arm drags like a pro before getting sent out of the ring, James hits a clothesline from the apron to the outside and he warns Honky Tonk Man that he's next. I'm sure Honky is shaking in his blue suede shoes. Rockabilly gets punched in the mouth and sent back into the ring, but a poke to the eye stuns Jesse James. We then see a Famouser and Billy remembers he's supposed to have a new gimmick so he dances again. We see a little hip shaking action before James takes a neck breaker, and Rockabilly tries to impress us by squeezing down on Jesse's chin, but it'll take more than that to get praise around here son. Honky Tonk Man likes what he sees as Gunn throws Jesse to the corner. Billy then does another little dance before missing a stinger splash, and he also does the flare flop afterwards. Jesse goes on offense, he does his punch combo, his stupid dance, a clothesline in the corner followed by the strut. Billy manages to throw James out of the ring, he thinks he has it won, but Billy gets rolled up when Double J counters a corner move setup. All that and Rockabilly still takes a loss. Jesse dodges a guitar shot after the bout, and what can I say here except that this was very bad. It's worse too because of the time dedicated to the build up. The protege was teased for months and the final result really couldn't have been any worse. Poor Billy Gunn would have to go along with this for a few weeks too as the World Wrestling Federation tried to salvage the angle, but it was dead on arrival. Doc Hendricks tries to sell us this giant Undertaker poster, not bad, $30, would look nice in the kitchen or in the bathroom. Kevin Kelly interviews Steve Austin and Kelly wants to know if Stone Cold is able to compete tonight. Austin says he's still competing, Brett would have to kill him to stop tonight's match from happening, and Steve says he doesn't care about the Hart Foundation either. Because he can bring his whole family and his old fat father Stu. <laughs> Gorilla Monsoon says the Undertaker vs Mankind match will take place next. This will buy Steve a little more time before he takes on the Hitman. Kevin Kelly then sends it over to Lance Wright and the Hart Foundation. Wait, who? Who's Lance Wright? Even Davey's like, who the fuck's this guy? Lance was a live event coordinator for the WWF, apparently, and he'd done a little ring announcing at house shows. He had a brief run in ECW2 where he would manage a team of WWF invaders, including Draws, Doug Furness, Phil LaFawn, and Brockus. And it's been said his ECW character was a parody of Bruce Prichard. Anyway, Davey and Owen say that it was Austin who attacked them in the restroom earlier. The champs were celebrating while in the toilet, apparently. That's not weird at all. And Steve came in acting like a madman and throwing punches. Brett then delivers a great line before the Heart Foundation leave. You know what the bottom line is? Who's crying now? <laughs> the Undertaker and Mankind had quite the rivalry and it all started right when Mankind made his WWF debut. Mankind defeated Taker at King of the Ring 96, he beat him again at SummerSlam and Undertaker also got stabbed in the back by Paul Bearer at that pay per view. We had the Buried Alive match and the Survivor Series match, these were won by The Undertaker. And now we get to Revenge of the Taker where the WWF Championship is on the line. The theme around this match is fire. Mankind threw a fireball in Undertaker's face a few weeks back on Raw and the dead man hasn't been seen since. He has delivered promos though where he's remained out of sight saying that Mankind will burn in hell for what he did on Raw. With Mankind promising a barbecue during the free for all, you expect Fire to play a part in this title match. Mankind cuts a promo before the match saying this will be the greatest night of his life and The Undertaker's screams will be music to his ear. He comes to the ring still holding the fire extinguisher and then The Undertaker comes out. Fans were maybe expecting Taker to look a little different after the fireball attack, but he's just got a bandage on, nothing major. Taker rushes into the ring after removing his coat, but Mankind blocks the dead man's attack. 
Foley starts off aggressively, but the Phenom turns it around and Foley takes a ton of punches. Taker gets floored with a right hand, but he sits right back up. Foley hits a clothesline that sends both he and Taker out of the ring, but he pays for it dearly. He takes a sick looking bump head first into the guardrail. Twice. Foley then gets launched over the opposite guardrails and the two fight in the audience. Undertaker stays in control and already Foley has taken some serious bumps in this match. Back in the ring, Mankind finally finds out what would happen if you snatched your hand away during old school. And Undertaker shows us exactly what would happen when he performs a springboard clothesline. Unreal. And Taker then tries to end it with a tombstone pile driver, but Paul Bearer causes a distraction on the apron. Taker goes after Paul, and this of course gives Mankind a free shot. Mankind smacks Undertaker with the urn, but Taker kicks out of the follow up pin attempt. Mankind can't believe it and he starts pulling his hair out. Foley then goes on a rampage, he stays in control with a running knee in the corner and a chokehold. Undertaker tries to fight back but he gets put down with a swinging neck breaker. Foley then… <laughs> he applies a nerve hold, let's give Mankind a pass here, it suits his character way more and I'm sure he'll only do it once. Undertaker fights out and he punches Mankind out of the ring and even though Taker briefly stays in the driver's seat when the fight moves to the outside of the ring again, things get a little crazy when Mick smashes a water pitcher over Taker's head. A chair shot to the head follows, Undertaker doesn't even try to put his hands up and Vince McMahon wonders why the match is allowed to continue as Mankind stays on Taker with a second rope elbow. You know, this Taker vs Mankind match isn't brought up all that often but Foley's putting himself through a lot here. Some of these bumps look painful, uh, same for The Undertaker too, especially with that chair shot. Mankind bites at Taker's forehead, the bandage gets removed and we see a pretty good job by the makeup department. Foley continues his destruction of The Undertaker by nailing two pile drivers, but somehow The Undertaker gets up and the fight continues. Undertaker begins fighting back and he hits his signature jumping clothesline. Taker then chokes Mankind in the corner, he launches Mankind to the opposite turnbuckles, but Foley pulls Mike Kyoda in front of him and the referee gets wiped out with a Taker clothesline. Mankind then applies the mandible claw, the Undertaker goes out, and when Jack Doan comes out to officiate the match, he ends up taking an extremely bad looking bump after Foley throws him out of the ring, following another mandible claw. Watch that again, look at his head getting caught on the top rope, then his head hitting the apron, and finally the sound he makes when he hits the floor. <laughs> Paul Bear throws a chair into the ring but Mankind decides he's gonna grab the ring steps instead. The plan backfires when The Undertaker wakes up and he drop kicks the steps into Foley's face. Mick then takes a chair shot and even though he got a hand up, his head still takes a lot of impact. Foley then gets his neck caught in the top and middle ropes and Undertaker fixes this problem by removing Mankind's mask. Mick tries to get back in the ring and… Oh my gosh! Oh! Oh! It's probably one of the most unique and well thought out table bumps ever here in the WWF at least, and man does it look painful. Mick puts a hole in the commentary desk and he remains in this position until Taker comes over to lift him out. The two get back in the ring, Mankind surprises everyone by kicking out after an Undertaker chokeslam, but a tombstone is enough to end the match. Undertaker wins an extremely physical and extremely underrated match. I really enjoyed watching this one back and it's a real shame this one doesn't get talked about as much as other Foley vs Undertaker matches. Unfortunately, things don't go too well after the bout. According to Foley, he was supposed to accidentally hit Paul Bear with another fireball, but his lighter got stuck and he couldn't light the flash paper. Foley then panicked. Undertaker said he'd give it a go, but that lighter was stuck pretty good. Watch carefully and you'll see Mike Kyoda asking staff if they have a lighter at ringside. You'll also see a few fans offering their lighters, but eventually the original one works and well… <laughs> Yeah, it was worth the wait, that looked pretty good. It's a shame the lighter wouldn't work at first, especially after the two competitors had such a great match, but they got there in the end. Paul Bearer's face gets toasty, and The Undertaker gives a perplexing look as Mankind brings Bearer back up the ramp. 
lighting the fire done something to the undertaker and this is something that's going to play out over the next lot of months those of you that know what this leads to you'll know that we're in for some good stuff very soon Psycho Sid vs Bret Hart was originally supposed to take place tonight at Revenge of the Taker but Sid had neck issues or he was playing softball, it all depends who you believe. When Sid didn't show up to Raw, Steve Austin agreed to take his spot in the main event only if Gorilla Monsoon gave him a match against Bret Hart on pay per view. This one then differs greatly from Survivor Series and Wrestlemania, Bret is not established as a bad guy, to American fans at least and those same American fans have really taken the stone cold ever since Wrestlemania. He's on a roll at the moment and both he and Bret have been absolutely killing it on Raw recently. This match here, just like Taker vs Mankind, is not remembered as well as Bret and Austin's previous encounters, but let's see what happens and let's see how they did. Bret cuts a promo beforehand and he's got Owen and Davey beside him, Doc Hendricks wants to know why the tag champs are here and Bret says it's none of Doc's business. Hart says, if he went out and apologised for what he said recently, the American fans wouldn't forgive him, but at the same time, if fans came out with signs saying Brett's number one, he wouldn't forgive them either. The hitman says, this is a war, and he's gonna take it out on Stone Cold tonight. Brett's already defeated Steve twice, but this third time, Brett says he wants to end Austin's career. Brett comes out with Owen and Davey but the tag champs get sent to the back by officials. The orders came from Gorilla Monsoon to keep Owen and Bulldog away from the match. Brett has to do this one alone. Steve comes out and he looks healthy after getting attacked earlier on. The Brett and Austin fist fight starts us off, I love this spot. Austin gets the better of Brett this time and after taking a few boots, Brett gets floored again with a back elbow. Austin hits a suplex, he kicks Brett in the gut. The hitman gets choked on the ropes and when things spill to the outside, Austin lands a double axe handle from the apron. Brett tries to fight back but he gets thrown into the ring steps. This has been all Steve Austin so far and not a great start for the hitman. Stone Cold mocks Brett a little before going back to the outside and Brett again takes a bump at the ring steps. The two then fight at the entranceway, they fight in the audience after Stone Cold launches the hitman over the guardrail and Brett shows fear when he starts backing away from Austin in the ring. You guys who follow Reliving the War will know that Brett is working this match totally different tonight and he's giving Austin a lot to work with. Austin hits an elbow drop from his opponent's own rope, but Brett rolls out after the follow up pin and he tries to grab a chair. Both he and Austin end up tripping over a second chair in front of Gorilla Monsoon and both guys give each other time to get back up. Brett brings his chair into the ring but he doesn't get a chance to use it. Stone Cold takes it away but he makes the mistake of pandering to the audience. Brett hits a drop kick behind Austin's back and the referee gets taken out in the process. This allows Brett to take the chair and just like the submission match, Brett begins going to work on Austin's injured knee. Brett notices Earl Hebner is getting back up so he gets in as many shots as he can before helping Earl back to his feet. What a nice guy. Austin's being damaged badly here as Brett continues targeting the knee and out of sheer desperation Austin begins throwing kicks with his good leg. Brett puts an end to that with a rake to the eyes. We then see the figure 4 around the ring post and I really like how the commentators put over how dangerous this move is. Brett releases the hold but he doesn't stop the attack. Austin gets destroyed with a chair and this one should be all over. A sharpshooter should end the match but Austin keeps clawing himself back up, only to get put back down again by the excellence of execution. It feels like Brett's enjoying this. Austin gets a few short bursts of offense in but as soon as Brett goes for the injured body part, Austin goes right back down. The competitors bring it down to the mat and Brett removes Austin's knee brace as we go to split screen. We see Paul Bearer getting stretchered out of the arena on his way to hospital. With the protective knee brace now removed, Brett continues his attack and everything is amplified. Steve manages to even the odds though with a low blow. Stone Cold chokes Brett with his hands and then he chokes him again with wrist tape and the referee lets it all slide. Stone Cold misses another elbow drop and this allows Brett to go back on offense and once again it's all directed to the knee. 
Brett applies a figure four and Vince McMahon says Austin won't give up. Brett's maybe trying to get Austin to pass out again. The commentators also say Brett could have applied a sharpshooter here but he wants to punish Austin a little more. Austin turns the figure four around and Brett breaks the hold by reaching the ropes. The hitman then gets in a free shot when Austin argues with Earl Hebner. The hitman tries the figure four around the ring post again, but Austin kicks his way out, resulting in the two fighting again on the outside and in the audience. And it's clear that Austin wins when it comes to brawling around the ring. Stone Cold gets the better of Brett here. The two get back inside the ropes and Stone Cold keeps control until he tries a pile driver. Brett's work pays off when Austin's leg gives out and he falls to the side. Austin can't even stay on his feet after Brett performs an Irish whip. The hitman looks out to the crowd as if to say, I told you so, but he gets too confident and Austin hits a stun gun in the corner. He then tries a stunner but Brett holds onto the ropes, and it's Brett this time who hits a low blow to even the odds. We see a superplex from the hitman and Brett decides it's time to end it with a sharpshooter. Only Austin grabs his knee brace and the hitman gets clocked when Brett tries to apply his finishing move. Stone Cold puts the sharpshooter on Brett, bad things happen when Brett gets locked in that hold. And so Davey Boy Smith and Owen Hart run down to the ring, forcing Austin to release the hold and fight the Hart Foundation off. Brett ends up getting put in the sharpshooter again, but this time Davey Boy Smith gets in the ring and Austin takes a chair shot. This is enough to make Earl Hebner call for the bell, and Stone Cold Steve Austin wins via disqualification. Owen and Davey get sent away momentarily as Brett sees red on the outside. He grabs the ring bell, he goes to hit Austin, but Stone Cold manages to hit Brett in the knee with a chair. Austin then gives Hart a taste of his own medicine with a chair shot. We see another sharpshooter from Austin, and Brett's been injured it seems. Austin said he didn't care if he won or lost tonight, he just wanted to hurt Brett, and it looks like that mission has been accomplished. Brett gets pulled out of the ring by Owen and Davey, and the tag champs have to help Brett to the back. Stone Cold celebrates his victory, the crowd goes nuts for Austin, and our show fades to black as Stone Cold Steve Austin walks back up the entranceway. So, was Revenge of the Taker a good show? The undercard wasn't great, but the last two matches are worth a watch. I agree with the general sentiment that the main event doesn't feature the best Bret Hart vs Steve Austin pay per view match, it's the weakest of the three single matches, but it's still a good bout that unfortunately suffers from the DQ finish. Taker vs Foley was good, I'd forgotten how good it was and if you're one who enjoys physical Mick Foley matches, then you should definitely check it out, but everything else, uh, you could skip over the other stuff really. Maivia vs Vega was the worst match on the card for me with James vs Rockabilly being a very close second, I just can't forgive those nerve pinches after seeing the same thing on Raw. And the tag team match was just okay, you kinda expect a bit more from 4 seasoned veterans, but there's nothing to really complain about either in regards to the opener. As a whole show, it isn't great, but if you have an hour to spare and nothing else to watch, the two last matches could pass in some time. Don't sleep on Taker vs Mankind though. Thanks for watching this one guys, in regards to the next episode of Reliving the War, I honestly don't know right now at the time of this recording if I'll be able to put it together. Please check out the channel update video if you haven't done so already, if you want to know what's going on with wrestling bios, but I hope to see you again real soon with episode 80. Thanks for watching guys, and take care. A Cold Day in Hell was the WWF's 15th in your house show, taking place in the Richmond Coliseum on May 11th 1997 and attracting just under 9,500 fans. 143,000 domestic pay per view buys has been reported, which was an improvement over the previous in your house show Revenge of the Taker. The event was named a Cold Day in Hell due to Steve Austin getting a shot at the Undertaker's WWF title in the main event. 
Four other matches are featured on the main show, with the advertised Legion of Doom vs Owen and Bulldog match getting bumped to the post show dark match slot, and the free for all also includes a match Jesse James vs Rockabilly. Gotta praise the WWF for sorting out their in your house entrance way for this pay per view. Final 4 in Revenge of the Taker looked very cheap in comparison to a cold day in hell and the iconic house on the stage has been upgraded with a big screen on the window. The overall presentation of a cold day in hell is great. Right, let's get started by looking at the free for all show and then we'll check out the main pay per view. This is In Your House, A Cold Day in Hell. The WWF decided to air the full Ken Shamrock pre-taped interview that we saw on Raw. Ken takes on Vader tonight in his WWF pay-per-view debut. Shamrock then gets prepared for a backstage interview but he gets jumped by Mankind and Vader. The big man was clearly trying to get an early advantage. After airing a promo for the Austin 316 shirt and giving fans at home a chance to buy the record breaking piece of WWF merchandise, Jesse James comes to the ring for his match against Rockabilly. This is pretty amusing, Jesse tries to sing with my baby tonight but the music keeps getting sped up and slowed down. Now you'd think this was Rockabilly and the Honky Tonk Man's doing and maybe that's how the WWF could have played it off, but James looks genuinely surprised that it's happening and even Howard Finkel has a laugh at what's going on. I legit think this was a rib and James didn't know it was gonna happen. He laughs it off a few times and he even tells Vince McMahon that he isn't gonna try again after the second attempt. Vince! I'm giving it all she's got, Vince! I can't give it anymore! Got the music! This is probably the most interesting thing about the free for all bout. I'm not sure anyone wanted to see another Rockabilly vs Double J match. Todd Pettengill gives us an update on Ken Shamrock, and Todd says Ken is completely unaffected by the attack. Shamrock's in the zone and he's still 100%. Rockabilly ends up winning the match clean with a good looking running DDT. We then get a backstage interview with the Heart Foundation and Brett says they bought 5 front row tickets for the show. Jim Ross wants to know when the hearts are going to show up and take their seats and Brett says it's none of Jim's business. The LOD vs Owen and Davey match that was advertised on Raw is completely ignored here by the way. Sonny then comes out and this is just weird. A plant in the audience sprays Sonny with some silly string and then she says goodbye to the camera and walks back up the rampway. Maybe it wasn't the plant and Sonny was told to go back or maybe this was the plan all along but it's really odd and it makes no sense. Pretty sure this was a plant though, Sonny waits for the silly string and just her reactions make it look like she knew it was gonna happen. Farouk then comes out to cut a promo and he says Ahmed is very lucky tonight. Crush has the flu, Savio Vega sprained his ankle, and Farouk himself hasn't recovered from his shoulder injury. And because the nation is at a disadvantage tonight for the gauntlet match, Farouk demands that the gauntlet matches happen one after another, not spaced out through the show like Vince McMahon said on Raw. Ahmed Johnson appears on the screen and he agrees on one condition. Farouk has to be the first member of the nation to face Johnson in the gauntlet match. Steve Austin then cuts an in-ring promo. Austin says he gives The Undertaker all the credit in the world because the Phenom's the World Wrestling Federation champion. But if Steve Austin's going to hell tonight, you can bet your bottom dollar that The Undertaker's going with him. The Undertaker then appears on the big screen and the dead man says if Austin wants to go to hell, then there's no one better to bring him there than The Undertaker. Taker says it'll be a cold day in hell before Stone Cold wins the WWF Championship and the free for all ends with Steve Austin walking back up the entranceway. Our pay per view begins and our opening match features Flash Funk taking on Hunter Hearst Helmsley. Not a lot going into this one, the Funkettes had their locker room destroyed by China and they're afraid to show up at the pay per view. That's all we've really got here. Triple H gets offended by Funk's dancing but Flash comes back with a dropkick followed by an arm drag. We get a look at the Hart Foundation's empty seats in the front row as Flash Funk puts a little pressure on Hunter's left arm. Funk then cartwheels out of an Irish whip and he uses his leg to flip Triple H onto the mat. 
Hunter then gets sent to the outside and Flash Funk tries a clothesline from the middle rope and the landing looked awkward especially for Triple H. Take another look. Hunter then keeps the referee distracted as China attacks Flash Funk. We don't see the attack completely until the replay afterwards. And back in the ring, Hunter hits his signature face buster before rocking Funk with a running knee. Flash takes a few hard chops before Helmsley begins stomping away. Flash then gets forearmed by China while the referee was distracted, and Hunter lands a suplex before applying the first chin lock of the pay per view. Funk gets out, but another running knee sends Flash to the apron, and yeah, another running knee strike afterwards. I'll let this one slide seeing it's a signature Triple H move, plus it's a strike and not a hold. Triple H throws Flash back in the ring, but he ends up eating a boot when Funk counters a top rope move. Flash Funk then begins his comeback with a back body drop followed by a nice twisting leg drop. We see a flying crossbody from Funk, but he decides not to pin Hemsley afterwards. This was a mistake because he ends up smashing his little too cold Scorpio on the top rope and Hunter follows up with a suplex from the top that sees Flash land on his stomach. This looked good. And that's it over, the cameras focus on China as Triple H performs the pedigree. Flash takes the bump on his knee unfortunately, but it doesn't really matter. Triple H wins a pretty bland opening contest and China crotches Flash Funk on the top rope before leaving the ring. That's the problem with the WWF at the moment, the mid card isn't all that hot compared to WCW, but the World Wrestling Federation's main event scene has been excellent. They need to do a little more work in making lower matches mean a little more. Ken Shamrock appears on the big screen and JR wants to know how Ken's feeling. Shamrock says he isn't phased by the attack earlier, he's in his zone, the Green Hill Zone, and when the bell rings later on, it's knuckle up time. Sonic and knuckle up time. Our next match was supposed to feature Psycho Sid taking on Mankind, but seeing as Sid still hasn't returned to the World Wrestling Federation, the match has been changed. We now have Rocky Maivia vs Mankind. What a relationship these two would end up having in the future. Maivia cuts a promo before the match and when you watch this stuff back, you realise that Rocky was doing himself no favours when it came to the bad fan reactions he was receiving at the time. Rock says he learned a lot while on the top of the mountain but he learned a whole lot more on the way down, referring to his IC title loss to Owen Hart. And Rock says tonight isn't about his destiny, it's about his determination. Rocky Maivia was coming across as a little cocky, and not the funny kind of cocky we'd see from the Rock character later in the year, but more of an annoying and arrogant cocky little shit who actually thought he was good. Rocky Maivia wasn't good, he could do the moves and he could work matches for sure, but the wrestler Rocky Maivia as a complete package was sinking faster than the Titanic thanks to fans not wanting this kind of babyface, and it feels like Rocky Maivia is being forced onto fans rather than the wrestler receiving organic support. The match too with Mick Foley further highlights the problem, no one cares for Maivia at all, and fans actually get behind Mankind, the same man who melted The Undertaker's face just a month prior. It certainly isn't all Rocky's fault and we see what happens with Maivia when he's allowed to be himself. The guy is a natural entertainer to say the least. But this direction here that the WWF wanted Maivia to go in was just progressively getting worse. They tried to give Rock a bit of an edge here by having him get a little more vicious on the outside, we even see a rock bottom on the rampway, but it's met with silence. Rock goes for a flying crossbody, but Mankind rolls through and he applies the mandible claw. The crowd pops for Mick Foley, and you can skip this one and miss absolutely nothing important. If you want to see Maivia becoming more irrelevant, then maybe you'll get something out of this, but it isn't a good match, it isn't even a good Mankind match. So far, a cold day in hell has been a little disappointing. Ahmed Johnson tries to beat all three active members of the nation next in succession. If Ahmed can do it, the nation of domination must disband. 
This feud has been going on since the creation of the nation back in November and it really hasn't went anywhere. The Hart Foundation is now the WWF's top heel faction and this leaves the nation out in the cold a little but changes do get made very soon and these changes are for the better. Ahmed cuts a promo before the match where he says if Farouk is a man, he'll step into the ring first tonight. Ahmed did agree to wrestle the nation's members one after another if Farouk agreed to go first, but that doesn't happen. The nation have a meeting on the outside of the ring. Gorilla Monsoon interrupts it and he tells the nation to pick their first guy and the rest are sent to the entranceway. Crush starts the match off, so yeah, Ahmed agreed to fight the nation in succession for absolutely nothing. So Crush has the flu, Savio has a sprained ankle apparently, Farouk has a bad shoulder, Ahmed might have a chance here tonight. All in all, this thing right here is nearly 20 minutes long. Ahmed destroys Crush to start things off and the jailbird goes down after an axe kick. Johnson misses an elbow drop and this allows Crush to hit one of the weakest looking diving clotheslines you'll ever see. And the nation look on as Crush applies the fucking deadly nerve pinch, getting it in there before Savio Vega hits the ring. Crush then hits a suplex but Ahmed comes back with a rough looking cord buster. So far these two have failed to excite. Jim Ross has his comedy hat on tonight when he says Big Johnson is hard to handle as Crush applies a sleeper and fuck me this stays locked in forever. It just goes on and on and on. Man I hate being negative about wrestling, I love wrestling but it's hard to say anything good about this match so far. Ahmed fights out but he gets the old kitchen sink, Ahmed tries to steal a victory with a cradle but Crush kicks out and he performs a pile driver. He then tries to end it with a hard punch but Ahmed counters with a heel kick and Crush gets eliminated. Savio Vega with his sprained ankle is up next and he instantly takes a back body drop. Vega fights back and we see his corner spinning wheel kick and Savio makes it clear that there's nothing wrong with his ankle at all, cheeky little bastard. Savio takes his time attacking Ahmed while the big man's down and Johnson actually does look like he's pretty tired at this point. We even see this great moment here where Ahmed punches flies and the only thing that could make this worse is a Savio Vega nerve pinch. Ah there we go. Ahmed fights out and he goes for a middle rope, a diving headbutt? Just <laughs> What's going on? The more I watch this, the funnier it gets. Ahmed fights back with a few right hands and Savio summons his inner Shawn Michaels at SummerSlam 2005 with this glorious sell job. The absolute insanity of these past few minutes has actually made this match highly entertaining. The crush portion sucked but the unintentional comedy with Savio vs Ahmed is pure gold. Ahmed hits a back suplex and then he hits a power slam. Ahmed looks like he's gonna eat Salvio afterwards and Farouk is seen praying to God above that his inevitable match doesn't suck next. Johnson signals for the Pearl River plunge but Salvio decides to slide out of the ring. Ahmed then gets hit with a super kick and Vega grabs a steel chair and he gets himself disqualified after smacking Ahmed with the weapon. Vega then hits Johnson multiple times with the chair laying the table for Farouk it seems. And when the nation's leader comes to the ring to begin the third and final match of this gauntlet, he takes off his sling to show his separated shoulder is 100% healed. Farouk lays in the punches and kicks but Ahmed surprises everyone with a spine buster. Give Ahmed credit, the crowd loved this and you could see him feeding off the audience. We then see the Pearl River plunge but Johnson can't pin Farouk afterwards, which is weird, I mean all he has to do is sit up after the move, but Ahmed crumbles to the mat and Farouk takes advantage. Ahmed gets up and he goes right back down after a chop lock and Farouk ends up winning the match with the Dominator. The nation lives on. The Crush match was brutal, the Savio match was entertaining for all the wrong reasons, and the Farouk match was short but very fun thanks to the crowd getting behind Ahmed. Not something I'd watch again in a hurry but the whole gauntlet got better as it progressed. Ken Shamrock vs Vader is up next and this one really stems from Shamrock calling Vader a bully. Vader got himself locked up in Kuwait after going after a TV host who questioned the legitimacy of pro wrestling 
And this right here fed into the upcoming Cold Day in Hell match. Vader came across as legitimate. Speaking of legitimate, Ken Shamrock made a name for himself in the UFC, and the WWF had been building Ken up as a no-nonsense, tough-as-nails fighter who can't be stopped once he gets in his zone. Shamrock did compete already in a WWF ring, but that was against Lions Den student Vernon White in a special no-holds-barred exhibition match. This right here is Ken's WWF pay-per-view debut match, and he's got the monstrous Vader on the opposite side of the ring. Gonna get this out of the way now, Ken Shamrock works very stiff during this match. Shamrock had competed in shoot promotions such as Japan's UWF and its successor, PWFG, and Ken had also competed in Pancreas and of course the UFC. Ken was as legit as they come and he was used to hurting guys, but he also did have pro wrestling experience. Just seems like he maybe forgot how to tone it down a bit. It's fascinating that Vader, a guy who was also known for working stiff, ended up taking quite a beating here from Ken, but fair play to the big man, he done a little damage to Shamrock too, we'll get to that in a moment. Vader leaves this match with his nose broken in 4 places according to the man himself, but he had no hard feelings towards Ken, and he respected Ken and still called him a friend. What a fucking professional. This match too is contested under no holds barred rules, but it's got more pro wrestling than the Vernon White Raw match. No pinfalls in this one, submissions or knockout is the only way to win, and if someone gets knocked out they'll be given a standing 8 count if they can stand up. The match begins and Shamrock's fighting stance throws Vader off a bit, Ken brings Vader to the ropes and the ref calls for a break. Ken then lays in some stiff kicks and Vader throws a wild forearm. He misses Ken, but you can already tell that this isn't going to be a standard pro wrestling match. Vader gets in a body shot and he goes around Shamrock, but Ken counters with a wrist lock and he moves into an arm bar. Vader screams in pain as he makes his way to the ropes. Ken hits another kick to Vader's leg and the big man tries his signature corner forearms, but Shamrock quickly moves out of the way. Vader then forces a break from a waist lock by once again making it to the ropes. But the second waist lock results in Vader taking a ridiculously good looking belly to back suplex and the audience goes nuts. Extremely effective stuff here, this was the first pro wrestling move of the match. They took their time building up to it and this one move got one of the biggest pops of the night so far. Vader takes a timeout on the outside but he tries to rush at Shamrock back inside the ropes. Shamrock pulls off another belly to back suplex. From here, Ken begins laying in some stiff forearm shots, Vader ends up falling to the mat and he has to once again try to compose himself on the outside, though this time it's a bit more legit looking. Vader gets himself back in the ring and you can clearly see here that he's throwing safe working punches. Shamrock tries to roll through and apply an ankle lock but Vader again escapes the ring and the audience boos. Vader then gives the referee a message to pass to Ken, ease up. Vader says this twice and the ref passes the message, but Shamrock still lays in those kicks and Vader gets rocked with a back elbow to the temple. Ken then applies a front face lock, but Vader throws his opponent away and we see a big clothesline from Vader. The two men then trade arm bars and Vader ends up throwing Shamrock overhead while his arm was grapevined. Vader then performs a front suplex and Ken gets thrown out of the ring, absolutely insane. Vader then does some damage at the ring steps but Ken fights back with more forearms. The action gets back inside the ropes where Ken sails a corner Irish whip perfectly and Vader then tries to make Ken submit with a modified half crab but it doesn't end the match. We see a rear naked choke from Vader but Ken hangs in there. And Vader then goes for a Vader salt, but he misses his target, instead rocking his head into Ken's back. From here, Ken goes on the rampage with a ton of hard strikes followed by a power slam. And then we see the most famous moment of the match. Shamrock gets in a ton of stiff shots, and Vader gets really wobbly on his feet. The big man says, fuck this, and he clocks Ken hard with a forearm hook shot and Ken crashes to the mat. You can see Vader is gone here though, and the match quickly ends with Ken grabbing a leg and we see the ankle lock. Extremely entertaining stuff here, the unpredictability of Ken's offense and the amount of dangerous looking strikes makes this very compelling to watch, although it couldn't have been much fun for Vader. 
This right here is the match of the evening for me, and if the WWF wanted to bring in some legitimacy with the signing of Ken Shamrock, then it was definitely mission accomplished. Some may see this as Ken taking liberties and Ken maybe should have known better, but I still enjoyed this one a lot because it felt real. Stone Cold Steve Austin became number one contender after defeating Bret Hart at Revenge of the Taker via disqualification. Austin has not been feuding with The Undertaker at all in the run up to this match. Yes, both men crossed paths briefly and they got physical twice on WWF programming, but Austin's main adversaries right now are the members of the Hart Foundation. Neither Undertaker nor Stone Cold got the upper hand during their brief physical encounters on TV. Steve Austin even opted to go after Bret Hart when he had the choice between the dead man or the hitman, so it does feel like Austin getting this title shot here was simply due to his undeniable popularity at the time. This isn't a bad thing either by the way, it's great to visit a time when the WWF or WWE would actually capitalise on a wrestler's popularity by putting the superstar in question straight in the main event, but in terms of an Undertaker vs Steve Austin story in 1997, it was pretty much non-existent. These two would have an excellent rivalry in 1998, but we're gonna get to all that soon on reliving the war. Man, time flies in so fast when putting these videos together. Before the main event, Todd Pettengill asks Stone Cold what he thinks of those five empty front row seats, and Austin says he doesn't care. All it means is the Hart Foundation is closer to the action, and when Austin gets through with The Undertaker, he'll send the Hart Foundation back to Calgary in wheelchairs. Austin says that hell is about to freeze over, and that's the bottom line. Stone Cold and The Undertaker make their entrances with both guys getting good ovations. And here we go, the pay per view's namesake, A Cold Day in Hell. Austin and Undertaker square up to each other, but here comes the Hart Foundation. Brett, Owen, Pillman, Anvil, and Bulldog take their seats, and Austin attacks Undertaker while the dead man's back was turned. The Undertaker fights back while still wearing his coat and the WWF title, but Austin decides to slide out of the ring and attack Owen Hart. This time it's The Undertaker who takes advantage, and so clearly the Hart Foundation are going to be a hindrance to both the champion and the challenger. Taker then knocks Owen back over the guardrail and Davy Boy Smith gets whacked for good measure. The match gets back in the ring where Austin lays in a few right hands, but Taker replies with his jumping clothesline. The Hart Foundation watch on as Undertaker begins softening up Austin's arm, and we see old school. Austin kicks out at two afterwards. A poke to the eye brings Austin back into the match and we see a headlock takedown. The headlock stays applied for a good amount of time, but Austin and Taker break up the monotony by trying to pin each other. Austin goes for a shoulder block, but The Undertaker's completely unfazed. And Austin then brings Taker down with another headlock takeover. Mm, careful there, Mr. Rattlesnake. Bret Hart gives a shitty look to all the fans sitting close to him and a fan tries to take liberties with the foundation. Anvil screams to kick the fan out but we don't see exactly what happened. Austin tries to go up and over but he lands awkwardly, still he performs a chop lock and Stone Cold focuses his offence on the leg. Stone Cold is absolutely ferocious here. The Phenom breaks out of the attack by grabbing Austin by the throat and throwing him in the corner, but Steve rolls out of the ring and Taker takes some punishment at the ring post. Austin takes the time to flip off Brian Pillman, and Austin continues attacking the leg inside the ropes. Undertaker tries a tombstone, but Stone Cold counters and he applies an STF. Austin attacks Undertaker while the dead man's draped over the apron, but when the action gets back inside the ropes, The Undertaker shoves his boot right up Austin's ass and Stone Cold falls out of the ring. The Undertaker goes to the outside and Stone Cold gets thrown into the ring steps. Taker then gives Austin a taste of his own medicine by targeting the leg, but Austin breaks out of a submission attempt with a series of right hands. The back and forth continues with Taker kicking Austin's leg and we see a half Boston Crab. And Stone Cold manages to dodge a big boot, and once again, Austin goes for Undertaker's left wheel. Both guys continue to target the same body part, both guys are pretty evenly matched, and both guys are getting the same crowd reactions. Austin hits a suplex, and Undertaker replies with a Booker T style heel kick, you don't see that too often from the dead man. Taker goes for old school again, but Austin counters, and the dead man's little creature of the night gets smashed. 
Still, he counters a superplex, but he misses an elbow drop. Taker still manages to lock in a sleeper, and Austin counters with a jawbreaker. We get a great little moment when Austin hits a low blow and Art Hebner warns Stone Cold. Austin waits until Hebner turns his back before flipping him off, but Stone Cold feels some instant karma when Taker hits a low blow of his own. Hebner then flips off Austin when Stone Cold complains. This was good. The match comes to an end with The Undertaker hitting the choke slam. Austin manages to roll to the apron and he drops the dead man's neck across the top rope. We see the Stone Cold Stunner. Austin has the match won, but Brian Pullman begins ringing the bell and the referee stops his count. Look at Howard Finkel here. <laughs> Poor guy. The match isn't over. Austin throws right hands after The Undertaker sits up, but Taker scoops up Austin for a tombstone. Austin counters it and Taker finds himself in position to take his own finisher, but another counter leads to The Undertaker hitting an insane looking tombstone pile driver, and the match is over. The Undertaker wins the Cold Day in Hell main event. The Hart Foundation hit the ring and they attack The Undertaker. Austin realizes that Bret Hart is all alone, still sitting in his wheelchair, and the hitman ends up getting tipped over while this Bret Hart fan looks on as if to say, how fucking dare you attack my hero? Austin takes a crutch, he helps The Undertaker clear out the ring, but Austin decides to hit The Undertaker with a stone cold stunner as the show comes to an end. Austin follows the Hart Foundation back up the entranceway, and that's the end of our show. In Your House A Cold Day In Hell follows the trend of WWF pay-per-views starting off poorly but ending pretty well, kinda the reverse of WCW pay-per-views. The first two matches aren't worth your time, there's some entertainment to be had in the second half of the gauntlet match, Shamrock vs Vader is a very intriguing match when you learn about the backstory, and the main event, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think the match flowed all that well. There was nothing fundamentally wrong with Austin vs Undertaker, but we've seen both guys have much better matches already in 1997. It's definitely a step in the right direction though for Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's not a bad match at all, but it isn't must see either. Absolutely nothing has changed coming out of a cold day in hell, and everyone is practically in the same position as before. And without any big show stealing matches, you can comfortably skip over this event and you wouldn't miss out on anything. Still, it was fun reviewing another 1997 WWF pay per view. WWF Raw is War has been a better show recently when compared to Nitro, so let's see if the World Wrestling Federation's good fortunes continue next week on Reliving the War. And thank you very much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it. Take care. King of the Ring 1997 took place on June 8th inside the Providence Civic Center in Providence, Rhode Island. Just over 13,000 fans attended the event with 140,000 domestic pay-per-view buys being reported. This was down slightly from last month's Cold Day in Hell show. The King of the Ring pay-per-view went through some big changes, many would say these changes were for the worse. Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels was originally going to take place along with a Steve Austin vs Brian Pillman match, but rising backstage tensions between Michaels and Hart along with Bret still not being 100% healed from knee surgery meant Shawn Michaels would instead face Steve Austin at the show. It's a shame too, the two cancelled matches would have been extremely interesting to see. Those rising tensions between Bret and Sean would lead to a real backstage fight the night after King of the Ring. And rather than discuss this fight in today's video or on Reliving the War next week, I'm going to put together a separate video that takes a look at the infamous fight that Bret and Sean had in Hartford, Connecticut. And that video will get uploaded before Reliving the War episode 87. I just think it would be best to keep that whole thing separate from the main series because it'll be quite a long video that looks into every eyewitness account that we have online. But let's get started, this is King of the Ring 1997. The opening video for King of the Ring is all about tonight being a night of firsts. The first time WWF Tag Team Champions have had a pay per view match against each other, we also may see an African American win the WWF Championship for the first time when Farouk faces The Undertaker, and whoever wins tonight's tournament will also be crowned King of the Ring for the first time ever. 
Our opening match is one of the semi-finals, Ahmed Johnson vs Triple H, or Ahmad Johnson as the case may be. It looks like the WWF have given up on the king's throne and the coronation ceremony held at the entrance way. Instead, the crown sits beside the timekeeper and it also looks like the winner's going to get a can of coke. A winner is you. So here's the two semi-final matches we're going to see tonight. Helmsley vs Ahmed already happened in the quarterfinals and Triple H got disqualified. It was then announced that the match was actually a no DQ match and Hunter threatened legal action against the WWE, all in storyline of course. And so Triple H was allowed to take Psycho Sid's place in the tournament and have another shot. He finds himself wrestling Ahmed again in the semi-finals. Johnson overpowers Hunter after the initial lockup. Hunter goes down again after a shoulder block and Ahmed performs the Helmsley pose, the ultimate form of disrespect. Ahmed then wants a test of strength and you'd think he would know better by now. Hunter kicks Ahmed in the gut but his knife edge chop afterwards just pisses Ahmed off. Johnson performs a military press slam and Hunter has to take a break on the outside. The match resumes with Hunter poking Ahmed in the eye but Ahmed fires back with a clothesline. A missed elbow drop gives Hunter a chance to send Johnson out of the ring and Ahmed then gets thrown into the ring steps. Back inside, Hunter lands a top rope forearm and he follows up with a few rights but Johnson absorbs the shots. It looks like there's a failure to communicate during the next spot but Johnson makes up for it with an axe kick to the back followed by a back body drop. Ahmed then hits a spine buster, he signals for the Pearl River plunge but China distracts Ahmed from the apron and Hunter hits a running knee. We then see the pedigree and Triple H advances to the King of the Ring finals. The crowd were behind Ahmed Johnson tonight but he didn't have a great match at all. It also felt like the WWF rushed through this one but seeing as the winner has to wrestle twice then it's to be expected. The second semi-final match starts immediately after the first. We have Mankind vs Jerry Lawler. The WWF had been airing a series of Mankind interviews with Jim Ross and these were put together really well. The WWF wanted to turn Foley into a sympathetic babyface and Foley's story of growing up and getting into the wrestling business was enough to make fans cheer for Mankind. Out of all the semi-finalists in tonight's tournament, Mankind definitely had the most character development, which leads us to believe that Foley's probably going to win the King of the Ring tonight. Mankind pulled Lawler away from the announce desk during the Mankind vs Savio Vega quarterfinal match because Jerry was talking shit about Foley on commentary. And that's the only real story we have in regards to Mankind vs Lawler. The real story is the babyface turn of Mrs Foley's baby boy. Mankind cuts a promo before the match where he says tonight has the potential to be the biggest night of his career, yet Paul Bear isn't beside him because Uncle Paul has better things to do. Mankind says Paul's absence won't stop him from becoming king. He then asks fans what kind of king should he be if he wins the tournament. Mankind says Lawler wears robes but the emperor doesn't wear any clothes and the only thing worse than Jerry Lawler walking around naked would be Mick Foley walking around with no clothes on. He follows this up with a cactus jack bang bang and this gets a round of applause. King was supposed to get interviewed by Todd Pettengill but he takes the mic and he rips in the fans during his entrance. Jerry said when Foley's mum gave birth to Mick, she took a look at his face and a look at his rear end and then she said, oh Siamese twins. Your standard Jerry Lawler jokes at the King of the Ring folks. Mick attacks Jerry on the outside and it's all mankind when the match gets inside the ropes but it doesn't take long for Lawler to start cheating. Foley gets thrown out of the ring after taking a few shots with whatever foreign object Lawler pulled from his tights and Lawler continues the attack on the outside, delivering more blows to the head and even showing his own sadistic side by biting Foley's forehead. Back inside the ring, Jerry continues to use the foreign object to stay in control. The match goes to the outside again where Foley takes some serious bumps at the guardrail and you gotta question whether a semi-final King of the Ring match with Jerry Lawler in 1997 is really worth this kind of pain. Even a pile driver on the outside fails to get a reaction. Lawler hits a dropkick while Foley stood on the apron that looked pretty good and back inside the ring Foley takes another pile driver. Foley kicks out at 2 so Lawler goes back to using his concealed weapon on Mick. This hasn't been good at all. A highlight though is Jim Ross saying at least the WWF don't have to call their weapons international objects. 
Mick makes a brief comeback with a back body drop. Lawler comes back with his second rope fist drop. Lawler goes for the pile driver one more time, but Foley counters and we see the mandible claw. Foley wins and yeah, skip this one. It dragged on and the crowd didn't get into it at all. Brian Pillman's wearing an Austin 316 shirt, though the 316 has been scratched out, and we have June 9th, 1997 there instead. Pillman faces Austin tomorrow night on Raw, and I guess he wanted to give people a little reminder. Brian says he's here tonight to support the Hart family, and he's here to see Shawn Michaels violate Steve Austin. Pillman plans on finishing the job tomorrow night if there's anything left of Stone Cold. Steve appears behind Pillman and Brian's completely unaware. Absolute gold here from Austin, who ducks out of camera shot only to re-emerge and begin destroying Pillman. Brian ends up getting wrecked here and he also gets his head flushed down the toilet. I really hate to say it, but this has been the biggest highlight of King of the Rings so far. Austin says Brian Pillman sucks, he always has and he always will. We then had a match that wasn't advertised, Goldust vs Crush. Like Mankind, the WWF had aired a sit down interview with Goldust in an effort to humanise the character a little more, but he also went on a losing streak while these videos aired on Raw. He did win his previous Raw match that secures him a European title match tomorrow night, and he also defeated Crush in this match right here. D'Lo and Clarence Mason tried to get a little friendly with Marlena, but Goldust came to her rescue, and Goldust ended up winning the match with a DDT. An absolute throwaway bout here that I think was only added due to the two cancel matches turning into one match later on. We go backstage where the Legion of Doom and Psycho Sid get interviewed by Doc Hendricks. These three are going to take on Bulldog Owen and Jim Neidhart later tonight and check out Psycho Sid lip syncing the Hawks promo. Revenge is a dish best served cold and by diddly do squat. <laughs> oh fuck. Watch closely again when Animal asks Sid if he's down with the LOD tonight. Road Warriors, the one you gotta worry about is you! Are you gonna be there for- <laughs> It's subtle, but it's still there. Sid says Hawk and Animal don't need to worry about Sid. He's the master and ruler of the world. The only people who should worry tonight are the Heart Foundation. Tonight is gonna be their worst nightmare. Todd Pettengill interviews the Foundation. Davey says he and Owen already defeated LOD at In Your House and the same will happen tonight. Owen says the Legion of Doom's pretty makeup and Halloween costumes won't be enough to beat the Heart Foundation tonight. And The Anvil says if Sid thinks he's crazy, well Sid ain't seen nothing yet. Jim Neidhart guys, absolutely unhinged. The six man tags up next, the Hart Foundation vs LOD and Sid, let's see if we can get this pay per view on track a little. Animal and Owen start the match off and the road warrior just lifts Owen up and throws him right on his back. Owen takes a body slam next but he manages to dodge an elbow and uh, yeah that's new. Animal throws Owen in the air and the king of hearts crashes hard, Hart then finds himself in the opposing corner after a slingshot and things go from bad to worse when Animal hits a power slam. No, actually, it gets even worse for Owen. Here comes Psycho Sid tagging in and performing a double axe handle. Not good. Sid wants a test of strength and Owen decides to let our hero Davy Boy Smith do the honours. The Bulldog shows no fear, he locks hands with the former WWF champion and he kicks him in the midsection to get an unfair advantage. Davey impresses with a vertical suplex on the big man, but Sid no sells it and he takes out all three Heart Foundation members involved in this match. Damn it. Nightheart and Hawk then do a little work and they aren't in the mood for selling tonight. Hawk ends up getting the advantage and he goes to the top rope, and the anvil goes down after a diving clothesline. LOD and Sid then make quick tags and they keep Jim in their corner, getting in some cheap shots when the ref turns his back. Anvil takes a shoulder block and a drop kick from Hawk before tagging in Davey again. Hawk decides to no sell a pile driver before flooring Bulldog with a clothesline. These road warriors are hard to damage. Owen shows Davey how it's done by hitting a spinning wheel kick on Animal and the anvil then smacks Animal across the back with a chair. Owen then launches Jim into the ring like a big pink and black torpedo but Animal's able to land a sunset flip. Bulldog makes sure that Earl Hebner doesn't see the pin attempt. Owen hits a missile dropkick and then we get some fundamental heel tag team work with Animal getting kept in the enemy's corner. The crowd don't care at all, they're absolutely silent here and all the audience have really done is chant for Psycho Sid. Eventually, Animal tags out, Hawk does a little more work, but then when Sid comes back in, the audience finally gets a little noisy. 
He takes everyone out with clotheslines and legal man Owen gets thrown out of the ring. Davy Boy takes a choke slam. Sid sets him up for a power bomb, but Owen performs a diving sunset flip and uh, so close but so far. The Hart Foundation score the win at King of the Ring. In my opinion, the best match of the night so far, but that isn't saying much either. This is slowly turning into another WWF 1997 pay-per-view that honestly doesn't deliver. Raw has been excellent, WCW Nitro has been slipping, but in saying that, WCW have definitely been the king of pay-per-view so far in 97, as we reach the halfway point of the year. Mankind says Hunter Hearst Helmsley will have to drive a train in the King of the Ring finals and Triple H will have to run Foley over because he's not going down for anyone. Foley says there's a line from a movie that resonates with him tonight. I just can't wait to be king. Seems like the whole WWF locker room are watching The Lion King and not just Bret Hart. The King of the Ring finals is up next and Mankind has injured his neck it seems. Triple H looks absolutely fine during his entrance whereas Foley looks like he's seen better days. Still, the smart money would say Mankind was gonna win this thing. Mankind's top wrist lock gets broken up by Hemsley pulling on Foley's hair. Hunter does the same thing again, only this time he cranks Mankind's neck a little too. JR says that Mankind must be thinking this would be a great night for dude love as Foley hits a back elbow. Mankind then lays in the kicks and he goes for Helmsley's biggest target, the nose. Mick goes for a mandible claw afterwards, but Triple H saves himself by rolling out of the ring. The commentators talk about Foley's sit-down interview on Raw and how fans have found respect for Mick as Hunter makes his way back inside the ropes. Hunter then gets a little more physical as he starts laying the kicks into Foley. The match spills to the outside where Mankind momentarily gets the upper hand by using the guardrails to his advantage. China watches on as even JR and Vince say Mankind is the favourite to win this bout. Hunter drops Mankind on the top turnbuckle when Mick goes for some corner punches. Helmsley then focuses his attacks on Foley's neck with a swinging neckbreaker, a choke on the ropes and a forearm strike from the apron. Mick tries to gain his advantage back but a clothesline from Hunter knocks Mick down and Hunter turns up the violence a little with more attacks in the corner. Foley crawls away to the opposite side of the ring but China's right there to greet him with a forearm. Still, Mick hits a low blow on Hunter behind the referee's back. Mick has a great chance to win this thing right here but he gets his neck caught in the middle and top rope. There's an audible gasp in the arena as Mick begins to panic and his mask falls off when trying to escape. Helmsley doesn't let up, Foley gets hit with a baseball slide and he gets rammed into the ring steps. And back in the ring, Triple H drops the Harley Race knee twice and he tries to twist Foley's neck multiple times. This match has already been better than both semi-final encounters. Mick hits Hunter with two stun guns but Hunter counters the third with a DDT. Not sure if that was the original intention but they get away with it. Foley's unfazed as he hits his corner running knee strike and Hunter takes the flare bump, setting himself up in the tree of woe afterwards which allows Mick to drop an elbow. On the outside, Hunter takes a back body drop on the concrete floor before Mick performs his classic elbow drop from the apron to the outside. That really should have been the match over. Foley hits the double arm DDT back in the ring, but China distracts the referee and our match continues on. China once again saves Hunter when Helmsley finds himself in the mandible claw, but Mankind locks it in again while Hunter sits on the top rope. A poke to the eye keeps Mankind away, but Mick comes back with a big clothesline that sends both men out of the ring. Mick then tries an apron elbow drop, but he takes a nasty bump when Hunter dodges the attack. The referee gets distracted by China, and this gives Hunter a chance to bring Mankind to the announce table, and we see the pedigree. The table caves in after the move, and it's now Foley who's in a lot of danger. China grabs the king's scepter and it gets smashed over Foley's back. Another nasty bump takes place when Hunter knocks Mick off the apron onto a cameraman and Hunter thinks he has it in the bag but Foley kicks out at two. Triple H gets pissed off, he nails the pedigree and that's it over. Hunter Hearst Helmsley becomes the king of the ring. At the time I thought this was unexpected but when you think about it, it actually makes sense. Foley was already on the path to bigger and better things thanks to the babyface turn and this loss right here along with what happens afterwards would give Foley even more sympathy from fans. Hunter was also due to win this tournament last year but he got punished for the curtain call stuff. 
Just thought that was worth mentioning. Hunter demands that Todd Pettengill brings him his crown and can of coke for being a top boy. China puts on Hunter's robe and the King of the Ring decides to beat his opponent up even more with the King's crown. Hunter leaves the ring while Mankind has to crawl to the back, again adding to the sympathy. A fairly good King of the Ring final, not the best, but still good enough. This would start a long Triple H vs Mick Foley rivalry that would greatly benefit both guys. Those who watch Reliving the War would know that Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels have had a difficult relationship these past few months, to say the least. Going over absolutely everything right now would take a good 20 or 30 minutes alone, and I plan on summarizing everything in the next video that gets uploaded to the channel, but all we need to know right now for this King of the Ring review is that the planned Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels King of the Ring match was cancelled, and Shawn will now face Steve Austin. Backstage issues, including the Sunny Days comment, and Brett still not being at 100% are reasons cited for the match change. Again, check out my next video where I'll tell the whole story of Brett vs Sean so far, along with the backstage fight stuff. I think it will supplement the Reliving the War series quite well as we move towards Brett's final months in the WWF. Brett and the Hart Foundation cut a promo at King of the Ring where Brett says he's almost ready to make his comeback. No longer will he be an easy target, a guy stuck in a wheelchair or on crutches. Brett surrounded himself with the absolute best that the WWF has to offer, and it's now time for some retribution. On July 6th, there's going to be a Canadian stampede. Brett and the Hart Foundation issue a challenge to any five wrestlers in the World Wrestling Federation. Anyone who has the jam, anyone who has the balls to cross the border and step into Calgary are welcome to do so. But they'll face the Hart Foundation in the Saddle Dome at In Your Haze. In the Calgary Saddle Dome at the In Your Haze, In Your House pay per view. Brett then goes to the commentary table to call the HBK vs. Austin match but Jerry Briscoe and officials want Brett to leave. Brent Pillman fights the officials off with his deadly desk lamp, while Brett says he's getting his freedom of speech taken away from him. There's an argument at the commentary table before the hearts end up leaving. The hitman won't be calling the next match after all, but the challenge has been laid down and we know when Brett's making his comeback. Steve Austin says that being a tag team champion brings him more money and he doesn't necessarily want to cripple his tag team partner in this next matchup, but if Sean forces Austin to turn up the violence then Stone Cold says he'll do it. Austin makes his way to Gorilla where he bumps into the Hart Foundation, Brett's clan are still getting held back by security, and Stone Cold then gets a great ovation on his way down to the ring. Shawn Michaels cuts a weird promo. He says the Hart Foundation want himself and Austin to tear each other apart, and because of this fact, Shawn doesn't want to hurt Austin too badly. Shawn says that everyone's expecting a classic tonight and he doesn't know if that'll happen. He's wrestling his tag team partner tonight, and he says he doesn't have the answer before walking off. Shawn then makes his entrance and, uh, yeah, he, he looks like he can't be bothered. Maybe he's just playing it cool, but Sean seems kinda off here, doesn't he? God, if I didn't know any better, I'd say he might have had a few Scooby Snacks before coming to the ring, but Sean wouldn't do that, he's a good boy. Now, at the start of this match, Sean goes from cocky dickbag who probably indulged in some Colombian bacon soda, to an absolute hero. A young Paralympian tries to jump in the ring and attack Stone Cold. The match completely stops and the wrestlers wait to see what happens, but security end up grabbing the kid by the arms and legs. The kid's actually trying to fight security off. Sean goes to the outside and he tries to calm the kid down. Stone Cold gets the order to go after Sean and continue the bout, but the kid still resists against security. Sean stops the match, he goes out, he gives the kid a hug, and he brings him back up the rampway where the kid's mum's able to join him. This is probably the most wholesome thing I've ever seen during a live pay-per-view, and there's a certain irony that it's HBK who does this. Everyone has him down as an asshole, but fair play to Sean here. The crowd applauds, Austin holds the ropes open for HBK to get back in the ring, HBK doesn't accept, and the match resumes. The action was brief in the ring while all this was happening by the way. Austin flipped off Sean after a shoulder block and HBK done the same after a punch to the mouth. So the two fight over wrist control until Michaels brings Austin down with a headlock takeover. 
Sean keeps it locked in after performing another headlock takeover, this time from the top rope, and that looked very smooth. The two get to their feet, Sean goes down after a back elbow, and Stone Cold performs the HBK pose as the fans go nuts. Brilliant. HBK comes back with a little chin lock action, the first of the evening. He moves into a side headlock, and we see a long drop down leapfrog sequence that made me feel tired just watching it. It ends with Austin hitting an inverted atomic drop and Michaels gets clotheslined out of the ring. Sean then completely oversells it by… <laughs> by doing this. Sean counters an apron suplex, but Austin kicks out of the follow-up pin attempt. Sean performs a drop to a hold in an armbar afterwards. Austin then thinks about walking away from the match after taking a short walk up the entranceway, but he comes back for a test of strength. HBK agrees. In DTA, you silly bastard, the crowd pops when Austin lays in the kicks. Stone Cold gets a taste of his own medicine when Sean gets to his feet, and Stone Cold ends up taking a back body drop. Sean misses an elbow drop and Austin knocks down a cameraman when he hits the ropes. Stone Cold hits the Luthez press and there's a ton of impact here. The two then go through a few pin attempts, giving us a great example of just how versatile Steve Austin was back then. And Sean ends up getting thrown to the outside and he has real problems trying to get back in the ring. Stone Cold does everything to keep HBK away, including launching Sean into the guardrail. Steve poses to the audience while Sean's out cold. Steve then decides to expose the floor around the ring. Sean tries to fight Austin off, but HBK gets thrown into the ring steps and he takes a bump on the floor. This looked pretty good. Sean misses his flying forearm back inside the ring and he takes another tumble to the outside. He tries to steal a victory with a small package, but Austin makes him pay with a clothesline afterwards. A second rope elbow drop from Steve Austin gets followed up with a chin lock. The overall pace of this match has been excellent. They are going to rest holds only when necessary it seems, and it works within the context of the bout. Tim White gets fed up with Austin using the bottom rope during the hold, and HBK takes advantage. Austin gets launched out of the ring, and Jim Ross brings up the fact that there's high pitched cheering for Shawn Michaels, mixed with low bass boos for Shawn Michaels. It's a very mixed crowd and a very mixed reaction. Shawn builds momentum and we see the flying forearm, we see a back body drop. And then Austin dodges a corner attack and Sean smacks the ring post. Stone Cold decides to expose Sean's backside and Sean continues to wrestle with his tights pulled down. He hits a crossbody and he tries to pin Stone Cold, but Austin kicks out and he hits another clothesline. Tim White gets taken out in the corner, we have no referee, Austin blocks a super kick and we see the Stone Cold stunner. There's no one to count the pinfall, so Austin grabs Tim White and our referee takes a stunner too. Sean hits Austin with sweet chin music, but it's the same problem. No one there to count the pinfall. Mike Kyoto runs down, but he checks on Tim White instead of counting the cover. So Sean decides to hit Kyoto with a super kick. He then covers Austin. White makes the count, but Austin kicks out at two. Ert Hebner then runs down and he disqualifies both guys for attacking referees. It's a double DQ and it's a real bad way to end what was a very hard fought match. It looked like these two were trying to see who could outpace the other and who would get blown up quicker. And while Sean might be considered more athletic, Austin done more than hang in there with the heartbreak kid. A good underrated match in my opinion that maybe deservedly gets a bad rep thanks to the finish. In many ways though, this one could be considered better than their Wrestlemania match next year. The tag champs try to take cheap shots at each other but they decide to leave the ring together. They remain on high alert of each other, but they walk back up the ramp as we get ready for our main event. On the Raw following a cold day in hell, it was announced that Farouk would get a shot at the WWF Championship at King of the Ring. Farouk wanted to become the first African American WWF Heavyweight Champion, and he brought up the fact that the company had failed to give black wrestlers a chance in the past. Farouk even cut interviews with Vince McMahon where he would call out the chairman for the lack of opportunity presented to African American superstars. The leader of the nation wanted to make history tonight and set a new standard, but his very own faction were also having problems with Crush and Savio Vega failing to get along recently. As for The Undertaker, the WWF Champion, he's been forced to realign himself with Paul Bearer. Paul had blackmailed the Phenom, threatening to reveal a secret about The Undertaker's past that The Undertaker said himself 
would hurt too many people. So the dead man is now in a forced relationship with his former manager, much to his dismay. In terms of Farouk and The Undertaker crossing paths, yeah, it did happen, but it was all kept very basic and very standard. They had their own things going on with the nation falling apart, Farouk wanting to become the first black WWF champion, and The Undertaker having problems with Paul Bearer and whatever this secret was. Many would see this as an odd main event and many would see Farouk in 1997 as more of a mid-card player in the World Wrestling Federation, but I think it's a good change of pace and it's good to see someone else get a chance in the main event. Farouk says history will be made tonight, we're looking at the first black champion in WWF history. He delivers an outstanding line when he says, Undertaker, don't worry about Paul Bearer's blackmail, you worry about this blackmail. Fantastic. Farouk makes his way to the ring with the nation while The Undertaker gets interviewed by Doc Hendricks. Doc wants to know how this secret has changed Taker's mental preparation for tonight, and Paul Bearer doesn't let The Undertaker speak. Paul says Undertaker has to remember that the secret hangs over his head. Paul's the one in control here and the Undertaker must do whatever Bearer says. The WWF Champion just walks away as Paul continues his rant. Taker makes his entrance, the crowd loves the dead man. Paul wants to take the Undertaker's coat but Undertaker refuses. He also refuses to give Paul the WWF belt and all this gives Farouk a chance to strike early. Farouk's advantage doesn't last long. Taker throws the challenger into the corner and he lays in the strikes, and over at the other corner Farouk goes down after a clothesline. A big boot and an uppercut from the Undertaker gets followed up with a pin attempt. Farouk kicks out and Paul tells Taker to hook the leg, Bearer is now telling the WWF Champion how to wrestle. Farouk hits a nice power slam on the dead man but Taker sits up afterwards. He makes his way towards the ropes where Savio and Crush launch an attack, but Farouk can't keep the advantage afterwards, Taker hits another big boot in the corner. We think Taker's gonna hit old school but he throws himself on top of the nation who were stood on the outside. The dead man wipes out the faction and Farouk ends up getting his neck snapped over the top rope. Taker then goes for the proper old school but Delo interferes, leading to Taker getting his little creature of the night smashed on the top rope. Farouk with a suplex, Taker with a clothesline, and more creature of the night abuse follows when Farouk hits a low blow. Farouk distracts Art Hebner and the nation attack Taker again. McMahon and JR talk about the shit officiating tonight at the King of the Ring. The match then goes to the outside and Farouk takes a great looking bump while holding the steps. They go back in the ring where Undertaker lands a few strikes, but then we see a pile driver from Farouk that also looked good. Chinlock from Farouk, this one stays in for quite some time. Farouk uses the ropes for leverage but it ends up getting broke with a jawbreaker from the dead man. Farouk gets the knees up when the chomp goes for a splash and then Farouk tries to end it with a dominator but it gets countered with a backdrop. Farouk gets a boot up in the corner but his aerial attack gets countered with a power slam. Undertaker then misses his jumping clothesline. And it's at this point where Crush pushes Clarence Mason and the nation begin fighting among themselves, completely out of nowhere. Farouk tries to make the nation fall in line but this distraction actually costs him the match. The Undertaker hits the tombstone and it's all over. Taker wins the King of the Ring main event. This one didn't really build up to its ending, there was nothing wrong with what happened in the ring and there were some good looking spots but it just didn't flow too well. Undertaker hits chokeslams on Savio and Crush, and then Paul Bearer forces the dead man to hit Farouk with not one, not two, but three chokeslams. Oddly enough, the decimation of Farouk leads to Ahmed Johnson coming out and questioning the Undertaker. Ahmed tells the champ to stop listening to Paul Bearer, and then Ahmed hits the Pearl River Plunge on the dead man. Ahmed leaves, the Undertaker sits up, and the Phenom goes to attack Paul Bearer but Paul gets out of the ring and our show comes to an end. This one kinda felt like an extended episode of Raw's War. The King of the Ring final was pretty good, Michaels vs Austin was good but it had a bad finish, and I really wanted to like Farouk vs Undertaker all these years later but it doesn't really go anywhere, it's not bad but it's not really good either. The show does get progressively better from the King of the Ring final onwards, but as mentioned earlier, the WWF's weekly Monday night show was proving to be more entertaining than their pay-per-view shows. 
Fortunately, that changes next month when the WWF presents Canadian Stampede, one of the best pay-per-views of the era and a show that's still very highly ranked to this day. Also, I've already covered that show, so if you don't mind skipping ahead in our Reliving the War timeline, you can watch the Canadian Stampede review right now. I won't be remaking it or anything like that because every match is covered, so yeah, check it out if you don't want to hang around. King of the Ring 1997 doesn't come recommended though. Slamboree 97 completely blew it out of the water, but as mentioned, we do have better WWF pay per views to look forward to from this point onwards. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you all next Thursday for Reliving the War episode 87. Take care. In Your House Canadian Stampede is considered one of the very best, if not the best, pro wrestling show of 1997. It's quite a bold statement to make, saying we also had the likes of Halloween Havoc 97, Starcade 97, In Your House Bad Blood, and the debut of ECW on pay-per-view with Barely Legal followed by Hardcore Heaven 97. How could this In Your House show, the last In Your House event to be only 2 hours long and feature only 4 matches, possibly receive the accolades that it does? Well, apart from the in-ring action being excellent from start to end, Canadian Stampede has one of the most unique atmospheres you'll ever see at a WWF pay-per-view. The location and venue played into the WWF's biggest storyline of the year, and so we end up with a show that's like nothing we'd ever seen before. When bad guys Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation returned to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, they were given a hero's welcome, the complete opposite crowd response that the Hearts had been getting back in the United States. Along with the insanely hot crowd, Canadian Stampede featured some of the best in-ring work the WWF had produced all year, so today I want to cover every match along with the critically acclaimed 10-man tag main event. In Your House Canadian Stampede was held in Calgary, Alberta, Canada on July 6th, 1997 in the Calgary Saddle Dome. Canadian Stampede was the fourth WWF pay-per-view held in Canada. Canadian Stampede, however, was a little more interesting because the event was held in Calgary, Alberta, home of the Hart family. Stu Hart had been promoting wrestling in Alberta going all the way back to the 1940s with Klondike Wrestling, a promotion that would change its name over time to Big Time Wrestling, Wildcat Cat Wrestling, and finally in August of 1967, Stu Hart's promotion would get renamed to Stampede Wrestling. The WWF named their 16th In Your House show Canadian Stampede to pay tribute to Stu Hart's wrestling promotion, a true cornerstone of the Canadian wrestling scene, before Vince McMahon swooped in and Stu Hart sold the territory. And also, the event was named after the annual Calgary Stampede Rodeo and Exhibition that kicks off on the first Friday of July every year. The fans who attended Canadian Stampede on July 6th, 1997 were, of course, loyal fans of the Hart family, and the fans would get treated to some great wrestling before the Hart's homecoming took place in the main event. Before continuing on, I'll just mention that there was actually 5 matches held on the night of Canadian Stampede, but only 4 made it to pay per view. In the free for all, the Godwins defeated the new Blackjacks, Bradshaw and Barry Windham in around 5 minutes or so. Thankfully, it isn't a match you need to see and it's probably a good thing that it was left off the card. The opening video for Canadian Stampede then does a great job in showing us how the landscape of the WWF had been changing. The video is all about grey areas, how there's no black and white in the World Wrestling Federation anymore, how there's no good guys and how there's no bad guys. It's a good opener, it's a little more creative than the usual videos the WWF would produce at the time to open up their shows. After we see Jim Ross, Vince McMahon and Jerry Lawler wearing a comically oversized hat, the show starts off with a rematch from the 1997 King of the Ring finals. It's Mankind vs King of the Ring winner Hunter Hearst Helmsley. 
The Mankind vs Triple H King of the Ring finals let us see a different side to Triple H, a much more urgent and rather violent side to the Greenwich Blue Blood that would serve him well as Hemsley morphed into the game in the years that followed. Hunter, however, wouldn't have won the King of the Ring if it wasn't for China. The ninth wonder of the world hit Mankind with the King of the Ring scepter during the bout and this sure did help Triple H in winning the King of the Ring finals. After the match, Triple H destroyed Mankind with the King's crown, so Mankind was trying to get a little payback at the Canadian Stampede show. Along with this, the WWF were trying, and succeeding, in getting Mick Foley a little more sympathy through a series of sit-down interviews. The WWF were not shying away from Foley's past and this helped in making Foley seem a little more human, especially for fans who hadn't seen Mick's work as Cactus Jack. While the King of the Ring was perhaps all about establishing these new traits for Mankind and Triple H, their match here at Canadian Stampede was an all out brawl and in my opinion, this match here is one of the most overlooked and underappreciated pay per view openers in history. Now it isn't perfect, there's quite a bit of interference from China but it's still very, very good. The match starts off with a fist fight between the two competitors, Mankind gains the upper hand and we see Foley pull off a face crusher and his double arm DDT within the opening moments of the bout. After nailing the DDT, Foley taunts Triple H by doing the Helmsley pose and this gets a great pop from the audience. It doesn't take long for the fight to spill to the outside where Foley pulls off his signature elbow drop right in front of the Hart family. Any Hart's who weren't involved in the main event had ringside seats but we'll come back to this in the main event. China looks on as Mankind stays in control. Helmsley gets thrown out of the ring once again and this is enough to make Triple H walk back up the entranceway. Foley gives chase and Hunter ends up taking a suplex on the ramp. Hunter tries to get back in with a sunset flip but Foley counters with the mandible claw. It looks like it's already all over but China nails Mankind with a forearm. This gets a round of boos from the audience. Foley goes to the outside to confront China and he thwarts Hunter's attempt at a snake attack. The numbers game then comes into play when Hunter launches Mankind into China. China shows off her strength by slamming Mankind onto the ring steps and Foley lands really awkwardly on the steel. Hunter hits Mankind on the leg with the steel chair. The cameraman missed this spot unfortunately but it becomes clear that Helmsley's battle plan is to now focus on the injured leg. It's an all out assault here. Mankind does the old leg buckling spot when he gets Irish whipped and I always felt this was a really effective way of selling an injured wheel. Hunter locks in a figure 4 but the referee breaks it up after Triple H gets caught cheating. Helmsley then goes for the pedigree, Mankind reverses it but Hunter kicks Foley into the turnbuckles while Triple H remains grounded. This ends with Foley headbutting Triple H between the legs. Mankind then begins firing up and Foley remembers to sell the leg when he hits a running knee strike in the corner. Hunter gets nailed with a forearm while in the tree of woe position and Mankind then hits a pile driver that gets a really great crowd reaction but it only gets him a two count. The match again goes to the outside. Foley tries to use a chair but his plan backfires resulting in Triple H hitting Foley on the leg with the same steel chair and China also hitting a clothesline. Even after all this punishment Foley is still able to apply the mandible claw when Hunter goes to the top rope but once again China is there to save Helmsley. The match goes to the outside for the final time. Hunter beats up Foley a little and Mankind gets dumped over the guardrail. The ref calls for the bell and both men get counted out. China, Helmsley and Mankind then fight the audience after the match. Hunter gets busted open in the middle of the chaos as the first bout comes to an end. In my opinion this was miles better than the King of the Ring final and it was a great bout to get the Calgary audience hyped up for what was to come. We see clips of the Calgary Stampede festivities. The Hart Foundation were put on a WWF float and paraded around the streets. We see Bret Hart meeting his fans and signing autographs. We see the hitman showing up at the Stampede grounds. When Bret said the Hearts were heroes in Canada, the man wasn't lying. This all played really well into what the WWF were trying to do with the Hart Foundation being heels in America but baby faces everywhere else. The Hart Foundation then get interviewed backstage. Handsome Doc Hendricks says there's a lot 
lot on the line here. The Hearts could get embarrassed in their hometown, and the hitman tells Doc to stop being stupid. Steve Austin then shows up, and Brett says the Hearts won't go after Stone Cold when it's five on one. They'll wait until they're in the ring, and it's five on five. Again, a very babyface thing to do. Back in the arena, we get ready for our next match. It's Takamichi Noku versus the Great Sasuke. This one is quite interesting, Sasuke is the founder of Michinoku Pro and Taka worked for the promotion around the same time period. The WWF wanted to compete with WCW's cruiserweight division, so Vince McMahon wanted to show some more high flying action while also eventually bringing back the light heavyweight championship belt from Japan. The Great Sasuke vs Taka Michinoku was the first WWF light heavyweight match of this era and it's quite strange that Vince would put these two guys in a WWF ring on paper pay-per-view without a single warm-up match or a single dark match. Still, the gamble paid off, Sasuke vs Taka at Canadian Stampede was an exciting match and it got a lot of fans talking. There's been mixed reports about the great Sasuke's relationship with the World Wrestling Federation. Rumours suggest that he was in line to become the light heavyweight champion, but because he bragged about winning the title before it was even reintroduced, the WWF decided to go with Taka instead. We can't confirm this though, so take it for what it is. One thing is for sure though, Sasuke was positioned to be the poster boy for this new light heavyweight division early on, but the fans gravitated towards Takamichi Noku. Both men performed extremely well here, but for whatever reason, Taka came out looking better. Before the two men lock up, Mankind and Hunter Hearst Helmsley begin fighting again in the audience. The WWF clearly wanted to continue this rivalry past Canadian Stampede and that's exactly what would happen. I plan on covering the whole Foley vs Helmsley feud in a future video though, so look out for that one soon. Michinoku is on the defence for the early portion of the match as Sasuke shows off some lightning fast kicks. The audience goes a little quiet when the two men begin working submission moves but there's a loud gasp when Sasuke hits a perfect spinning back kick. Sasuke locks in a half Boston Crab but Taka makes it to the ropes. A few more kicks from Sasuke are followed by Taka slapping his opponent across the face before Michinoku hits a few drop kicks to a grounded Sasuke. Taka tries to act like a heel by putting his hands up and laughing but the audience actually cheers for him. The crowd are simply appreciative of the in-ring work and they don't really care about good guys versus bad guys. Taka gets launched out of the ring with a high angle back body drop and Sasuke follows up with a martial arts kick from the top rope. And back inside the ring, Sasuke delivers another series of kicks and the last one hits Taka hard and I mean it hits him really hard. Taka went into this match looking like the natural underdog especially because we didn't know any of their their backstory, but this kick here done a lot to garner Taka some sympathy. When Michinoku fights back and he hits a springboard plancha, the audience are completely on his side. This was a great move too, the amount of distance Taka got here was incredible. Back inside the ropes, Taka reverses a German suplex by landing on his feet, and he follows up with a Frankensteiner that only gets him a two count. Sasuke then hits a cartwheel back elbow before hitting a springboard moonsault to the outside. When the two men eventually get back inside the ring, Taka hits a belly to belly suplex and a top rope drop kick and then Michinoku signals for the end. Taka hits the Michinoku driver but Sasuke kicks out and the great Sasuke nails a lion salt and the match then ends with Taka taking a tiger suplex. It was a gamble bringing these two in on a WWF pay per view but it seriously paid off. If the WWF could keep this momentum going forward with their light heavyweight division then WCW would have some serious competition. This is a great bout but I do have one small complaint. It isn't about what happened in the ring, it's more about the commentary during the match. McMahon, Lawler and Ross did absolutely nothing to educate viewers at home about who these two really were and what they had done in Michinoku Pro. And this is where having guys like Mike Tenay or Joey Styles really pays off. Still a really different match for WWF standards and a match that comes highly recommended. These two would meet again the next night on Raw and Sasuke would once again get the win, but just like their Canadian stampede bout, the fans still favour Taka over Sasuke. 
Before moving on to our next match, we once again see Triple H and Mankind beating each other up, this time it's outside the arena. The two men beat the tar out of each other, and this spot here with Mankind getting thrown into some beer kegs looked particularly painful. Moving on, we have a WWF Championship match, The Undertaker vs Vader. At the King of the Ring pay-per-view, The Undertaker defeated Nation of Domination leader Farouk to retain the WWF Championship. On Raw the following night, Farouk demanded a tag team match against The Undertaker and Ahmed Johnson, the two men that Farouk said he hated the most in WWF. The following week, the tag team match took place and in the end, Ahmed Johnson turned on The Undertaker and he joined the nation. The Undertaker vs Ahmed Johnson was booked for Canadian Stampede but Ahmed got himself injured during a brawl with the DOA. So Ahmed lost the opportunity to wrestle for the WWF Championship at Canadian Stampede. And so Vader stepped in to take his place. It sounds harsh saying that Undertaker vs Vader is probably the weakest match on this card, but this doesn't mean it's bad, it's actually one of Vader's better WWF performances. By this point in 1997, we all knew we weren't going to see the Vader that dominated Japan and WCW. The WWF had done a lot to water down everything that made Vader so intimidating, and along with this, it looked like Vader's confidence had taken a big hit after that infamous SummerSlam match with Shawn Michaels. Still, he had a good bout here with The Undertaker, the Phenom was dealing with Paul Bearer in the looming debut of Kane, and because Vader was associated with Paul Bearer, it made sense to slot the Mastodon into the match. The audience in Calgary loved the Phenom, and the Deadman started off strong and the crowd popped for every single move The Undertaker pulled off. It turns into another story of the babyface trying to overcome the numbers game. We see impressive top rope moves moves from both the champion and the challenger, and the arena begins completely rocking when The Undertaker tries to mount a comeback at around the 10 minute mark, so much so that the hard camera begins shaking when Vader goes for the Vader bomb. The Undertaker gets up and he counters with a middle rope choke slam. Vader kicks out of not one, but two choke slams, but the tombstone pile driver puts the big man away. Just seeing The Undertaker tombstone Vader is a real sight to see. And so we get to the main event and it's probably the reason why you clicked on this video. There's still around one hour of time remaining on the pay per view so you know you're in for a real treat here, from the entrances all the way to the final bell. At the King of the Ring, Bret Hart challenged any five American superstars to step into the ring with the Hart Foundation at Canadian Stampede. Ken Shamrock, Goldust, The Legion of Doom and Stone Cold Steve Austin would end up coming together to face the Hearts. And without disrespecting the five men and Team America here, this really wasn't the absolute best babyface team the WWF had to offer at the time. You have to remember though that these guys were getting booked to lose, and the WWF still had to protect their biggest babyfaces when the company returned to the United States, so it makes sense to sacrifice a few lesser superstars for the greater good perhaps. Of note here is that Shawn Michaels was absent from Canadian Stampede. He and Bret Hart had that well documented backstage fight and Vince told Shawn to take a few weeks off to cool down, so who knows how Sean would have fit into this pay per view had he been around at the time. I know I've harped on about this already in this video, but to really appreciate Canadian Stampede, you need to appreciate how Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation would rip apart American wrestling fans on weekly WWF television. Bret felt the fans of America turned their back on the hitman, but Bret would also say that the fans across the border still valued him and the rest of the Hearts. Canadian Stampede was designed to show the world that Canada still loved the hitman, and boy, I'm not sure anyone could have predicted the reaction the Hart Foundation got during this 10 man tag main event. There hasn't been an atmosphere like this at a wrestling show since. The closest thing I could compare it to, in the WWF at least, would be the CM Punk vs John Cena Chicago match at Money in the Bank 2011. Team USA have an interview before the match, they all seem united as one with the exception of Stone Cold Steve Austin. Austin walks away from the team before Doc Hendricks gets a chance to ask a few questions. The Canadian National Anthem is sang in the ring by Farmer's Daughter, a Canadian country music group who I've personally never heard of before but still, the message is sent loud and clear. This is hard family territory and this one is all about Canada being better than America. Howard Finkel 
acknowledges Stu and Helen Hart sitting at ringside before the Hart Foundation's opponents make their way to the ring. Now, it isn't an absolute hostile reaction here. The fans aren't completely booing the hell out of Team USA, but they aren't overly welcoming either. I love Steve Austin's entrance here, by the way. He's just talking smack while laughing all the way to the ring, and he's playing the role to perfection. The first Hart Foundation member to get introduced is Brian Pullman, and I can talk about the insane reactions each member of the Hart Foundation gets here, but I won't do that. Instead, I'll just say that each and every member gets treated like a main event megastar as the Hearts line up the entranceway one by one. When the Hitman comes out, the crowd response is simply insane. You'll never see a homecoming like this in wrestling. The Hart Foundation got the biggest babyface pop of the year, even though though they were heels. Truly outstanding stuff here. The two teams come face to face, but when the smoke clears, we are left with Bret Hart and Steve Austin. The two trade punches and Bret gets the upper hand. When Austin finds himself in the corner getting a beating from the hitman, the hard camera again begins to shake due to the crowd once again going totally nuts. Jerry Lawler screams that the building is shaking as Austin gets a little payback. Stone Cold flips off the fans before Bret comes back with a clothesline. Bret gets cheered for everything he does here. It doesn't matter if Bret fights fair or fights dirty, everything gets a pop. Stone Cold hits a low blow and he gives a cheeky little smile to the Calgary audience after doing so. Austin locks in the million dollar dream and the two men reenact the finish of their Survivor Series 96 match, but this time Austin kicks out. Brad tags in Jim the Anvil Nethart and Austin tags in Ken Shamrock. We get a little spot here where the Anvil tries to go toe to toe with the world's most dangerous man, but it's no use. Brad Pillman gets cheered when he breaks up an ankle lock attempt and the loose cannon also laughs in Ken Shamrock's face. The anvil is simply outclassed by Shamrock, so Pillman gets tagged in and again it's another great ovation. The Hart Foundation can do no wrong here. Pillman bites his opponent, he spits on Shamrock, Shamrock gets mocked when Pillman pretends to make Ken top out. Pillman is completely working heel and the fans love it. A belly to belly suplex forces Pillman to tag in Owen Hart as Shamrock tags in Goldust and the common Terry team don't even bother to try and talk as the saddle dome breaks out in a loud Owen chant. Owen hits an enziguri but it only scores him a two count. Steve Austin begins taunting the other Hart family members at ringside as road warrior Hawk begins working over Owen. The king of hearts applies the sharpshooter but Animal breaks it up. This leads to the European champion Davy Boy Smith getting tagged in. The bulldog hits the running power slam but Goldust breaks it up. Animal comes into the match along with Bret Hart. So now everyone has stepped into the ring and everyone has experienced this unique crowd inside the saddle dome. Eventually the match breaks down and Steve Austin brings Owen Hart to the ring post while the referee was distracted. Bruce Hart, who is sitting at ringside, tries to stop Austin from destroying Owen's leg but it's no use. Stone Cold does a number on Owen and Bret tells the Hart Foundation that Owen is hurt. Owen gets removed from the match so it's now 5 on 4. Austin hits the Stone Cold Stunner on Brad Pumman but Brett drags Austin to the ring post for some payback. It's now Stone Cold's turn to take punishment as the hitman hits Austin's leg with a fire extinguisher before locking in the figure 4 around the ring post. As the match continues, Steve Austin is forced to go backstage. It looks like we now have a 4 on 4 match as both Owen Hart and Steve Austin have received injuries. We get a little fan service when the hitman and the anvil display some double team offense and I like this spot here where Brian Pillman completely stops Ken Shamrock from going after the hitman's ankle. Pillman also threw Shamrock into the announce table and this looked pretty good too. Steve Austin hobbles back down to the ring and he wants tagged in and we once again get to see Brad and Stone Cold face to face. Steve gets the upper hand this time but eventually Brad turns it around. Brad applies a sleeper but Stone Cold gets out with a jawbreaker. Road Warrior Animal breaks up a sharpshooter attempt and when Stone Cold applies a sharpshooter of his own, it's Owen Hart who comes back down the ramp to break up the hold. Owen gets tagged in and Austin sends the King of Hearts over the top rope. Austin then begins beating Owen up in front of the Hearts. Bruce Hart throws a drink over Austin but Stone Cold goes after Stu. This results in the Hart brothers beating up Austin at ringside. Stone Cold gets thrown back into the ring and Owen rolls him up for the victory. 
the Hart Foundation win via pinfall. Hart family members get into the ring to fight Team USA, but officials break it up. Steve Austin and company are eventually sent back up the entranceway and a celebration takes place inside the ring. Stone Cold comes back with a steel chair. He manages to hit the anvil, but the remaining hearts jump on Stone Cold. Austin ends up getting handcuffed and Stone Cold is once again escorted back up the ramp. The show comes to an end with the whole Hart clan coming into the ring. Everyone is here, Stu Hart, Helen Hart, even young Davy Boy Smith Jr., Teddy Hart, Tyson Kidd and Natalia can be seen in the ring celebrating as Canadian Stampede comes to an end. Canadian Stampede brought in around 165,000 domestic pay-per-view buys, which was the second biggest in-your-house buy rate of the year, the first being Bad Blood. While on the grand scheme of things it wasn't a big pay-per-view in terms of sales, it done a fantastic job of encapsulating the main WWF storyline of 1997. The whole event went on to receive critical acclaim from the wrestling media and wrestling fans. The tone of Canadian Stampede was so different that you can't help but get excited during the 10-man tag main event. Needless to say, if you consider yourself a fan of pro wrestling, and that is old school wrestling and modern wrestling, Canadian Stampede simply needs to be seen. Whether you're a fan of the hearts or not, you're still going to be very, very entertained from start to end. It's events like this that help reinforce the statement that 1997 was one of the very best years in the history of the World Wrestling Federation. Thank you for watching watching and take care. SummerSlam 97 took place in East Rutherford, New Jersey on August 3rd, attracting around 20,000 fans to the Continental Airlines Arena and bringing in around 225,000 pay-per-view buys. Bret the Hitman Hart is gonna get a shot at The Undertaker's WWF title in the main event, Steve Austin faces Owen Hart for the Intercontinental Championship, and we have also got a steel cage match to look forward to when Triple H faces Mankind. This is a pivotal WWF pay-per-view with many feeling the final moments of the Bret vs Undertaker match was the beginning of the Attitude Era. A lot goes down tonight and the WWF would never be the same following what transpires at SummerSlam Heart and Soul. So let's have a look at the pay-per-view in its entirety. The SummerSlam 1997 free-for-all does not feature a match. Todd Pettengill takes time to promote the million dollar giveaway that's gonna happen during the pay-per-view itself. That's gonna be fun, I'm sure. Bret Hart pulls little brother Owen away from an interview and the hitman refuses to talk. And there's also a Shawn Michaels promo that happened inside the arena. Remember, HBK is our special guest referee in tonight's main event. And if he doesn't call it down the middle, then he can't wrestle on American soil ever again. Sean says people want to know if he's going to be a fair referee tonight, and he says yes, he will. Any problems Sean had with Brett were settled back at WrestleMania 12, and Sean says he's going to call it right down the middle the way Sean sees fit. Sean wraps it up by saying he stands for truth, justice, and the HBK way. So yeah, he's probably going to do something tonight. You can just skip this free for all too, by the way, there's not much to see here. SummerSlam opens up with the National Anthem. This all feeds into the Hart Foundation storyline that's dominated the WWF over these past few months. Vince McMahon stands for the Anthem while this sign right here acts like a Mr. McMahon thought bubble. Our opening bout is the Mankind vs Triple H steel cage match. These two have had pay-per-view matches at the King of the Ring and Canadian Stampede, but China was always the difference maker. So the cage is hopefully going to keep China out of the ring tonight. Mick Foley during this point in his career was getting more and more popular with each passing week. Dude Love was a tag team champion and the character debut had been successful, but now it was time to revert back to Mankind where Foley could get a little more sadistic. Triple H tries to escape through the cage door right away but Foley grabs him. Hunter gets slammed to the mat, he takes a few right hands and again Hunter tries to escape. 
It looks like Triple H wants nothing to do with mankind tonight. Hunter gets his face pushed into the steel and Mick lays in a ton of punches in the corner. Hunter then takes a running knee and Mick Foley says bang bang afterwards, a callback to his Cactus Jack character who has not made a WWF appearance just yet. Foley performs a pile driver, he then applies the mandible claw, but China is able to help Hunter by choking mankind out and there's nothing the referee can do about it. Hunter goes on offense briefly, but Mick comes back with a jumping clothesline. Mick then tries to escape, but China punches Mick right in the balls, and this leads to Hunter performing a superplex. Clearly, the cage isn't going to stop China tonight. Hunter has a chance to leave the cage, but he decides to get back inside the ropes. Even China wonders if Hunter's thinking clearly, but Triple H wants to punish mankind. Foley gets rammed into the steel bars three times and each bump looks worse than the last. Foley finds himself trapped between the ropes in the cage and Hunter continues to smack Mick's head into the steel. After doing what he thinks is enough damage, Triple H tries to climb out but Mick stops Hunter. The match continues with Foley in control and the crowd applauds when Mick puts Hunter back on the mat. China once again gets involved but it doesn't stop Mick from hitting Hunter with an inverted atomic drop, followed by another clothesline. Hunter comes back with his face buster, and one of the more creative moments of the match comes when Foley counters a superplex and this leads to Hunter getting hung up on the cage. Mick drops a forearm on Triple H afterwards, and now it's Hunter's turn to get rammed into the cage panels, maybe Hunter should have escaped the cage when he had the chance. Triple H gets a break when he drops Mankind into the cage, he tries to escape, but he ends up getting his little King of Kings smashed on the top rope and then he gets his leg all tangled up. Mick tries to escape through the cage door, but China slams it right on Mick's head and Mick did not try to protect himself here, absolutely brutal. China then takes out the referee and she throws a chair into the ring. Hunter goes for a pedigree, but Mick counters it and Hunter ends up knocking China down. The crowd absolutely love this. Hunter takes the double arm DDT and that should be it all over. Mankind goes to leave the cage, but then he stops just short of hitting the floor before taking his mask off. He climbs back up, he rips his top, and he lands an elbow drop from the top of the cage. Mick was inspired to do this after seeing Jimmy Snooker do the same in Madison Square Garden. Mick then gets out of the cage before Hunter, and that's the match over, a great opening bout for SummerSlam 1997. Mick seems too hurt to get back up, but then Dude Loves theme music begins playing in the arena, and Mick starts moving his foot. Foley gets up, he's in pain, but he still dances on his way back up the rampway. The WWF then honoured New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman because the WWF love avoiding those taxes. In short, Christine removed excise taxes on pro wrestling and this led to the WWF resuming events in New Jersey. Residents of New Jersey couldn't have cared less though and Christine gets booed relentlessly on her way to the ring. It's also incredible that the headbangers are dressed better than Christine here, but anyway. Because Christine saved McMahon a ton of money, and we all know McMahon loves money, she gets presented with a WWF Championship belt. Fucking Bret Hart's been screwed over the championship for months, yet Governor Whitman here gets handed one just like that. Bran Pillman vs Goldust is up next. Every member of the Hart Foundation, except Jim Neidhart, has a match tonight and each match has a stipulation. If Bran loses this match against Goldust, then he'd be forced to wear a dress tomorrow night on Raw. Not much story in this one, Pillman had been targeting Goldust since Dustin got involved in the Canadian Stampede match. The storyline would actually begin to truly build after this matchup. Every time I watch Bran Pillman in the WWF, I can't help but think about what could have been if the car accident didn't happen. Pillman was forced to really alter his style by the time he started wrestling in the WWF, and WWF fans didn't get to see what Bran was really capable of. It's definitely a shame. Pillman takes the early advantage by using underhanded tactics, but Goldust comes back with a jumping back elbow. Brand then has to take a timeout after getting kissed by Goldust. JR calls this the lip lock, and back in the ring, Pillman turns it around with more underhanded tactics. Goldust gets floored and Pillman decides to go after Marlena. This, of course, was a mistake. Goldust catches Pillman with a clothesline on the outside, but back inside the ropes, Pillman keeps Dustin at bay with a suplex. Brian then goes for an aerial attack, but Goldust catches him and Pillman takes a nasty bump on the top rope. On the outside, Brian uses Marlena as a shield and this allows him to hit a DDT. And then we see some of the old Brian Pillman when he hits a flying clothesline back inside the ring. 
Brian applies a chin lock, he hits a clothesline after Goldust fails to pin Brian with a backslide, but Goldust comes back with another jumping clothesline of his own. Pillman's bulldog counter looks great and it sends Goldust flying out of the ring. Goldust tries to get back in the ring with a sunset flip that didn't look good, the crowd booed this. Pillman tries to make it to the ropes but Marlena smacks him with her handbag and Goldust wins the match. Marlena puts a dress wearing mannequin in the ring, Pillman sees the dress he's gonna wear tomorrow on Raw and he totally flips out. This match wasn't too bad but I prefer Pillman's second match against Mick Foley on the Raw just before Canadian Stampede. Wrestling and travelling were really taking a toll on Brian though and most people in the industry would say that Pillman still shouldn't have been in the ring around this time period. The Legion of Doom vs the Godwins is our next match, the Godwins are now full blown bad guys and as mentioned on Reliving the War, the WWF's booking of the Legion of Doom has been awful since Wrestlemania 13. The Road Warriors just weren't coming across as the ass kickers we all knew they could be and honestly it would eventually get worse for Hawk and Animal. Still, there were peaks and volleys during the Legion of Doom's final WWF run, we still have a couple of decent Road Warrior moments coming up, but when things get bad, they get really fucking bad. This one started when Henry Godwin broke his C4 vertebrae following a doomsday device. He had come back and immediately go after the Road Warriors along with Phineas. The Godwins constantly got the better of Hawk and Animal on Raw's war with their weapon of choice being the Slop Bucket. And Road Warrior Hawk even got slopped on the Raw just before SummerSlam. It's a sad sad sight indeed. Thankfully the Road Warriors were able to defeat the Godwins here. I struggled back then to find something I like about Henry and Phineas and watching all this back today. I still can't find anything I like about the tag team. There's nothing wrong with what they do in the ring but I just don't like this tag team, I'm sorry. Phineas stops Henry from taking another doomsday device but that doesn't stop the road warriors from hitting a spike pile driver. It was a match that LOD had to win really. The crowd enjoyed it though so let's hope things improve a little for Hawk and Animal on the next few episodes of Raw. The Million Dollar Chance is up next. Fans had to watch WWF programming and gather a bunch of clues. They then entered a competition and two people were randomly chosen to attend SummerSlam and potentially win a million dollars. So we have young Ryan here and uh, old Patrick. Get this, they have a 1 in 100 chance of winning the million dollars. They have to pick a numbered key from 1 to 100 and they gotta hope it opens the coffin filled with crispy delicious $1 bills. That's some proper fucking bullshit right there. Here's the World Wrestling Federation gloating about saving tax money and here's the World Wrestling Federation promoting this giveaway for a month and yet there's a very very high chance that no one's winning a million tonight. Todd Pettengill gets another few contestants in on the action via phone call. The first number he dials gets no answer, the second is an incorrect number. Michael gets on the phone for attempt 3 and when Todd asks him if he's watching SummerSlam, he says he isn't. <laughs> Apparently his cable company doesn't carry the show but he's still in with a chance. He picks number 33, Sonny tries the key, no luck. Rebecca gets on the phone, she tries number 14. No, no million dollars for Rebecca. Young Ryan has a crack, the coffin doesn't open, but he does get a hug from Sable. Easy there, tagger. And Patrick also, of course, does not win the money. All contestants did get a five grand savings bond, but fuck me, what a waste of time. Big Norm here, no idea who Norm is, but Big Norm lets us know that number three would have opened the casket. Next up we have Ken Shamrock vs Davy Boy Smith. If the Bulldog loses this match he has to eat dog food but on the last episode of Raw it was Kenny Boy who tasted some pedigree chum. Davy headbutted Ken during an arm wrestling competition and after beating the shit out of Ken with a chair, Bulldog pulled out a can of doggy dinner and it got smeared all over the world's most dangerous man. You guys don't care about that though, I know. You guys care about the chin locks. Davy Boy Smith loves a good chin lock, but he decided to get clean and completely stop doing these deadly wrestling holds. For 5 whole weeks Davy has not performed the chin lock inside the ring, but tonight is going to be his biggest test. It's his first singles pay per view match in quite some time, so let's see if Davy can stay strong and not perform any chin locks. 
It's announced before the match that Davy Boy Smith will face Shawn Michaels in a special UK pay per view named One Night Only, and yes, I'll cover this event in full when it happens in our timeline. The two competitors make their way down to the ring and it starts off with a full blown fist fight. Shamrock then pulls off a great looking belly to belly suplex, and on the outside of the ring, Ken continues to punish Davy with the help of the ring post and ring steps. JR says the Kenny boy's been losing sleep over the dog food incident on Raw this past week. Back in the ring, Ken counters a hip toss and then he goes for the ankle lock, but Davy makes it to the ropes. Ken then hits a clothesline, he lays in a few strikes in the corner, Davy gets a boot up, and finally the bulldog begins fighting back. We see the vertical suplex, Ken kicks out at two, and then. Davy Boy Smith Chenlock. Well, that didn't take long, did it? Five weeks, five whole fucking weeks down the shitter. Look at how satisfied Davy looks, too. I hope he's proud of himself. It's only one chin lock, though. It's like having a little tipple with your dinner and not getting completely shit faced, so we'll let it pass. Ken fights out, but Davy puts him back down with a knee to the midsection and. Davy Boy Smith chin lock. Well, if you're gonna throw it all away, you might as well make it count. That's enough though, Davey. There's still hope if he keeps the number low. Ken kicks out and he goes for a sunset flip. Davey tries to stay on his feet, but he gets brought down. Davey kicks out at two. He hits a clothesline. Davey Boy Smith chin lock. The magic number. Three Davey Boy chin locks in one match. That's it guys, Davey's officially back to square one, he's fallen off the wagon and he's beyond saving. The two men get back to their feet, Davey does some damage, Ken takes a few forearms at the ropes before getting rolled up but he kicks out a two, and oh my god. Davey Boy Smith Chen Rock. We're adding insult to injury now, Davy. He didn't just come back and dabble in a few chin locks. He's been completely pushed off the edge. How the mighty have fallen. So devastating are these chin locks that Shamrock is now bleeding. He's got internal chin injuries. Shamrock takes a ring post bump, shoulder first, and on the outside, Davy uses the ring steps to do some further damage. Ken fights back, but a low blow keeps Davy in control. We then see a bot suplex attempt, but what do you expect? Davy's already completely gone here, and it doesn't matter what happens tonight, the Bulldog is already lost. Back in the ring, Bulldog lands a few punches, and you won't believe what happens next. Davy Boy Smith Chen Rock. It's absolute insanity. Davy's officially broken his one match chin lock record. He was saving it all up for this one bout. In all seriousness, though, this is the most selling Shamrock has ever had to do since coming to the WWF. Nobody's ever done this much damage to Kenny Boy, and it's fucking hilarious that repeated chin locks is what's keeping this submission specialist in danger. It's brilliant. The two go outside again, and Davy decides to slap some dog food on Shamrock's face. This was a mistake, a big mistake. Shamrock loses it, the can gets smashed over Davy's head and the referee calls for the bell. Davy wins via disqualification. Inside the ring, Ken puts Davy in a rear naked choke. Davy begins turning purple as officials try to break the chokehold, but it's no use. Shamrock eventually lets go, but he's not done yet. Pat Patterson, Jerry Briscoe, and a few referees take suplexes, and the crowd goes nuts. Shamrock's a sore loser, man. Just because he couldn't overcome five chin locks doesn't mean he should hurt officials and referees. The bigger story here, though, is the downfall of Davy Boy Smith. It's a sad, sad night at SummerSlam 1997. Todd Pettengill wants to know if Shawn Michaels can truly be a fair referee tonight, and Shawn echoes what he said in the free for all. His issues with Brett were resolved back at WrestleMania 12, and he's gonna call this one right down the middle. Shawn says he won't let nothing get by him in tonight's main event. Up next, we have Los Bariquas vs. the DOA, the Dirty Old Assholes. The WWF Gang Wars started on Raw quite recently when Farouk built a new nation of domination, while ex members Crush and Savio Vega built their own factions. Almost every match featuring the factions has ended in disqualification, and the WWF, for whatever reason, felt that multi man brawls with guys wearing the same attires was best for business in the summer of 1997. It's been bad up until this point, and it was bad again at SummerSlam. Slam. It started with a big brawl, things got a little civilized when the match actually settled down into a standard 8 man tag, 
But then the nation showed up and it all went downhill. Chains decided to slap Ahmed Johnson, so Big Ahmed hit him with a kind of Pearl River Plunge pile driver hybrid. Not sure if Ahmed knew what he was doing here, but yeah, this leads to Chains getting pinned and Los Bariquas win the match. Another brawl breaks out after the bout between the three factions and it ends with the Bariquas escaping while the nation and DOA continue to fight. If you've seen one of these gang matches, you've seen them all. Stone Cold Steve Austin gets a shot at the Intercontinental title next, meaning Austin could become a double champion. Austin moved his focus on to Owen Hart ever since the King of Hearts pinned the rattlesnake at Canadian Stampede. Nothing much going on in the build-up, Owen's been getting in cheap shots when possible, and if Austin can't get the job done, he said he'd kiss Owen's ass in the middle of the ring after the match. Austin had a WWF title shot back at a cold day in hell and he was unsuccessful. Tonight he has another chance at winning his first WWF singles title. Michael Cole tries to get a word with Austin but Stone Cold's in the zone and there's no interview. The two men make their entrances with the crowd going crazy for Austin but they get silenced when Owen immediately attacks the knee. Austin doesn't get a chance to get his jacket off as Owen goes to work and Stone Cold ends up taking some damage at the ring post. Unfortunately for Owen, this wasn't enough to stop Stone Cold. We see the Lufez press and Owen gets slammed to the mat repeatedly afterwards. Austin then chokes Owen at the ropes. The King of Hearts thinks he's smart when he dodges Austin's attack, but Stone Cold nails Austin with a big clothesline and the crowd goes nuts. Austin maintains wrist control and he begins working on Owen's shoulder. This doesn't last long. Owen performs his headstand counter and all this fancy shit means nothing when you get poked in the eye afterwards. Austin's laser focused here and he wants to go straight back to the arm and shoulder. A few switches result in Owen getting slammed to the mat while his arm was still behind his back. Hart replies with a back elbow, Austin then tries to use the ring post, but Owen counters and Austin takes the impact. The IC champ then focuses on Austin's hands and fingers. Hart stomps on Austin's hand, he bites Austin, he tries to pull and stretch the fingers apart. Owen's getting vicious here and he's also close to getting himself disqualified. Austin comes back with a stun gun and then we see a rare Steve Austin powerbomb when Owen goes for a Hurricane Rana. Owen then gets clotheslined out of the ring and he decides that's enough. He's gonna walk away and get himself counted out. Austin chases Owen and the champ gets brought back to the ring. This one isn't over yet. Owen begs for mercy but that gets him nowhere. What does help though is a belly to belly suplex followed by a neck breaker. Owen then hits an elbow drop but Austin kicks out of two. A neck vice does not get Owen a submission victory and Austin decides to almost decapitate Owen with a clothesline from the corner. Stone Cold then goes for a sharpshooter and I don't know why he keeps doing this, he hasn't locked it in in a long long time. Austin rolls through after an Owen hard crossbody but he only gets two. Owen performs a German suplex but again it only gets two. The match then slows down with Owen applying a camel clutch followed by a chin lock. The two then trade sleeper holds but Owen takes a jawbreaker and man this match has been fantastic so far. Owen stops a second rope double axe handle and he applies another chin lock. Careful there Owen. He transitions into a headlock and he tries to use the ropes for leverage but Earl Hebner catches the champ cheating and Owen breaks the hold. Austin gets up, he lands a few punches and then it happens. This is still hard to watch even today, seeing the pile driver is bad enough, but seeing Austin lying motionless in the ring, Owen Hart looking seriously worried, and Art Hebner being unsure what to do, it it's fucking bad. Austin got dropped on his head and he legitimately lost feeling in his limbs. He said it felt like a gong going off in his head, and at this very moment he's under the impression that he'll never walk again. Owen tries to buy Austin some time but Austin needs medical attention urgently. There's no getting up and continuing the match. Austin was supposed to win the bout so he crawls over and performs a weak schoolboy pin. Even this is hard to watch. And Austin wins the IC championship in one of the worst ways possible. Nobody knows how bad Austin's hurt and it doesn't look good. He tries to stand up and lift the IC title but he needs help from officials. He makes his way back up the entranceway and his feet are dragging along the floor. Austin of course does come back to the ring eventually but he's forced to completely change how he wrestles. Again, many would say, just like Brian Pullman, that Austin would come back to in-ring action way too soon. 
Bret Hart gets a shot at the WWF Championship next. The Hart family won the Canadian Stampede match and on the next episode of Raw, it was announced that the Hitman would face The Undertaker for the belt. Bret and Taker haven't really had any run-ins recently. Raw's war has taken place in Canada twice since the last pay-per-view, and the shows have centered around Bret and how he's a hero in one country, but the WWF's biggest heel in another. It's been a serious amount of fun watching all this back and appreciating how unique this all was. It's something that could never be replicated, and if it was, it would be nowhere near as good. Brett promised while in Canada that he would never wrestle in America again if he couldn't win the WWF Championship. This is all well and good, but then Shawn Michaels announced that he was going to be the special referee. The announcement also happened in Canada and Shawn's promo while delivering the news was great. Nobody could piss Canada off more than Shawn Michaels in 1997. If Sean doesn't call the match down the middle, if he shows any favoritism towards The Undertaker, then he too won't be allowed to wrestle in the United States ever again. So something's gotta give tonight at SummerSlam. This match is quite important when we discuss the changes happening in the WWF. It's the beginning of the domino effect. The ending of the bout initiates a series of events that would shape the careers of Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, and this also leads to the WWF changing direction in a big way. Brett comes out first, he's carrying the maple leaf, and he dedicates this match to all his fans around the world who feel the same way about America as he does. The Canadian National Anthem plays while Brett looks out at fans in disgust, and then Shawn Michaels makes his entrance. HBK's looking a lot better tonight than what he did on Raw, he was a fucking mess on Monday. The Undertaker then comes out and it does feel like the WWF Champion isn't as important here as what he should be. The focus is all on Brett and Shawn, but that changes after this match. Brett attacks The Undertaker with the belt before the bell rings, Shawn can't disqualify Brett so the hitman lays it in as much as possible, and Shawn then decides to call for the opening bell. Brett did get an early advantage, but The Undertaker makes him pay for it, dearly. After destroying Brett in the corner, The Undertaker hits a clothesline and Brett takes a beating on the outside. Shawn threatens to disqualify the champion. Taker ends up hitting the ring post when Brett ducks out of the way and Brett decides to try an apron attack. Taker grabs the hitman and Brett takes a ring post bump. Again, Sean threatens to disqualify the Undertaker. After doing a bit more damage on the outside, Taker brings it back to the ring and Brett finds himself in a backbreaker submission. The Undertaker stays in control with a bear hug, and the only way Brett can escape is by biting the dead man, although he runs into a big boot immediately afterwards. Brett needs to change game plan here, and he does so by targeting the left leg. Brett would normally go for the lower back or legs of his bigger opponents, and it pays off here. The Hitman slows the Undertaker way down with strikes to the leg and knee, and he keeps the pressure on for quite a long time. We see a figure four in the middle of the ring, and then Paul Bearer shows up. The Undertaker notices Paul, and he's angry. This match has nothing to do with Paul or The Undertaker's little brother, so Undertaker escapes the figure four. He damages Brett just enough to buy some time, and Paul gets punched on the mouth on the outside. Brett takes advantage and he hits a chop lock on the champion. Sean tells officials to get Paul away from ringside, and things aren't looking too good for the champion. Brett applies the figure four around the ring post and Sean begins a five count. Brett then confronts Sean after the move and Sean says he will disqualify Brett if he keeps this shit up. Owen Hart and Brian Pullman then show up and they stand at the bottom of the entranceway. Brett again uses the ring post to damage the Undertaker's knee and Sean tells Brett to keep it in the ring. Brett doesn't like getting talked down to by HBK. Taker's now having trouble walking at this point. Brett brings it down to the mat and The Undertaker hangs on without submitting. When the dead man gets the chance, he leaves the ring again to take care of Pillman and Owen, but this could have been a mistake. HBK goes out to stop the Phenom while also sending Owen and Pillman back to the locker room. Taker gets in the ring and Brett runs straight into a choke slam, but Sean isn't there to make the count. He gets back up on the apron and The Undertaker's understandably pissed off, but all this leads to Brett surprising The Taker with a pin attempt. 
and The Undertaker kicks out. This little bit here was quite important because we just learned that Sean would have no problem counting Taker's shoulders to the mat. The Undertaker's now really pissed off with Sean, but there's nothing he can do. The match resumes on the outside where Brett can't help himself and once again, the ring post comes into play. This causes an argument between Brett and Sean and Brett puts his hands up as if to say he won't do it again. Back in the ring, Brett hits a suplex and he lets the fans know what he thinks of them before hitting his elbow drop. Eventually, he goes for the sharpshooter, but Undertaker gets out by grabbing Brett by the throat, and the match continues on. We aren't done yet. Taker hits the jumping clothesline, Brett takes a turnbuckle bump chest first, and the hitman takes a chokeslam from the apron back into the ring. Taker then goes for old school, but Brett kicks the ropes. The hitman then pulls off a superplex, and there it is, the sharpshooter. The Undertaker not only doesn't give up, but he breaks the hold and Brett flies out of the ring. Brett says fuck as he looks back at the ring, he can't believe the dead man broke his signature move. Brett gets back in the ring and he eventually counters a tombstone attempt. He then locks in a sharpshooter around the ring post, and Sean goes to the outside to tell Brett to break the hold. Taker ends up breaking the move again, only this time Brett falls on top of Sean. So Brett takes the opportunity to grab a chair, and The Undertaker takes a hard shot to the head. Brett tells Sean to get in the ring and count, but The Undertaker kicks out. Hart argues with Sean, but the match isn't over and Brett needs to get back to work. HBK then notices the chair, he confronts Brett, and Brett says he has nothing to do with it. Sean won't accept that, he keeps on at Brett, so Brett says fuck you before spitting in Michael's face. Sean swings the chair at Brett, Brett ducks, and The Undertaker gets cracked on the head. Brett covers The Undertaker, and Sean has no choice. If he wants to keep wrestling in America, he has to make the three count. Bret Hart becomes a five-time WWF Champion, and what a finish, absolutely fantastic work here. Sean gets out of the arena before The Undertaker comes around, the dead man then immediately goes after Sean, and the fans start quickly filing out of the arena in disgust as Bret celebrates in the ring. A great, great match here, the storytelling was fantastic. Brett now has what he always wanted and he also got one over on Michaels in the process. It'll be interesting to see what happens on the next episode of Raw. SummerSlam 1997 was a very good pay per view in my opinion. I didn't care much for the tag matches, but everything else ranged from good to excellent. The Austin injury was shocking at the time, and it's still something that takes you back a bit when you see it today. Somehow, Brett and The Undertaker put on a match that made fans in attendance forget about the pile driver, and that finish to the championship match is one of my favourite creative match finishes the WWE ever came up with if not my favourite of all time. I talked about this finish in detail in another video, so if you have the time and if you want to learn a bit more, check it out on the channel. That's gonna do it for this one guys, Reliving the War episode 94 is gonna be a must see show with the Summerslam 1997 fallout and the special 100th episode of Nitro featuring Lex Luger vs Hulk Hogan. I hope you join me next week for that one and if you haven't done so already, please help me out by subscribing to the channel. Thanks to Reload Last Save for helping out with this video and thank you guys for watching, take care. Ground Zero In Your House took place on September 7th, 1997 in Louisville, Kentucky. This was the first In Your House to use the tagline as the main title of the show. It's also the first ever 3R In Your House show. And this is also the last In Your House event to feature the house at the entranceway. It's the end of an era. The WWF were evolving around this time period and the company wanted to get away from In Your House events feeling so similar. And as much as fans like the old house design, it was probably for the best. Just under 5,000 fans attended the event with a pretty low 126,000 fans buying on pay-per-view, though the WWF has an excuse for the low buy rate. Weekly programming was seriously altered in the weeks leading up to Ground Zero, with Raw getting pre-empted for the US Open. Friday night's main event aired for two weeks in place of Monday Night Raw. Still, the card looks decent. We have our first ever pay-per-view one-on-one -one match ever between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. Bret Hart defends the WWF. WF Championship against the Patriots, and the tag titles are up for grabs in a four-way elimination match. Let's look at the free-for-all before getting started with the main show. 
A hype video for the Patriot players and we learn about Dale Wilkes history in Japan. After the video airs, Bret Hart gets interviewed by Doc Hendricks, and Bret Hart laughs when Hendricks suggests that the Patriot could be the favourite in the title match tonight. Bret says the Patriot's only the favourite with the fans because this match takes place in America tonight. Bret says it's the Patriot's job to beat the hitman and Bret doesn't have to do a thing but defend his title. Bret doesn't like the Patriot mainly because Dale Wilkes sided with Steve Austin. The hitman is going to set an example tonight by kicking the crap out of the Patriot and the fans will have no choice but to respect the excellence of execution for doing so. Brian Pillman cuts a promo with the entranceway, Pillman faces Goldust tonight and if Pillman wins, he gets Marlena as his assistant for 30 days. Brian says after he wins, he's gonna file for custody for his little girl Dakota. Michael Cole interviews Shawn Michaels and HBK wonders who Michael Cole is. Shawn says he's ready to go tonight, he doesn't need the WWF title to still be in the main event and this is the day the mystique and the legend of The Undertaker disappears. Shawn then calls himself the franchise of the World Wrestling Federation before slapping Cole in the face. Michael has a look on his face like someone just stole his lunch money. Doc Hendricks then lets the fans know what matches they're going to see tonight but he gets interrupted by Steve Austin. Stone Cold was suspended on Friday night's main event for his own good considering the injury to his neck and he has to give up his tag team title tonight on the pay per view. But Austin says he promised the fans someone would get whipped tonight and that's exactly what's going to happen. The opening video for Ground Zero is all about HBK once being a hero and how things have changed for Michaels ever since SummerSlam. Fans give their opinions on the Heartbreak Kid, the fans say he's a traitor, a piece of crap and what Sean did to The Undertaker was a travesty of justice. We get a look at the arena, our commentators welcome us to the show and our opening match is the indecent proposal match, Goldust vs Brian Pillman. As mentioned earlier, Brand Pillman will get Marlena as his personal assistant for 30 days if he wins. If he loses, Pillman has to leave the WWF. Pillman also said that Dakota was his love child so we have a very personal match opening the show. Goldust attacks while Pillman makes his entrance, Brand gets the upper hand back inside the ropes by getting into the ring before his opponent but an inverted atomic drop and a clothesline puts Goldust back in the driver's seat. Pillman gets pummeled in the corner and he replies by choking Goldust with his shirt. He then bites the bizarre one's forehead and Brian lays in a few chops followed by a back elbow. Pillman chases Marlena on the outside but he's intercepted by Goldust before getting dropped on the steel steps. Brian tries to fight back inside the ropes but his bulldog attempt gets countered and Brian's little loose cannon gets smashed on the top rope. Goldust then follows Pillman up the rampway and we see a suplex on the steel. More damage gets done at the ring post as Pillman's balls fall out of his mouth and Goldust starts working the left leg and knee. Goldust this time goes for the bulldog but it's countered. Vince McMahon strangely calls Goldust and Marlena the first ever couple in the WWF as Pillman pulls off a back body drop while remembering to sell the leg. Goldust then finds himself in a camel clutch but he counters it with an electric chair drop, the fans popped for this. Pillman answers with a back elbow before going upstairs, more loose cannon abuse follows and we get a great spot next where Goldust launches launches Bran to the outside and Pillman smacks the guardrail. Marlena then comes over and she slaps Bran across the face. Back in the ring Goldust goes for a superplex but it gets countered. Pillman tries to fly but his dropkick completely misses. Goldust sets up the curtain call but Earl Hebner gets whacked and there's no one to count the pin. Marlena tries to attack Brian while Goldust tends to Hebner. Pillman takes away Marlena's purse and it's Goldust who ends up getting hit with it. Hebner wakes up and Pillman wins via pinfall. Marlena can't believe it, she's escorted back up the ramp by Pillman against her will and Goldust gives chase when he comes around. Jerry Lawler reveals a brick inside Marlena's purse as Pillman throws Marlena into his rented car. Goldust tries to stop the loose cannon but he's too late. The commentators talk about what happened for a bit and Jerry Lawler Lawler wonders what's happening right now in the front seat of the car. Goldust is seen losing his mind in the dressing room. It wasn't a bad opener at all but unfortunately this would turn out to be Brian's final pay per view match. Scott Putsky vs Brian Christopher is our next contest. 
the Putski versus Christopher feud was furthered a little on Shotgun Saturday night, with Christopher and Jerry Lawler doing some double team work on the son of Ivan Putski. Those of you who remember this match will remember the ending very well, but for those who didn't watch Ground Zero, then oh boy. Christopher hands it up as the crowd chants Jerry's kid, they cheer for Christopher when he throws his arms in the air and they boo Putski. Christopher tries to get in an early cheap shot, but Scott sees it coming and Brian ends up getting wheeled in the corner. He takes a clothesline and Scott pulls off a hip toss. Christopher then gets drop kicked out of the ring and he takes a little time on the outside before getting back in to resume the match. Christopher laughs as Putski gets put in a side headlock, but Scott comes back with more hip tosses. Brian then hits a clothesline and he points and laughs at his fallen opponent as the crowd cheer for the heel. Brian's top rope double axe handle gets countered and Scott performs a hurricane rana. Brian comes back with a full Nelson face buster and a German suplex, and then Brian sends Putski out of the ring. Here's where the match ends. Bran performs a slingshot sent on to the outside that looked a little dodgy, and Putski tried to catch his opponent. Scott badly injured his knee here, and when Bran realizes that Scott can't stand up, he gets in the ring and he tells the referee to end it via countout. Jerry Lawler grabs a microphone and he cuts a promo on Scott to try and keep the fans entertained, but he's lost for words when he sees the damage. Jim Ross thinks the kneecap has been dislocated, and yeah, it looks brutal. This would turn out to be Scott's final WWF match, and he'd end up signing with World Championship Wrestling. The injury here would keep him out of action for around six months. The WWF Gang Wars continue on as three faction leaders face off in a triple threat match, Farouk vs Crush vs Savio Vega. Gonna be honest, I'm not really looking forward to this one, but I've been surprised before with matches I wasn't initially keen on, so let's check it out. All three men leave their factions in the back. The match starts off with Savio and Farouk teaming up to attack Crush, but the leader of the dirty old assholes hits a dirty old double clothesline. Savio then tries to steal a victory, but Farouk breaks it up, and Crush ends up taking a whipping with Farouk's belt. Farouk gives Savio a few shots too before Crush takes the belt away, and yeah, Farouk gets whipped also. Savio breaks up this kinky whip fest by going after Crush. Farouk and Crush get their heads banged together and we see a few hip tosses. Both Farouk and Crush then try to pin Savio, and you can still tell that the guys in the ring weren't too comfortable with triple threat matches. Well, comfortable maybe isn't the best word, they just weren't used to these match types yet. I mentioned this a few weeks back during the WWF's first ever three-way match on Raw. Anyway, Crush gets taken out with a punch to the balls and Savio takes a spine buster from Farouk. Savio answers by drilling Farouk's face into the mat as Crush slowly gets back in the ring. Crush then breaks up a pin attempt and he hits Farouk with a big power slam. The three competitors then throw punches while on the mat and it ends with some more headbanging, and there's not much happening here, they're just kinda going through the motions while the crowd stays relatively silent. You can actually see fans leaving to get something to eat or go to the restrooms. Absolute mad bastard Crush applies a chin lock in a triple threat match, and even Jim Ross says that now's not the time to apply a chin lock. Farouk looks on as if to say, I can't believe what I'm seeing, before diving off the top rope to break up wrestling's most devastating rest hold. We then see one of the most interesting swinging neckbreakers ever, and that one's on Farouk, guys. Savio performed the motion as normal, and Farouk must have had a brain spasm or something. Farouk takes it out on Savio by choking him on the mat, and then Farouk applies a chin lock too. Crush is just walking around doing absolutely nothing. He then interrupts a Farouk pin attempt and Savio takes a backbreaker, but Crush gets his pin attempt broken up also. These two fucking geniuses then come up with a great idea. They can both take out Savio, they can both pin Savio at the same time, and they can both win the match. Savio takes a double suplex, we see the double pin, and Mike Kyoto tells the boys to fuck off, there can only be one winner. So, Savio gets thrown out of the ring and Crush and Farouk decide to settle this mono a mono. The battle begins with Farouk hitting a backbreaker on Crush, and then Savio gets straight back in to break up the pin. Savio gets thrown back outside, Crush hits Farouk with a backbreaker, and Savio breaks the cover again. Man, fuck this match, this has been bad. Savio gets thrown out, Farouk hits a power slam, and guess what happens next? There it is. Crush and Savio then form an unholy alliance and Farouk gets hit with a spike pile driver. Crush knows he won't get much more out of Vega, so back to the outside you go, Savio. 
Farouk then takes the hard punch, that should be it all over, but Savio's back and Crush takes a spinning wheel kick. Savio pins Crush and the match is over. I don't think many would have predicted Savio winning this one, but there you have it. I'm gonna need a drink after this one though, I wasn't feeling this match at all. Vince McMahon describes the next match as action of a different kind, El Torito vs Max Mini. The audience are ready to be seriously impressed by the work of these little wrestlers while a fan in the arena lets us all know what he thinks of Shawn Michaels before just walking off. El Torito takes a bite out of Max Mini's ass and Max rubs his butt on the bottom rope. After a bit more back and forth action, including Max getting kicked hard into the ropes and El Torito fighting his way out of a wrist lock, Max Mini once again gets his ass chewed out, literally. Max isn't impressed by the officiating so he hits sweet shin music on Jack Doan before uh, biting his ass through a mask mind you. Doan chases Max around the ring and Max Mini gets out of harm's way. Max then jumps on Jerry Lawler's lap. There's a joke to be made there, but I'm gonna dodge it. And Max tries on the King's Crown. This gets a bigger pop than anything that's happened in the ring so far. For all this fucking around, Max Mini gets his head kicked off by El Torito. The horny bull dude then hits a slam and a unique splash. Max Mini comes back with a hurricane rana and the crowd's now into it. They were chanting boring as the match got underway. Max Mini gets hit with a power bomb. he gets punched hard in the temple. And check out the clothesline here from El Torito, I'd celebrate too after that. El Torito ends up on the outside and Max Mini summons his inner Ultimo Dragon with an Asai Moonsault. Back in the ring, Max Mini lands a diving Hurricane Rana and the match ends with Max Mini performing a sunset flip for the victory. Say what you want about the quote mini wrestlers as the World Wrestling Federation like to call them, but Max Mini would end up becoming pretty popular during his stint in the WWE. Yeah. And this match here gives us a great example of how fan perception would change towards little people having WWF matches. People would groan at first, but by the end of the bout, those same fans who chanted boring were pretty entertained. We get a replay of the SummerSlam Piledriver next and we get a recap of Steve Austin's suspension announcement. It's time for Stone Cold and Dude Love to give up their tag team titles. Commissioner Slaughter and Jim Ross are in the ring and Dude Love comes out first. Foley says usually the dude's a happy cat but tonight there's no joy in Dudeville. Foley says he could try and defend the belts by himself but that wouldn't be right. If it wasn't for Stone Cold then Dude Love wouldn't be a tag team champion. So with a heavy heart and a pained pancreas, Dude Love relinquishes his tag team championship belt. Out comes Stone Cold Steve Austin to a great ovation, he squares up to Sergeant Slaughter before taking the microphone away from JR, and Austin tells Slaughter that if Stone Cold says he can wrestle, then he can wrestle. Nobody can tell Steve Austin what to do. Steve then messes the commissioner around a little, pulling the belt away when Slaughter goes to retrieve it. Stone Cold then throws the belt on the mat before calling Slaughter a jackass and ordering him to drop down and give Stone Cold 20. Slaughter then gingerly grabs the tag belt and he gets out of the ring. Austin then turns his attention to Jim Ross, he hands Ross the mic back before calling him a fat ass. And Jim says both he and the fans want Austin back in the ring but the World Wrestling Federation won't let Stone Cold risk his health. Jim wants Steve to wrestle again sooner rather than later, Austin takes the mic back and he surprises everyone by hitting Ross with a Stone Cold stunner, the crowd absolutely loved this. Vince McMahon leaves his position at the commentary table as Dude Love tries to keep Stone Cold under control. Sergeant Slaughter sends Austin back up the rampway and the medics and the officials come down to attend to Jim Ross. The crowd chants Slaughter sucks as Ross gets help to the back and then we go backstage where Doc Hendricks interviews Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith. Doc says Owen must be worried after what just happened to JR and Owen says what just happened in the ring was a load of crap. Ross didn't deserve what happened and what's worse, the fans of America are condoning it. The King of Hearts says he's gonna lobby for Steve Austin to not only get fined, not only get suspended, but Owen wants Austin put behind bars for assault. Davy Boy says even though Jim Ross is from Oklahoma, he still didn't deserve what happened in the ring. The tag team Fatal 4 way elimination match was up next, the Headbangers vs the Godwins vs Owen and Davey vs the Legion of Doom, same rules as Wrestlemania 13, only two guys in the ring at any one time, anyone standing on the apron can get tagged in at any time, 
When a man loses by pinfall, submission, DQ or count out, that man's team gets eliminated. The tag team belts are on the line here and just to get the big important question out of the way early, there are no chin locks in this match. This is the final time on television that Owen and Davey would team up and they've been a constant source of great entertainment throughout the whole Reliving the War series so far, so it's kinda sad that we have no further Owen and Davey tag matches to look forward to. The Legion of Doom were the first team eliminated, Animal intercepted the slot bucket but the referee caught the road warrior using the bucket as a weapon, the headbangers worked together to eliminate Henry and Phineas, so it came down to Owen and Davey vs the headbangers. Owen hits a gut wrench suplex followed by a leg drop on Thrasher, Owen and Davey then single out Thrasher and we see some dirty tactics from the Hart Foundation, Davey gets tagged in and he performs a vertical suplex, Owen comes back in illegally with a missile dropkick and Owen and the Bulldog perform a wishbone on Thrasher. It was all going so well until this happened, another brain spasm it seems, but this spot leads to Mosh getting tagged in and the timing was all over the place here. Mosh stands there waiting for Owen to get tagged in before firing up. Owen inadvertently hits Davey with a wheel kick and the Bulldog gets sent to the outside. More timing issues results in Thrasher waiting for ages on the top rope before Davey launches his planned attack but the match gets saved by Steve Austin making his way to the ring and the crowd once again lose their minds. Austin hits Owen with a stone cold stunner, Mosh pins Owen and the headbangers become the new tag team champions. Mosh and Thrasher celebrate while Owen and Davey head back up the ramp to look for Austin and you know, I think the headbangers deserve to run with the tag team belts, they had been having some of the best tag matches in the World Wrestling Federation although they were also booked to lose quite frequently. If the WWF weren't going to go with Owen and Davey again and if the WWF were going to keep fucking up the booking of the Road Warriors then the headbangers were the next best choice. We see Mosh and Thrasher celebrating at the concession stands with a bunch of hyped up fans. The match itself was a little shaky in places but still better than the triple threat encounter. Jim Ross wants Austin to pay for the stunner and he tells Slaughter to send a message to Vince. If this happens again, Jim Ross will leave the company, Ross didn't join the WWF to get beat up. Slaughter apologises and he says it won't happen again. Next up we have the WWF title match, Bret Hart vs the Patriot. The Patriot Dale Wilkes just randomly showed up in the World Wrestling Federation and he got a victory over Bret Hart on Raw. Because of that victory, the Patriot was given a shot at Bret's championship and that's all we've got here really. Patriot went on a little winning streak but anytime he ran into Bret Hart, it would usually end with Bret or the Hart Foundation giving the Patriot a beating. Much to the chagrin of Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels vs The Undertaker was the headline act tonight and at the next pay per view also, but I think it was the right call to put HBK and Taker at the end of the show if the Patriot was going to be Bret's opponent. I also think Bret should have faced someone else at Ground Zero, but anyway. Before the match, the Patriot says he beat Bret before and he knows in his mind he can do it again. Bret says he may not have any fans in America anymore, but that's because Americans don't know what a hero is. Bret says he's going to kick the crap out of the Patriot, he's going to enjoy it too, and everything he does in this match is directed to the American fans. The two make their entrances and Bret goes on offense immediately after handing over the belt. Patriot tries to fight back but the hitman takes the early lead and Patriot takes a back suplex. Patriot gets hung up in the tree of woe and Bret makes good on his promise, he kicks the crap out of the challenger, Bret chokes and bites his opponent, it isn't looking good for Dale Wilkes, but the Patriot comes back with a clothesline and this gets followed up with a dropkick. Bret gets clotheslined out of the ring and there's a mix of cheers and boos for the challenger. The hitman takes his sweet time getting back inside the ropes and he flips off a fan at ringside before the match resumes. Bret goes straight to the corner to make sure that dirty stinking rotten hyena can't lay his hands on the excellence of execution. Bret tries to get in a cheap shot but he ends up taking three arm drag takedowns. Patriot drops a leg across Bret's arm and Bret gets hammerlocked while getting thrown into the turnbuckles. The Patriot applies an arm bar and even when Bret tries to counter, the Patriot keeps the hole locked in. Patriot continues to work over the left arm and wrist of the champ and it's a good focused attack here. 
Brett then says fuck this and he begins attacking the left leg and knee. Brett does what he does best here, softening up his opponent for the eventual sharpshooter, but he also fails to sell the arm and keep in mind Patriot worked the arm for quite some time. McMahon says Brett's dissecting the Patriot and Wilkes is now getting tested like never before. Patriot tries to fight back but a rake to the eye sorts that problem out and the beating continues. More damage to the leg, the hitman applies the figure 4 around the ring post and when Brett gets back in the ring, Davy Boy Smith shows up Brett's insurance policy. Patriot takes a backbreaker as Vince McMahon promotes the UK exclusive one night only show, Patriot counters a suplex with a suplex of his own and now we'll see if the Patriot has the jam. Wilkes hits a DDT and Brett kicks out at 2, Brett's aerial attack gets countered, Patriot hits a clothesline and then Davey decides to trip the Patriot up and Brett performs a roll up, Patriot kicks out and the hitman crashes into Davey after a shoulder block, Brett gets covered but he kicks out at 2, Patriot hits the uncle slam but Davey's there to make sure Brett doesn't lose the belt. This leads to Vader coming down to even the odds and all four men fight at the rampway. Vader throws Brett into the ring steps and Brett thinks this should lead to a disqualification. The referee says the match has to continue and the fans are on their feet as the Patriot launches an attack. We see a big boot before Patriot hits his top rope shoulder block, Brett kicks out at 2, the Patriot hits an atomic drop and back suplex combo and these two dudes walk past with a giant banner pointed at the audience. It says Mid America College of Funeral Services salutes The Undertaker. Imagine buying tickets to a pay per view only to walk around and show other fans your shit banner. Brett answers the Patriots onslaught with a stun gun right on Brett's rope. He then hits a bulldog in the elbow drop but Patriot kicks out. Patriot fights back in the corner but he accidentally whacks my Kyoda. While the referees dazed, the Patriot hits the uncle slam but Brett gets a foot on the ropes. Both men go down after taking shoulder blocks. When the two men get back up, Brett takes his chest first turnbuckle bump and then the Patriot makes a mistake. He puts Brett Hart in the sharpshooter. Knowing the move better than anyone, the hitman counters the sharpshooter by grabbing the Patriot's foot, going on to apply a sharpshooter of his own and the Patriot has no choice but to submit. This finish would of course get revisited at Survivor Series 97 to a certain extent. This match is better than I remember though, it's not the best title match of 1997 by a long shot but it wasn't bad. Brett attacks the Patriot after the bout delivering a pile driver and a few punches to the head, Brett then takes the American flag, he breaks the flagpole and the Patriot gets choked with old glory. Brett whacks Pat Patterson, he gets another few shots into the Patriot and Brett kisses the World Wrestling Federation Championship before walking back up the ramp. Backstage Michael Cole interviews Brett and Brett calls Americans losers. Steve Austin, loser, Shawn Michaels, loser, Undertaker, loser, Patriot, fucking loser. Davey says the UK and Canada are gonna win this war and Brett says at least the fans in the UK respect great wrestlers. And Brett was right, Brett's always right. Jerry Lawler compares the Patriots loss to the Vietnam war and Vince McMahon just gives up. Our main event is up next, Shawn Michaels vs The Undertaker. HBK inadvertently hit The Undertaker with a steel chair at SummerSlam and this led to the dead man losing the WWF Championship. Shawn said it wasn't his fault and the fans were forcing Shawn to take responsibility for his actions when in reality, this was all the WWF's fault for putting Shawn in a hostile situation at SummerSlam in the first place. The thing is, Sean requested to be part of SummerSlam and he took great delight in announcing that he was the referee for the Brett vs Undertaker match during an episode of Raw in Canada. Sean then brought in Rick Rude to back him up, an insurance policy against the World Wrestling Federation and The Undertaker and Triple H in China would also align themselves with Shawn Michaels. HBK was now a heel and The Undertaker was out for revenge against the man who cost him the championship. Let's not forget too that The Undertaker has other things on his mind heading into this main event, mainly his little brother and Kane's promises of one day showing up in the World Wrestling Federation. The Shawn Michaels vs Undertaker series of pay per view matches would become legendary as time went on and it all started at ground zero. Before the match, Sean says he's too jacked up to rest, HBK hasn't slept in the last 13 years thanks to the contents of his fanny pack and Sean isn't prepared to rest in peace tonight. Again, Sean says the mystique of The Undertaker is gonna die, there's only one man who can do it 
and HBK is going to end the legend of The Undertaker because he can. We then get a legendary Shawn Michaels entrance where he tells the fans what he thinks of them and in the ring, Shawn's pyro goes off late and <laughs> he does this. Vince McMahon calls this a bad omen, I call Shawn's reaction absolutely hilarious. Out comes the Reaper of Souls and HBK's mood instantly changes. Sean tries to hide behind the referee and when HBK pushes Mike Chioda into the dead man, The Undertaker decides to knock out the ref. Sean runs out of the ring and he tells Vince McMahon he wants nothing to do with this match, he's leaving. HBK heads back up the ramp but Commissioner Slaughter greets him and Sean gets sent back to the ring. The Undertaker lifts Mike Chioda and he dumps him on top of Sean and The Undertaker delivers a big right hand that sends Sean crawling back up the ramp. HBK gets to the door of the In Your House set but there's no escape tonight, Taker delivers a press slam and Sean gets punched so hard that he rolls from the top of the ramp all the way down to the bottom. HBK gets his head whacked on the ring steps and the dead man chokes his opponent with some cords. Undertaker launches Sean into the guardrails and a punch sends HBK flying onto the French announce desk. It's absolute chaos in the ground zero main event as the dead man gets some payback for SummerSlam. The two get in the ring and Sean begs for mercy but he won't get any from the Undertaker. HBK gets taken out with a clothesline and keep in mind this match hasn't started yet. Taker drops a few elbows and he goes for the cover, he then remembers he dumped the referee out of the ring, so Taker decides to get up and continue beating the hell out of Shawn Michaels. HBK takes the flair corner bump just before Earl Hebner gets sent to ringside, Shawn begs for Hebner to disqualify the Undertaker, Earl tells Shawn to get his ass in the ring. Taker intimidates Hebner when the ref gets inside the ropes, Shawn takes advantage with a chop lock and the referee then calls for the bell to start the ground zero main event. Sean throws a ton of right hands before sending Taker into the turnbuckles, he then tries to land more punches in the corner but Taker pushes him off and Sean tries again. Taker then goes for a chokeslam but HBK finds a way out before going to the top rope. The dead man counters the attack and Sean gets sent to the outside with a hard clothesline. Taker punches Sean a few times before Michaels goes for a sunset flip but it gets countered with a chokehold. Taker dumps HBK to the mat before attacking in the corner. HBK gets sent to the opposite turnbuckles and he finds himself getting kicked high in the air by the dead man. Sean's little degenerate then gets smashed on the top rope and Taker makes sure Michaels won't be having any fun tonight before taking HBK down with another clothesline. Taker focuses on the wrist next, he goes for old school but payback's a bitch and Taker won't be letting anyone see his little grim reaper tonight. HBK hits a baseball slide, he goes for a plancha but Taker grabs him and Sean gets his back rammed into the ring post twice. Back in the ring, Taker begins focusing on the lower back, HBK takes a back body drop and look at how Sean lands on his arm here, Earl Hebner dashes over quickly to make sure there's no injuries. HBK replies with a swinging neckbreaker, he sails the back a little and Taker then sits up, Sean gets spooked and he gets out of the ring. HBK then grabs a steel chair but the plan doesn't work, Taker delivers a big boot before taking the chair himself, he raises it in the air but Earl Hebner tries to take it away and this leads to another referee bump. While the referee's down, Sean hits a running forearm and two diving elbow drops. And just as The Undertaker kicks out of Sean's cover, Rick Rude makes an appearance. Rude throws a pair of brass knucks to Sean and Taker gets clobbered, but the referee bumped again after The Undertaker's kick out so there's no one to count the pinfall. Rude leaves a little too early because HBK still hasn't won the match, so Triple H and China bring out another referee but Taker kicks out at two. Sean ends up punching Jack down so we've gone through three referees. Sean kicks Taker out of the ring and Triple H lays in a few right hands, China gets in on the action too and Taker bumps on the steps and Sean then decides to take out Erd Hebner again. This main event is completely breaking down and it's been really unpredictable and pretty entertaining too. Sean thinks he has it all figured out but The Undertaker fights back. Sean manages to clothesline Taker out of the ring where once again Triple H launches an attack. Taker can't get any advantage at all here when it's 3 on 1. HBK chokes The Undertaker while Hunter lays in the kicks. Sean and The Undertaker get back in the ring, HBK counters a tombstone attempt, Taker counters sweet chin music and Sean once again finds himself laid out on the top turnbuckle. Taker retrieves the brass knucks by digging deep into Sean's crotch. Yep. And Sean gets taken out with a big right hand. 
Taker covers Sean, Sean kicks out and Taker loses his temper and he chokeslams Earl Hebner. Hope these referees got a good bonus tonight. Taker hits Sean with his jumping clothesline, Tim White then hits the ring and he calls for the bell. Too much chaos, the match gets officially thrown out. Taker grabs Hunter from the apron and he chokeslams him onto a standing Shawn Michaels, but HBK is able to hit the super kick resulting in Taker getting tied up in the ropes. China brings a chair to Michaels but The Undertaker gets a boot up. The dead man then tries to fight Shawn and Hunter but again he can't do much damage. Officials hit the ring to try and stop the fight, Triple H takes a tombstone and then WWF superstars start filling up the ring. They try to hold The Undertaker back but the dead man dives over the top rope just to get at Shawn Michaels one last time. HBK, Triple H and China finally leave and they go back up the rampway as the match comes to an end. Taker stands in the ring looking exhausted after the fight and the show closes with the fans showing respect to The Undertaker. Just like Patriot vs Heart, I always had it in my head that this match wasn't all that great, but I enjoyed watching it again for this upload. It's absolute mayhem from start to end and it's not like a typical WWF main event of this era, but it's a whole lot of fun and what's more, Taker vs HBK would only get better in the weeks, months and even years that followed. A solid main event, a decent semi main event, the rest, uh, take it or leave it. Ground Zero shows us the World Wrestling Federation were continuing to improve on the pay per view front for sure though, as the company continues to evolve. They tried something different in the main event, I remember not being overly keen on the finish when it happened, but I can certainly appreciate it a whole lot more now when watching it back. Pillman vs Goldust was ok too, but I won't be in a rush to watch that triple threat match again anytime soon. Like many WWF pay per views of 1997, you gotta pick and choose which matches to watch here. If I had to choose only one to recommend, go straight for the main event. Join me next week for Reliving the War and we'll look at the fallout from Ground Zero. And next Sunday, we'll check out WCW's Fall Brawl 1997 show from Winston Salem, North Carolina. Thanks for watching today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and take care. WWF Bad Blood In Your House took place on October 5th 1997 in St. Louis, Missouri. Around 21,000 fans packed the Kiel Center to witness the first ever Hell in a Cell match between Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker and it was estimated around 168,000 fans bought the show on pay per view. Whoever wins tonight's Hell in a Cell match will go on to face WWF Champion Bret Hart at Survivor Series. And speaking of Bret Hart, the hitman and brother-in-law Davey Boy Smith take on the Patriot and Vader tonight in a flag match. Quick announcement guys, WWE has been coming at me for these pay per view reviews quite a bit and I'm fighting off claims quite often at the moment. It happened recently with Ground Zero and that video currently isn't available until I get word back from Big Vinny Mac. If you can't find a video on my channel that you know I made previously, it'll be free to view on Patreon. Ground Zero is currently on there and it's available to the public, so if you notice a pay per view review has disappeared then please jump over to Patreon and you don't need to sign up in order to view it, it's completely free. Ok so now that that's out of the way, let's look at the bad blood free for all before looking at the main show. Michael Cole is standing by Shawn Michaels locker room waiting for an interview while Doc Hendricks is waiting by the Hart Foundation's locker room. Sonny presents the free for all back in the arena and we haven't heard yet from Vince McMahon and that's because Vince is in the back with a very serious look on his face. Vince has an announcement to make here, Brian Pullman has passed away. He was found that day in his hotel room. Brian worked a live event the night before in St Paul, Minnesota and seeing as the World Wrestling Federation were only notified at 5pm the day of bad blood, there's no further information currently available. Brian was scheduled to wrestle Dude Love on this very show. 
We have watched Brian Pillman's Monday Night War run right up until this very point on reliving the war and yeah, everything they say about Brian Pillman was true. He was very unpredictable and that made him very fascinating. And that's not even including his ECW work after leaving World Championship Wrestling. Michael Cole walks into HBK's dressing room and that was a mistake. After getting pushed around by Rick Rude, China and Triple H, Cole gets brought to the showers where HBK puts the water on Michael and Cole doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. Cole said that Sean and Hunter made his life a living hell at the beginning of his WWF career and apparently none of this was planned. Rick Rude goes behind the curtain and you hear the sound of Cole getting smacked as Triple H takes over the interview. Sean says this is all the Undertaker's fault. It was he who started this rivalry with the Heartbreak Kid. Sean says everyone expects him to run and hide as China and Rude go back to do some more Tommy John Michael. And HBK says after tonight he's gonna be known as the man who brought down the Undertaker. HBK says he thinks he's covered everything and Triple H double checks by taking a look. Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation come out for an interview with Doc Hendricks and Bret says the Hart Foundation stands united. The Hearts are the strongest and most powerful force in the World Wrestling Federation and tonight Owen Hart walks right into enemy territory and he's gonna become the Intercontinental Champion once again. After that happens, Bret and the Bulldog take care of Vader and the Patriot. The Hearts are going into this flag match understanding that this one isn't in Canada but they still look forward to waving the maple leaf at the end of the bout. Owen says he's the the man who broke Steve Austin's neck. Owen doesn't care if Austin's in the arena because he's focused on the task at hand. And then the glass shatters. Austin appears on the big screen and he says Austin 316 means I just whooped your ass. Owen 316 means I just sucked your ass. Amazing. Austin says he'll take care of both Owen and Farouk tonight if he wants and no one will stop him. The pay-per-view opens up with a video detailing the HBK vs Undertaker feud so far. It's all about how Sean's been able to stay one step ahead of the dead man with the help of his buddies, but tonight Sean has no choice but to face the Undertaker all alone. We go to the arena, McMahon's taking his seat at the commentary table alongside JR and Jerry Lawler, and we go straight to our first match, The Nation vs The Legion of Doom and Ken Shamrock. As The Nation pose in the ring, Vince McMahon again lets fans know that Brian Pillman's passed away. The WWF will give more news if it becomes available but McMahon says that's unlikely. The Legion of Doom come down to the ring and JR announces that Ken Shamrock is not ready to compete. He's still injured from that spine buster he took on Raw and Hawk confirms that the LOD aren't backing out of this match. Hawk and Animal will take on D'Lo, Kama and Rocky Maivia in a 3 on 2 match. Hawk gets the best of D'Lo early on with a boot to the face and a clothesline, so Rocky Maivia tags in and the crowd begin chanting Rocky sucks. Rock leaves the ring out of protest as Hawk tags in Animal and Maivia takes a little time before getting inside the ropes. It was all going well for Rocky too, he got in a few kicks and punches before Animal fought back with a jumping shoulder block and a drop kick. The crowd boos again when Rock gets out of the ring and yeah, this is the Rocky Maivia show so far. Animal tries to pull Rocky's arm out of its socket before tagging Hawk back in and the match goes to the nation's corner where Kama gets tagged in. The crowd are still chanting Rocky sucks. Both Hawk and Kama no sell a double clothesline but Hawk's first to attack with an enziguri and there we are, the first chin lock of bad blood. In comes Animal and Kama takes a power slam. Rocky says nah mid and he jumps in to give Animal a DDT. Animal then gets tossed out of the ring where D'Lo and Rocky do even more damage and then D'Lo gets a chance to shine for a bit. That however doesn't last too long. Still, the nation keep Animal away from his corner and Maivia gets tagged back in. There's chin lock number 2 of bad blood, we're off to an amazing start guys. Animal gets to his feet but he's put straight back down with a knee to the midsection. Rocky lays in the boots in the corner and he chokes the road warrior with his boot and Rock decides to bait in Hawk, leading to the referee getting distracted and Animal getting punched in his little road warrior. Kama's back in and he misses a running corner attack. Animal tags in Hawk but the referee doesn't see it. The distraction allows D'Lo to hit the lowdown but Animal still kicks out. The audience is actually really getting into this one. 
Animal gets thrown into the ring steps as the referee still tries to keep Hawk under control. Rock and Animal go down after a double clothesline and then, finally, Hawk gets the tag. Rocky takes a big part slam and Dilo drops an elbow on his nation teammate inadvertently. Hawk hits Dilo with a neckbreaker and then Animal and Kama get in the ring. The Legion of Doom clear everyone out except Rocky Maivia. They signal for the Doomsday device, but Farouk then shows up to cause a distraction, allowing Dilo to clothesline Animal out of the ring and allowing Maivia to hit Hawk with a rock bottom. Thank god Rocky was using this instead of that shoulder breaker. The nation went at bad blood and it was a fun opening match. I think seeing LOD wrestling other people and not the Godwins all the time seriously helped this one. The Dude Love vs Brian Pillman match was scheduled next and McMahon again says Brian was found dead in his hotel room earlier today. McMahon offers his condolences to Brian's family and he says this next match is a replacement for Pillman vs Foley. McMahon reiterates that the WWF will pass on more information when it becomes available. I remember watching this and being incredibly bummed out about the news and it doesn't really sink in either until a few days later. Still, the classic WWF mantra is the show must go on, and Bad Blood moves forward with a replacement match. It's a minis tag team bout, Tarantula and Mosaic vs Max Mini and Nova. Nova wrestled not too long ago as Mr Lucky and before that he wrestled as Masquerita Sagrada. You know what they expect here really, Jerry Lawler got a bit of revenge for Max taking his crown at ground zero when Tarantula dropped Max on the announcers table. The king loved this by the way. Poor Max fell over too when trying to get his wits about him and Lawler continued to laugh at Max Mini every time he got hurt. What's Max gonna do? <laughs> Max is taken up by Tarantula. Like that, huh? The last arm drag was botched a little too, as was the three count, but you don't go into these matches caring all that much about the outcome. The baby faces win and Jerry Lawler can't believe it. It goes without saying that this is no replacement for Dude Love vs Brian Pillman. The tag team titles are on the line next when the Godwins, along with Uncle Cletus, challenge the headbangers. Mosh and Thrasher clear out the ring before the match gets underway. When both teams get to their corners, Phineas decides to spit in the air and catch it because why not? Mosh decides to do one better. He spits in the air and catches it in his mouth. Professional wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. Mosh sends Phineas out of the ring with a head scissors. Thrasher does something to Phineas on the outside, but the cameras don't catch it. And Mosh keeps the hog farmer from getting in the ring with a springboard clothesline. A double flapjack almost goes terribly wrong when Phineas tucks in his chin, and you can see the headbangers giving Phineas a few seconds and the referee confirms he's okay. This was pretty scary. As soon as he's back on his feet, Phineas tags out. You can also see he's in a rush to get out and recover. Henry takes over. The hog farmer talks smack the fans in attendance before going at it with Thrasher, but a dropkick sends the Godwin out of the ring. Phineas looks like he's good to go again, so he tags back in, and almost immediately he gets double teamed. The headbangers work well together here. Thrasher front suplexes Marsh right on top of Phineas, and Marsh then applies an arm bar. Henry gets a little payback for his tag team partner when he gets tagged back in, and McMahon comments on Thrasher's unique under attire. That dirty little shitbag Cletus helps Henry and Phineas, and things aren't looking so good for the tag team champions. After taking a clothesline from Cletus, Thrasher gets in the ring and Phineas hits multiple knee drops on the headbanger. Thrasher does eventually cover the hog farmer, but the referee was distracted and the crowd boos. Henry pulls off a nice wheelbarrow face buster that could have ended the match, but Thrasher gets up and the two collide into each other. Both men struggle to make it to their corners. The crowd remains relatively silent as Henry makes the tag and he cuts Thrasher off. Thrasher has no choice but to fight back, but he does well, and Phineas goes down after a back suplex. Mosh gets tagged in and he cleans house, even Cletus gets whacked. Thrasher power bombs his own tag team partner on top of Phineas, but Phineas kicks out. Mosh then goes for a seated senton from the top, but Phineas counters with a rough sit down power bomb. Cletus holds Thrasher back, and the Godwins win the WWF tag team titles for a second time. The Godwins and Cletus attack the headbangers after the match. We see an assisted slop drop and Uncle Cletus attacks the headbangers with his lucky horseshoe. Hard Finkel announces that the Godwins must leave or they'll be stripped of their newly won tag team titles. And after an argument with the Fink and Vince McMahon, the Godwins leave. I'm not so sure that fans were ready to see the headbangers drop the tag team belts, but there you go, Henry and Phineas are the new tag team champions.
The WWF want to honour a few names who made St. Louis the great wrestling city that it is. Jim Ross is going to introduce a few guys from the past and the fans will have a chance to show their appreciation. Gene Kaniski, who won the NWA Championship for the first time in St. Louis, is the first to come down to the ring. Jack Briscoe's next to be honoured thanks to his rivalry with Dory Funk Jr in St. Louis, and Dory Funk Jr is the next man out. 7 time NWA champion Harley Race gets honoured next, Terry Funk then comes out and he gets a great ovation too, Jim Ross calls Terry the original rattlesnake, and finally St. Louis native Sam Mushnick and Lou Thez get honoured. Mushnick was a sports writer in St. Louis and he began promoting shows in the region following World War II. He brought in all the top stars including all the superstars getting honoured tonight. Michael Cole says in the voiceover that Mushnick retired after making St. Louis the premier region for wrestling in the entire United States, and he'll be forever remembered as one of the greatest promoters in history. Commissioner Slaughter ordered Steve Austin to show up at Bad Blood and Stone Cold has to present the winner of the Intercontinental title tournament with the IC title. Austin's been on a rampage, stunning commentators, officials and even Vince McMahon himself, but it all comes to a head tomorrow night on Raw when Austin picks one of three options. He can bring in a doctor's note to say he can compete once again inside the ring, he can sign a waiver meaning the World Wrestling Federation aren't liable for any serious injuries he may sustain by coming back too soon, or he can leave the company. Before that happens though, he's gonna have to give the IC title to either Owen Hart or Farouk, it all depends on who wins the next match. Owen Hart says WWF officials must do their job tonight and keep Steve Austin away from the ring. All Austin should be doing tonight is handing the King of Hearts his Intercontinental Championship. Doc Hendricks says Farouk may have a trump card in Steve Austin, saying his Stone Cold seems hell bent on attacking Owen, but Farouk says this is nation business tonight, not horseman business, nation business. Farouk's gonna show everyone what the nation stands for by kicking Owen's ass tonight, and as for Steve Austin, he's just another name that doesn't mean anything to Farouk. Before the IC title match begins, Vince McMahon says there's an update regarding Brian Pillman that just came through. No foul play was suspected and it looks like a drug overdose ended Brian's life. Vince says it could be prescription or it could be recreational. McMahon says this is a problem in all sports and all forms of entertainment but things won't be made clear until toxicology reports have been completed in another 7 days. It's the part where Vince says it's a problem in all sports and all forms of entertainment that got people worked up, in a way it felt like McMahon was covering his ass but if you thought this was bad, just wait until Raw tomorrow night. McMahon says the passing of Brian Pillman could be currently affecting Owen as the King of Hearts isn't looking too excited tonight on his way to the ring. JR explains that Stu Hart was like a father to Pillman and this must weigh heavy on Owen's mind. After Farouk and Owen get in the ring, Steve Austin makes his entrance, holding the IC title he has to present to the winner. He flips Owen off before taking his spot right next to Sergeant Slaughter and he rings the bell to get the match underway. Austin then takes McMahon's headset. Alright, here we are, shut up! Here we are here in the Kill Center, St. Louis, Missouri. Owen shows Austin his Owen 316 shirt and Austin says this is nothing but cheap hate and he calls Owen a piece of trash. McMahon then gets his headset back and Austin watches on as Owen and Farouk go to work. Austin then takes Jerry Lawler's headset just for the fun of it. A shoulder block puts Owen down and Farouk dumps Owen on the mat after getting headlocked. Owen naturally blames it on Austin. Austin's on the security radio talking to someone as the match continues on. Hart slides under Farouk and he performs a spinning heel kick and Owen takes a page out of brother Brett's book by targeting the left leg and knee. Owen brings it down to the mat as Austin takes over the Spanish announce table. Hey, we got a good show going on here, right? You'd expect Austin to speak Spanish. Austin hears the word loco coming from Tito Santana and he wonders if Tito thinks he's crazy. Tito says just a little bit and Austin says he knows enough Spanish to know when someone's talking shit about him and Santana says they're amigos. Brilliant. As Owen continues the assault on Farouk's leg, Austin visits the French announce table. He says he doesn't speak French but he'll smack the French out of Ray Rougeau. He then orders Ray to tell the French speaking audience that Stone Cold's gonna appear at Survivor Series in Montreal next month. Farouk fights back and he delivers a backbreaker, it only scores a two count. He tries a leg drop from the second rope but he misses, Farouk then has to kick Owen away during a sharpshooter attempt and the King of Hearts takes a power slam before kicking out at two. 
Jim Neidhart then shows up to give Owen some moral support. He jumps on the apron as Farouk goes for a leapfrog body guillotine, but Owen moves out of the way. And then Steve Austin hits Farouk with the IC title. Slaughter was too busy with Jim Neidhart and he didn't see what happened. Confused, Owen pins Farouk and Owen wins the IC title for a second time just like that. The commentators don't know why Austin effectively helped Owen, but it's fairly obvious. Austin wants to beat Owen for the IC title. Farouk's pretty upset with the outcome, but there you go, Owen's the new IC champion, the match was pretty short, and Owen did it all by himself. Los Bariquas vs The DOA took place and I was just hoping to see a ton of rest holds here. Honestly, you just get kinda fed up with this gang war stuff and you just want to see some humour in the matches. This bout wasn't scheduled to take place either, McMahon and Ross confirmed they scrambled to put this match together, basically they were just trying to fill time due to the cancellation of Pillman vs Dude Love. The minis tag match and the IC title match didn't go on long at all, so this was put together just to extend the show and fill the promised 3 hours. With it being a 4 on 4 match, you can't imagine much rest holds going on. And no, spoke too soon, Jose won't let us down. Neither will Savio Vega. Miguel too? Fuck, why not? All this damage though did not help the Bariquas win the match, as Crush picked up the win for the dirty old assholes with a tilt the world backbreaker. Just skip this one, you don't need to watch it. Strangely, Jim Ross and Vince McMahon say Vader and the Patriot aren't doing so well today. Vader had a match against Ken Shamrock in Japan apparently, and Vader got effed up. Funny because they said earlier Shamrock couldn't compete due to that spinebuster. And as for the Patriot, apparently he has the flu. Vader did indeed have a match with Ken Shamrock in FMW, a match that Vader won. But the Patriot? Eh, not so sure if it was the flu or something else. He had knee and tricep problems that need fixed and he was also battling addiction, something Vince McMahon didn't know anything about, according to Del Wilkes anyway. He'd make a few shotgun appearances after this match and he wouldn't come back. He said the door was open for a return but he couldn't overcome his problems, opting instead to retire. With the Brian Pillman news also, you can't imagine Bret Hart and Davey Boy Smith being in the best of forms tonight, so you go into this one not as hyped as what you maybe were after Raw's war on Monday. Brett says he and Bulldog are going to set one more example tonight. He and Davey are better than any two Americans the World Wrestling Federation can put in front of them, and Davey says the only flag waving tonight is the Canadian flag. The Bulldog and the Hitman will be victorious in St. Louis. Check it out. Are going to be victorious tonight here in St. Louis. Right here. Vader says Brett calling himself the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be is a load of bullshit. He and the Patriot don't have a lot in common except they don't like big mouth Canadians talking bad about America. So the boys are going to win this one for the good old US of A. The match starts on the outside of the ring with the Patriot getting the better of Davey while Brett takes on Vader. Vader and the Hitman fight at the commentary desk. Eventually, the Hart Foundation begin using flags to do damage to their opponents, but Team America take those flags away, and Bulldog and Brett need to rethink their strategy here. Vader and Brett move to the entranceway where the Hitman gets pummeled and Davey gets choked out with Patriot's American flag. Brett and Davey get it together and Hart tells the fan to shut up before calling him a fucking idiot. Awesome. The bell then rings, his excellency and his devilancy take another few minutes on the outside, and we begin with Patriot and Bulldog inside the ropes. Davey takes a suplex and immediately Patriot decides to go for the stars and stripes. Brett stops Patriot from winning the match by punching him in his patriotic balls, but Patriot's right back up and he's delivering a hip toss to Davey. The Bulldog takes what could only be described as a wacky back body drop bump, and then Big Vader comes in to ruin Davey's day even more. Davey takes a clothesline and immediately he's like fuck this and he tags in Brett. Brett tries to go toe to toe with Vader but that does not work. Vader absolutely wrecks Brett in the corner and the crowd love it. But then we see some good teamwork from Brett and Davey and Vader goes down after a bulldog clothesline from the apron. Brett goes for the maple leaf but Vader punches his butt cheek stopping the hitman from going any further, and the hitman then falls victim to the Vader teabag. It can't get any worse for the Heart Foundation. Vader then pins Brett and the referee counts. Wait, the referee counts? Yeah, it was announced that pinfalls and submissions also count in this flag match, the excuse from Jim Ross being that Vader couldn't climb the flagpole. 
Anyway, Patriot and Davy get tagged in, and after delivering a dropkick and a body slam, Patriot again tries to retrieve his country's flag. Again, Brett stops the Patriot from the apron, and Patriot gets choked while the referee wasn't looking. Vader also stops Davy from grabbing the Canadian flag. Vader then comes back in to do some damage on Davy, and once again, it's Brett who has to stop his opponents from grabbing the flag. There's a bit of a timing issue when Davy pins Vader, and the referee's too busy talking to the Patriot, but the match continues on. On, and yeah, it's been a little messy so far, but not terrible. Only one thing could make it better. Davy Boy Smith Chenlock. Five star classic. I love this match. Brett comes in and Vader takes a back suplex. Brett locks in the sharpshooter, but the Patriot runs in and Brett breaks the hold after a few shots to the head. Big Vader then goes for the sharpshooter, but Davy's having none of it. Patriot comes in illegally and Vader gets out of the ring, and Brett finds himself in a figure four. Brett tags Davy while in the hold and Patriot gets booted in the face. We see the vertical suplex from Davy Boy Smith. Patriot then makes another unsuccessful attempt at grabbing the stars and stripes, and Brett makes the Patriot pay after tagging in. Hart delivers a suplex and he goes for the maple leaf. Vader picks Brett up like a baby and he says, Not today, champ. Vader and Davy are now the legal men and Vader goes all the way up for a Vader salt. He almost lands clean on his feet when Davy dodges the aerial attack. Some impressive stuff here. Vader takes it out on Davy though by sending him out of the ring. And on the outside, Brett and Davy attack Vader and Brett grabs the ring bell. The hitman takes care of the Patriot before whacking Vader. But back in the ring, the big man shakes it off and a double clothesline sends the Heart Foundation to the mat. Vader tags in the Patriot. Brett's now the legal man on Team Canada. And Brett takes the <sighs> uncle slam that could have ended the match if it wasn't for Davy coming in to break the cover. A fan then hits the ring and Mike Yoda keeps him away from Brett and Patriot while Davy gets a kick in for good measure. It's not quite a more current his front face lock moment, but still, Kyoto didn't hesitate for a single moment. Vader hits the Vader bomb on Brett, but Vader is not the legal man. He rolls out of the ring where Davy greets him by slamming his head on the steps. Inside the ring, Brett counters a Patriot roll up. He grabs the tights, and the Heart Foundation win via pinfall. Patriot, being the big sore loser he is, attacks Brett after the bell. Brett and Davy escape the ring though, and Brett's music plays in the arena. The hitman grabs an American flag and he tosses it away. The crowd boos, and yeah, I've got mixed feelings about this match. It's not a bad bout at all, but it's maybe not a good Bret Hart match, if that makes sense. It's fun, but not as good as Bret vs Taker at one night only. The Hell in a Cell begins luring for the first time ever on pay per view. This all began at SummerSlam when Sean inadvertently hit The Undertaker with a steel chair, costing him the WWF title. Michaels turned heel shortly afterwards and he formed an alliance with Triple H in China. Sean also got himself some insurance in the form of one ravishing Rick Rude, and this team have managed to stay one step ahead of The Undertaker with a series of attacks. These two wrestled at ground zero in a fun yet chaotic match. Too many run-ins, too much outside interference. In order to stop Sean getting any help this time around though, he and the Phenom will wrestle inside a cage that has a roof. The structure we're about to see is the original Hell in a Cell. The winner of this match faces Bret Hart at Survivor Series 1997 in Montreal, so fans are expecting either a SummerSlam 97 rematch taking place on pay per view once again, or the long awaited Shawn Michaels vs Bret Hart WrestleMania 12 rematch. Either way, this was an extremely exciting time for WWF fans, and the unpredictability of it all had fans hooked. Doc Hendricks interviews Shawn Michaels, and HBK says there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is Shawn's coveted European title is not not on the line in this main event match. The bad news, however, is that Sean's stepping inside a 15 foot high steel cage. Sean tells his boys he's doing this one on his own. No one can get in after the door locks, and it's thanks to Sean's wonderful athletic ability, the fact that he's the man, and the fact that he's the showstopper, the icon, the main event, these are the only things that'll get him through this next matchup. Sean says there's nobody crazy enough to do this gig except the Heartbreak Kid, and Sean's prepared to show everyone why he's the number one guy in the wrestling business today by entering Hell in a Cell with The Undertaker. Before the match gets underway, Sergeant Slaughter and Earl Hebner make sure no one's hiding under the ring. 
The commissioner confirms there's no one there, and he orders the sale to lower further. HBK's out first and he's brought his buddies, though these guys won't be allowed to stick around. There's a lot of bravado as usual with Sean's entrance and McMahon wonders if this is gonna change once the dead man hits the ring, and boy does it ever. I've covered this match before, and one thing that I think makes this so good is how Sean reacts to getting locked inside the cell. The Undertaker makes his entrance, he makes the lights come on inside the arena, and that bravado completely leaves HBK. The storytelling is incredible before the match even begins. Shawn Michaels, the cocky asshole, realises in that very moment what he got himself into. Not too long ago, he said his wonderful athletic ability will see him through this, and the fact that he's the icon in the show stopper is more than enough to survive hell in a cell, but he becomes the walking embodiment of an anxiety attack and he just wants to leave. The fight or flight response kicks in when Sean comes face to face with the reaper and Sean doesn't want to do this anymore. The cell itself is now a real part of this match without any physicality happening inside it. It's fucking awesome work. Undertaker stalks Sean around the ring and HBK shouts at Vince that this is all his fault. Sean tries to bait the Undertaker into the ring but he takes a big boot and Sean's in trouble already. HBK bumps around the ring as the Undertaker remains slow and methodical. The dead man's gonna enjoy this. The Phenom goes for the choke slam and Sean realizes he has to fight back, so he starts throwing some right hands and he stuns the Undertaker. HBK gets a few more in in the corner, but the Undertaker launches the European Champion into the opposite corner and Sean hits the mat hard after a clothesline. Undertaker softens up the shoulder before hitting Michaels with old school. Sean gets choked with the Undertaker's boot, and the Undertaker delivers a body slam followed by a leg drop. Michaels kicks out of the follow-up pin, showing us he's not prepared to give up a chance at the World Wrestling Federation title, even if it means going through hell with The Undertaker. Sean's feet touch the cage roof during a back body drop. The Undertaker stops Michaels from mounting any kind of comeback with a few right hands, and then Taker throws Sean out of the ring. The cell is now going to be used as a weapon. Taker lifts Sean up in the air with a chokehold. Sean sticks his thumb in The Undertaker's eye, but the dead man shakes it off. HBK tries to escape, but there's nowhere to go. So Taker pulls Sean down from the cage panel, and The Undertaker decides to launch Sean into the cell before hitting another clothesline. This happens twice, as Jim Ross says The Undertaker is in absolutely no hurry tonight. He's gonna make Sean pay. Taker goes for a power bomb in the corner. Sean grabs the cage and he punches Taker over and over again. But it does no damage at all and Sean gets rammed into the corner of the cell. HBK's in a bad way as Taker picks him up. The Phenom lays in a few body shots and Sean gets rammed from the ring post of the cell corner over and over. The Phenom takes a moment to think about what he's gonna do next. He scoops HBK up on his shoulder but Sean counters it and Taker goes into the cell. But still, Taker shrugs it off and Sean gets mowed down again. Michaels hasn't been destroyed this badly ever in his career and the commentators say Sean really is in hell right now. Desperation takes over, Sean dodges another attack at the cage panel and all he can do is fall down to his knees and throw right hands over and over again. The crowd boos as The Undertaker has been stopped for the first time in this match. Michaels then gets in the ring, hoping to keep his advantage when Taker tries to follow him, but Sean gets his neck snapped on the top rope and he's back to square one. Taker tries to step inside the ring, but Michaels runs at him and Taker goes into the cell. A dive through the middle rope helps keep The Undertaker down, and Sean climbs the cell before dropping an elbow on the dead man. The athletic ability Sean mentioned earlier continues to come into play with a diving clothesline from the apron to the outside and Michaels then decides it's time to do some serious damage with the ring steps. The Phenom gets hit twice across the back as Michaels is feeling a lot more confident now. He brings The Undertaker to the base of the steps and Shawn Michaels delivers a pile driver. Sean grabs a chair, it was a chair that started all this in the first place, and The Undertaker takes a shot across the back. Sean lines up another and the dead man takes another chair shot. Sean believes he's done enough damage, but The Undertaker kicks out at two. Taker then gets tied up in the ropes, giving HBK a few free shots, but a big boot stops Michaels in his tracks and Sean takes a back body drop. HBK flies out of the ring and he falls on a cameraman, and that poor cameraman takes a kicking from the heartbreak kid. 
Sean grabs the cameraman and he throws him right beside the cage door, and back in the ring the Undertaker is kept at bay with a flying forearm. Michaels hits the diving elbow as Commissioner Slaughter comes down to the ring, he wants to get the cage door open so that cameraman can get out. Michaels then hits sweet chin music, the dead man sits up, and HBK sees that the doors opened up and he makes a run for it. The Undertaker follows Michaels, and Sean made a big mistake here. Michaels gets catapulted into the cell and he's a bloody mess afterwards. Undertaker makes sure the damage is done by repeatedly ramming Sean's head into the cell panel, and all Sean can do is hit a low blow to stop the onslaught just for a moment. HBK then tries to climb the cell and he gets to the top. The Undertaker follows him and both men are now going to fight on top of the Hell in a Cell structure. The cameraman in the ring can be heard swearing as blood drips on his camera after Taker delivers a backdrop. And I remember watching this thinking that cage roof isn't going to hold those guys for very long. The way it bends is fucking nerve wracking. Taker lifts Sean up and he delivers a press slam as Lawler says the steel girders are going to break at any moment. Sean takes a right hand that sends him to the edge of the cage. He tries to climb down but the Undertaker catches him. Sean's just holding on with his fingertips right now. And then… In hindsight we naturally compare this to the McFoley Hell in a Cell fall, and yeah the Mankind fall was way more shocking but when this happened and when you had nothing else to compare it to, it was insane. That has to be the match over right, there's no coming back from this one. Sean has been destroyed, it's time for the Undertaker to put an end to it and go on to Survivor Series to face the Hitman. Well Taker isn't done just yet, HBK gets thrown on the French announce table, he gets slammed on the broken Spanish table. Jerry Lawler begs for someone to stop the match as Sean tries to get to his feet. Taker brings Sean back inside the cell, the crowd cheers, and the door gets locked again. A big clothesline puts Sean back on the mat. The Undertaker then sets Sean up on the top rope, and the dead man delivers a super choke slam. The Undertaker then grabs a chair, it's time for some true revenge. Taker lines one up and. The Undertaker then signals for the end as the crowd continues to cheer. One tombstone and that's it all over, but the lights go down in the arena. A monster of a man wearing a mask comes down to the ring and Paul Bearer walks behind him. Vince McMahon gives one of his most memorable calls when he says that's gotta be Kane, and that's indeed who it was. The Undertaker's little brother has arrived in the World Wrestling Federation, and he starts his path of destruction by ripping the cell door off its hinges before taking care of Earl Hebner. Paul Bearer hadn't mentioned Kane in weeks, and at this very moment Kane would have been the last person on anyone's mind, but he's arrived as Paul Bearer promised and the Undertaker's in shock. The brothers look at each other, the Undertaker seems frozen, Kane raises his arms and flames fill the ring, and then the Undertaker gets tombstoned by his little brother. The Undertaker wasn't the only one in shock, the crowd doesn't know what to make of this. Kane leaves as Shawn Michaels literally crawls out of a pool of his own blood. HBK covers The Undertaker and Shawn Michaels wins via pinfall. Helmsley and China come down to get Shawn out of the cell. Shawn's an absolute mess, he can't walk on his own, his face is absolutely covered. But HBK survived Hell in a Cell and it was all thanks to The Undertaker's brother. Michaels vs Bret Hart is now official for Survivor Series, and The Undertaker meanwhile has a big problem on his hands. Bad Blood started off pretty well with LOD vs The Nation, from there it's a real mixed bag which was pretty standard for WWF pay per views in 1997, but that main event was an all time classic, nothing but good things to say about the first Hell in a Cell match and still to this day, it's my favourite cell match the WWF or WWE ever put on. The Kane debut at the end was also done really really well, there were small teases during promotional videos but the WWF had teased the Kane debut a lot more heavily after Taker won the belt back at Wrestlemania. From Summerslam onwards it wasn't brought up all that often, and it made the debut at Hell in a Cell all the more shocking. He looked great too, and yeah it didn't take fans long to work out it was Isaac Yankum in there, but the Kane character worked out so well that fans bought in and they accepted the gimmick. Even without the big debut, the match was still incredible and as mentioned the storytelling was absolutely on point. Not only one of the WWF's best matches of 1997, but in my opinion one of their best matches of all time. 
time. So, Sean and Hunter now go to war with Brett, Steve Austin's coming after Owen, and The Undertaker now has to figure out what to do about his little brother. You'll probably want to tune in to Reliving the War next week to see what happens next. I hope you enjoyed this one guys, let me know your thoughts on bad blood in your house, and I'll hopefully see you again next Thursday. Survivor Series 97 happened on November 9th in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Around 20,000 fans attended the show in the Molson Centre while a quarter million homes bought the show on pay-per-view, making it the most successful WWF pay-per-view of 1997. Fans were tuning in to see a match that was a year and a half in the making, WWF Champion Bret Hart vs Shawn Michaels. Fans were also eager to see the in-ring return of Steve Austin, Stone Cold vs Owen Hart for the IC title happens in Montreal, and the Kane character makes his in-ring debut with a match against Mankind. We've also got a few traditional Survivor Series matches to look at. There's there's a lot to talk about in today's video, so let's get straight to the pay-per-view. This is the infamous Survivor Series 97 show from Montreal. We start off with a traditional Survivor Series match, the Headbangers and the New Blackjacks taking on the Godwins and the team of Billy Gunn and Jesse James. It's a curious mix of teams here with practically no one having anything in common at all except for the fact that Gunn and James smashed a boombox over Thrasher's head and they stole the Blackjacks' sick cowboy hats. Gunn and James were the team to watch here, they were the ones who had something a little interesting going on on Monday nights. The big boys go to work first, the new Blackjacks and the Godwins duke it out and it leads to Henry getting eliminated by Bradshaw. Phineas then eliminated Barry Windham after nailing a lariat. Mosh came in and he slowed the match down with an armbar and the crowd booed loudly when Billy Gunn got tagged in, showing us that these outlaws were doing something right. The audience then chant the F slur at Billy Gunn and I'll get this out of the way now. This audience was absolutely relentless when it came to this kind of thing, and you're gonna notice it too with signs in the crowd. It gets a bit more crazy during the main event, but yeah, you're gonna see some crazy signs during this video. Gunn countered a bulldog with a face first slam and that was enough to eliminate Mosh. Thrasher and Phineas then went to work and that ended with Phineas getting eliminated after a seated senton, so we have James and Gunn versus Bradshaw and Thrasher. Bradshaw chopped the shit out of Road Dog and James takes a gut wrench powerbomb. Gunn then distracted Bradshaw and this allowed James to perform a schoolboy pin. Bradshaw seemingly kicked out just before 3 but the ref says he's out. He gets up and he nails James and Gunn with hard clotheslines. And so the heel team now have a 2 on 1 advantage, an advantage that Thrasher couldn't overcome. Billy Gunn gets a blind tag and he comes in with a leg drop, he missed by a mile here but that's how it ended. Gunn and James are the survivors of our first Survivor Series match of the evening. This wasn't great but it's not the worst Survivor Series match of the night, that one's up next when the DOA take on the Truth Commission. The gang wars on WWF have gotten quite a lot of TV time as of late and feuding factions was the overall theme for Survivor Series 97. The show was given the tagline, gang rules or gang rules? <laughs> But my god, was this stuff already getting repetitive by the time Survivor Series came around? Los Bariquas are not featured on the show however, but we do have the Nation of Domination competing a little later on. Chains was the first guy eliminated after a sidewalk slam from the interrogator. The Jackal Don Callis, the leader of the commission, was the second man eliminated after another sidewalk slam though this time it was from 8ball. Callis went on commentary as Recon fell on his ass in the middle of the ring. Recon then fell victim to an 8-ball and skull switcheroo and he too got eliminated. 
so the DOA had three guys while the Commission had Sniper Elite and the Interrogator. It then became two on two after a bulldog from Sniper. Sniper was actually from Montreal but the audience couldn't have cared less. The DOA then did everything they could to stop Sniper from tagging in the big man, but the dirty old assholes got caught out with a blind tag. We see another sidewalk slam and this leads to Crush being all alone against two guys. Crush did manage to eliminate Sniper with a tilt toward word power slam but the interrogator came into the ring immediately afterwards with, you guessed it, another sidewalk slam. The interrogator wins it for the truth commission and nobody cared. Not a single person cared. Fans are getting questioned outside about who's gonna win tonight, Sean or Brett. Some fans think that Sean should go back to the United States because he has no chance of winning the WWF title tonight. Others think Brett's going down at the hands of HBK and D-Generation X. Our guy here though, he knows what's up. He says even though he wants Brett to win, Sean's gonna end up becoming a three-time champion tonight. Steve Austin's in the AOL room answering some online questions. It's a dressing room with two creeps typing away on their state-of-the-art laptops. And Austin's pretty honest when he tells Kevin Kelly that he is worried about his neck tonight but he also doesn't care. You gotta live with these things and go on. Stone Cold wants nobody to feel sorry for him because these are things that just happen. Up next we've got the Team USA vs Team Canada Survivor Series match. The Patriot was replaced by some j who jumped the guardrail on Raw. And that j Brown is none other than Steve motherfucking Blackman. Check out Vader's delayed reaction at the beginning of the Team USA promo. Threat. Vader. Vader introduces the team. Goldust dropped Marlena like a bad habit and he now has FU painted on his face. Edgy. Mark Merrill's here and he too's having some woman troubles with Sable stealing his spotlight. But newcomer Steve Blackman has zero trouble with the ladies. Guy's an absolute dreamboat. Vader says this team only has one thing in common, they don't like big mouth Canadians trash talking Americans. Steve motherfucking Blackman says he's not experienced in WWF rings but he's experienced in fighting. A fight's a fight to Steve Blackman so he's ready to go. Merrill and Goldust don't get any interview time, the boys make their way down to the ring and Jim Ross says the FU on Goldust's face stands for Forever Unchained, that clears that up. Bulldog says Team USA is now in enemy territory and Team Canada are going to be victorious. Doug Furness says he was once proud to be an American but not anymore. They say America love it or leave it. Well, Doug Furness left. Jim Neidhart and Phil LaFawn aren't allowed to speak. Team Canada get a great ovation during their entrance. They come out to Brett's theme and you can see the Canadian flags go up instantly as soon as that opening guitar screech plays in the arena. We start with the Bulldog and Mark Merrow and Merrow throws his Stars and Stripes bandana at Davey. Davey wipes his ass with it and he throws it at Sable. She catches it too and she'll treasure that item for the rest of her life. After drop kicking Merrow out of the ring, Davey taunts Steve Blackman. I love how Steve just doesn't know where to look here. The crowd chants for Sable and Merrow moves Sable away from some pervy fans before tagging in Vader. Davey takes a clothesline but he counters Vader's second rope attack with a body slam and he only goes and delivers a vertical suplex on Vader in the middle of the ring. He tags in Phil LaFon afterwards but you can tell Davey was in his element here. His mood would quickly change by the end of the show though. Mero comes back in and he finds himself in the wrong corner. The crowd goes nuts as Team Canada take Mark out. But then Steve Blackman gets tagged in and it's time for greatness. Steve hits an axe kick, he snaps LaFon's neck on the top rope and he lands a running elbow drop that only gets him a two count. Steve then gets welcomed to the WWF with a DDT and he comes back with a, a, a running double palm strike to the chest. He then shows why they call him the lethal weapon by taking out all of Team Canada by himself but he gets himself counted out. He fights with Team Canada on the outside but Phil LaFon got back in the ring and the ref sends Blackman back to the dressing room. Team Canada now have the advantage but they don't keep it for too long. Big boys Vader and Jim Neidhart go to work and the anvil gets eliminated after a running splash. LaFon gets back inside the ropes and he knocks Vader to the outside with a spinning wheel kick. Vader gets thrown into the ring steps and Doug Furness gets in a few cheap shots. All this though isn't enough to stop the big man from eliminating LaFon with a middle rope splash. Mark Merrow and Doug Furness then get in the ring and Furness tries to catch Merrow during a moonsault but it doesn't work out too well. It looks like it done a bit of damage to Furness too because he tags out immediately after hitting a spine buster and you can hear Davey asking him if he's okay. Remember Doug was involved in a car accident and according to reports he suffered a broken shoulder blade though I'm unsure what side it was on. 
Davy comes in to save the day, he goes for a running power slam but Mero counters and the bulldog takes a big right hand, Furness gets tagged back in, he manages to eliminate Mark Mero and it looks like he's fine after that moonsault, thankfully. Vader and Bulldog then do a little work but there's one guy who's yet to compete in this match and that's Goldust. He's complaining about having a broken hand and he refuses to tag in. This happens frequently as Vader gets forced to deal with Furnace and Bulldog all alone but finally Vader loses it and he tags in Goldust by slapping him across the face. Goldust isn't prepared to wrestle tonight so he leaves the ring and he gets himself counted out. The match ends with Vader eliminating Furnace with a Vader bomb but our main man Davey grabs the ring bell. Vader gets clocked behind both referees backs, that's just how good Davey was, and the Bulldog wins it for Team Canada. A great send off for the British Bulldog who, without a doubt, gave us a ton of entertainment during this WWF run on Reliving the War. No chin locks here either, showing us all that Davey overcame his demons in the end and he was able to ride off into the sunset a true hero. Kane appeared at Bad Blood and he dropped The Undertaker with a tombstone pile driver. Taker said on Raw he would never fight his own flesh and blood but his little brother won't accept no for an answer. Kane's went on a path of destruction led by Paul Bear and that path goes through every WWF superstar until Kane finally reaches his big brother and The Undertaker will have no choice but to fight. Dude Love was taken out by Kane with two choke slams on the Raw's War Rampway and Mick Foley decided to bring in his Mankind persona to get a little payback. This is the Kane character's first televised match and Foley says before the bout that fans shouldn't expect a wrestling match tonight. This is Mankind vs a brick wall. Common sense says you walk around or climb over a brick wall but that's not Mankind's way. Mankind will launch himself into that brick wall over and over again. Foley wants to get his hands on Paul Bear after the match after Paul called him a pebble on the path of destruction and Mankind says Paul's gonna regret saying those words if Foley can knock that wall down. The competitors make their entrances and look at how good Kane looked during his early days in the company. Mankind launches an attack as the big red machine makes his way to the ring but that doesn't work out too well. Foley gets thrown into the ring steps twice before the match begins and those red lights are going to stay on throughout the entire bout. Kane's pyro goes off just as the bell rings and Mankind is already at a severe disadvantage. A few clubbing blows to the back seems to wake Foley up and Kane takes a few punches but he also lands on his feet just like the Undertaker when Foley clotheslines him over the top rope. On the outside, Kane fucking launches the ring steps at Mankind before Foley gets thrown back inside the ropes. It's all strikes here from Kane and in the middle of taking this beating, Mankind begins ripping his own hair out. He keeps coming back and hitting that brick wall though and Paul Bear really likes what he sees. Mankind gets punched and choked in the corner and Kane pulls off a sidewalk slam before booting Foley in the face. They go outside again and it's becoming more and more apparent that Foley doesn't have a hope in hell here. But then Foley surprises everyone by dropping Kane on the ring steps. The crowd pops as Jim Ross says Kane looks stunned and maybe he's now a little more vulnerable. Foley hits Kane with a steel chair and back inside the ring he delivers a pile driver. He signals for the mandible claw but he doesn't give it to Kane. Paul Bear takes Mankind's finisher but this was maybe a mistake because the devil's favourite demon wakes up and with one hand he launches Mankind into the Spanish announce table. Absolute chaos at Survivor Series and the fans are enjoying this one so far. Mankind crawls away and the two end up at the bottom of the entranceway. Foley hits a low blow followed by a DDT. We then see a little Cactus Jack when Foley dives off the apron with an elbow smash. He tries another high risk attack but Kane leaps onto the apron and he throws Foley off the second turnbuckle straight to the outside. And that's gonna be the end of our match. Kane gets back in the ring and Foley crawls over. He won't give up so Kane puts him out of his misery with a tombstone pile driver. A dominating performance from the big red machine and they put this one together the right way. The little glimmers of hope against a truly unstoppable monster made the match way more interesting. Who's next on this path of destruction and when will The Undertaker come face to face with his little brother again? Maybe we'll find out tomorrow night on Raw. Michael Cole interviews Sergeant Slaughter and Vince McMahon. McMahon isn't calling the action tonight of course. 
Slaughter says there's extra security in place tonight as things are tense backstage. McMahon says it's important that fans get to see this Brett vs Sean match. The bout was booked numerous times and it didn't happen. And Vince hopes nothing happens between the two men before the match takes place so fans all around the world can finally see this main event between two of the WWF's biggest superstars. Michael Cole asks Vince who's gonna win tonight and McMahon says he doesn't know. We've got the final traditional Survivor Series match of the night, the Nation of Domination vs the Legion of Doom, Ken Shamrock and Ahmed Johnson. Shamrock and the LOD have had each other's backs as of late and Ahmed's been having issues with the Nation since the dawn of time. Rocky Maivia has been the one to watch recently though over on the heel team with fans responding to Maivia way more than any other member of the Nation. Even if it was still all negative, he was definitely the man getting the most heat for the faction. Speaking of Rocky, he gets the first elimination by hitting Road Warrior Hawk with a rock bottom. Shortly afterwards, Ahmed Johnson and Farouk got in the ring and surprisingly, Farouk gets eliminated after taking apart River Plunge. Ahmed may have fallen on his ass when countering the Dominator but he still hit his finisher on the nation's leader and now it's time to see how the nation fares without their top dog. D'Lo was in next and check this out, Johnson doesn't react to D'Lo's punches at all, it doesn't even look like he's purposely no selling, it just looks shit. Rocky comes back in after Ahmed takes care of D'Lo, Farouk holds Ahmed's feet after tripping the big man up and look, the referee on the outside sees it all happen yet Ahmed still gets a eliminated. Even Jim Ross can't believe this. Ahmed and Farouk fight at the entranceway before going back to the locker room. We've now got Ken Shamrock and Road Warrior Animal against Rocky, Kama and D'Lo. The crowd chants Rocky sucks as Road Warrior Animal and Ken Shamrock do a number on the future people's champ but Maivia tags out and Kama comes in. Animal counters a front face lock before both he and Kama crash into each other with a double clothesline. When the two get back to their feet, Animal eventually puts Kama down with a jumping shoulder block but the fans don't really care. They're too busy chanting Rocky sucks. Kama celebrates with Rocky after nailing Animal with a hook kick but he really should have paid more attention to his opponent. Animal's able to knock Kama into Maivia and score the pinfall, so now it's two on two. We think Shamrock's got it all under control with when he and D'Lo resume the match but some underhanded tactics from the nation result in Shamrock getting his little world's most dangerous man smashed in. Remember guys, two referees. D'Lo applies a chin lock as the quest for the next reliving the war chin lock king continues on. Shamrock fights out but he takes a knee to the gut and D'Lo misses a second rope moonsault that would have looked great if it connected. D'Lo and Shamrock tag out but then Road Dog and Billy Gunn show up wearing the LOD shoulder pads that they stole on Raw's war. Rocky sends Animal to the outside. Animal fights with James and Gunn but Road Dog throws some white powder straight from Sean's fanny pack in Animal's face and the Road Warrior gets counted out. Gunn and James laugh on their way back up the entranceway and so Shamrock has to try and beat two members of the nation. Ken breaks through a double clothesline and he takes out both Rocky and D'Lo. D'Lo then gets nailed with a belly to belly suplex and he taps out of the ankle lock. Rocky grabbed a chair while D'Lo was in Shamrock's finishing hold and Maivia takes Shamrock out as the referees get D'Lo out of the ring. Rock covers Shamrock, Shamrock kicks out and Rocky can't believe it. He brings Ken to the corner and he lays in the punches and kicks but Shamrock isn't done yet. Ken fights back but he ends up taking the float over DDT. Rocky covers Shamrock again and again Shamrock kicks out. They have got the crowd on their feet and Rocky's reactions are brilliant. Rock then slams Shamrock to the mat, he removes his elbow pad which he hadn't done before on Raw and he delivers the people's elbow, a move that we have seen before but keep in mind the move didn't have its classic name yet. Maivia goes for another float over DDT but Shamrock counters with a modified northern light suplex. He then performs a frankensteiner and Shamrock gets in his zone before applying the ankle lock. Rocky has no choice but to tap out and the nation lose this Survivor Series match. Shamrock and Rocky got the crowd making the most noise of the night so far. It was a great night for both guys with Rocky still looking good even in defeat. If this was going to be the future of the World Wrestling Federation then things weren't looking too bad at all. 
a video players that would become iconic in the world of pro wrestling, but it was confusing back in 1997 for the first few seconds. D Generation X's theme music plays for the first time as footage of the group gets mixed in with a load of other footage, from helicopters to police cars to pole dancers, all pieces of footage the WWF have used previously, but it all comes together here to form an excellent entrance video, and the D Generation X theme itself is simply a classic. This video though is for the next In Your House event. DX are getting their own pay-per-view show, and it looks like no lessons were learned from the ill-fated NWO sold-out fiasco in January, but there you have it. I do remember seeing this live and thinking to myself, well, that's a dead giveaway, HBK's winning tonight's main event. The IC title match is up next, and this one's all about Steve Austin getting revenge for what happened at SummerSlam. Austin suffered a severe neck injury when he took a pile driver from Owen Hart and he was forced to give up the Intercontinental Championship, while also being forced to contemplate what to do next with his career. Austin, legitimately, was worried about losing all his momentum by staying out of the ring, so he's maybe coming back a little too soon here to face Owen Hart at Survivor Series. Austin helped Owen win the IC title tournament that was held when the championship got vacated, and he's also helped Owen during subsequent title defenses. Austin didn't want Owen to lose that championship, the only person beating Hart for the IC title would be the Texas Rattlesnake. In storyline, Austin signed a new contract that would stop him from suing the World Wrestling Federation if he were to get seriously injured, and he only agreed to sign it if this match in Montreal was also set in stone, so here we are. The Stone Cold we once knew is now gone. Austin changes his ring style after the neck injury and you'll see what I mean if you watch this match back. He had a pane of glass set up at the entranceway that didn't completely break though, so that sucked, but the Canadian audience still couldn't help cheering for Austin and Stone Cold had his fair share of fans in Montreal. Owen comes to the ring with Team Canada and Owen gets a great reaction too. Just like on Raw's War, Jim Ross calls Owen the real hitman after what he did to Austin at SummerSlam, and it does make you wonder what the initial plans were for Owen and all of Team Canada, plans that probably weren't met due to what happens in tonight's main event. There's a fair bit of time wasting at the start of this one, and the match isn't going to go long either due to Austin's health. The Anvil tries a sneak attack and he takes a Stone Cold Stunner, but this allows Owen to jump into the ring and launch an attack. The crowd chanted break his neck as Owen went on offense, but this just fired Austin up more, and Owen gets destroyed in the corner. Owen then goes for the pile driver and the crowd pops, but Austin counters with a backdrop. Owen goes to the outside where he's able to wrap Austin's leg around the ring post. He then notices Team Canada getting sent to the back, so so Owen too tries to leave the match. Austin gives chase, he takes Owen out. Stone Cold stays on offense all the way back to the ring, but Owen slides out again. He clearly wants no part of this match. Still, the IC champion hits a low blow and this finally gives him a chance to go on offense again. Austin gets his head slammed on the broken Spanish announce table and Owen rakes Austin's face. Stone Cold gets choked with some cord, the referee screams at Owen to knock it off, and when the two get back in the ring, Owen stays on Austin by again raking the face, but all this isn't enough. Austin throws Owen in the corner and he stomps a mud hole in him. They go through the same SummerSlam piledriver setup, but there's no piledriver this time around, just a Stone Cold stunner that leads to Austin winning the Intercontinental Championship. Furnace and Lafon take Stone Cold Stunners too when they hit the ring after the bell. And that's it, Stone Cold is IC Champion once again. This new brawler style of Steve Austin is what fans would have to become accustomed to, but it certainly didn't come to any detriment to Austin's popularity. Quite fittingly, right after this match, the WWF aired their first ever Attitude promo video. It's all about how people look at wrestlers and how wrestling isn't real, yet some of the guys have legit athletic backgrounds, and the guys also go through severe injuries while performing in the ring. It ends with Bret Hart saying, try lacing my boots, and then the Scratch logo gets revealed for the very first time. Bret Hart agreed to sign with World Championship Wrestling when Vince McMahon informed him that he could no longer commit to Hart's 20-year WWF contract. It's been said that McMahon wanted to cut down on long-term investments as he hoped to make his company public, and with World Championship Wrestling destroying the WWF and the TV ratings, the company wasn't in the financial position it had once forecasted. Whatever the case, Bret Hart was unaffordable, and Bret decided to sign with WCW while still holding the WWF Championship. 
Vince wanted Bret to drop the title to Shawn at Survivor Series and Bret said he wouldn't do it. Tensions were already seriously high between Bret and Shawn before this match was booked and the straw that broke the camel's back was when Shawn told Bret he wouldn't put him over after Bret said he'd be willing to lose to Shawn during a conversation both men had before Bret agreed to sign with World Championship Wrestling. I said I just want you to know that I have no problem putting you over. Shawn looked me in the eye and said I appreciate that but I just want you to know that I'm not willing to do the same thing for you. When Sean made this remark, Brett said there's no way he'd ever lose to him again, but that of course brings on the problem we have here at Survivor Series. Vince McMahon asked Brett time and time again to drop the belt to Sean, and Brett consistently refused. He had a creative control clause written into his contract that legally gave him the right to refuse any storylines or match outcomes placed in front of him before he left, and he'd already worked more dates in 1997 that was already agreed upon in his contract. Brett could have no-showed Survivor Series and there wouldn't have been a thing Vince could do about it. Still, Brett arrived at the arena on the 9th of November 1997 and he and Vince came up with a DQ finish. DX and the Hart Foundation would hit the ring at the end of the match and Brett would leave, still the WWF champion. The plan after that is up in the air but Brett said he would have dropped the belt on Raw or vacated the belt after a promo. So Brett's going into this one thinking it's going to be a disqualification. All this by the way is the most general way I can explain what happened before the match and it's generally the most accepted way that things went down. There's so many stories now from guys who have podcasts, you know, like former wrestlers and announcers and things like that. And there's also a ton of people that want to take credit for what happened, but let's just stick to what happens on TV here. There was a lot of shit going on between Brett and Sean that we have followed all the way through Reliving the War, and some of it was petty while other parts were pretty personal. But in terms of status and in terms of what fans saw on TV, it can't be denied that Brett wasn't losing a ton of hate to Sean Michaels ever since HBK BK turned heel. Bret Hart and the Hart Foundation were the hottest things in WWF from WrestleMania 13 onwards, but once Sean turned heel and formed an alliance with Triple H, Bret really wasn't the baddest guy in town anymore. Still though, if Vince knew he couldn't afford Bret, then all that could have been by design. Before looking at the match, because I know a ton of comments are going to say it, many fans and people within the industry think what happens at the end of Survivor Series was all a big work. It was all set up to play out the way it did and there's too many things that don't add up for a lot of people, such as the fact that Brett had a film crew backstage filming his documentary, that's seen as a coincidence. Keep in mind though, they were filming him since Canadian Stampede by the way. There's the fact that Brett should have saw what was coming a mile off according to Sean Waltman and others. And there's also the fact that everyone involved benefited in some way or another, whether that be financially or creatively. I don't think it was a work because you'd have to be a fucking legit genius to map this all out while guaranteeing everybody wins. And the fact that Brett still gets legit tears in his eyes when talking about Montreal and the fact he held on to his resentment for years upon years also tells me it wasn't a work. But it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility either, I guess. I just don't buy into it. If you're looking for hot takes on why Montreal was a work, you won't find them here unfortunately. All I knew as a kid going into this was that two of my favourite superstars were finally going to go to war and now through making these YouTube videos, we, you and I, have collectively relived this whole feud and we've watched every moment over again. If there was ever a case of guys working themselves into a shoot, there's no better case than Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart. I can confidently say this though, Bret Hart was the fucking man in WWF and he was their most consistent performer. Shawn Michaels was one incredible athlete in the ring and while his consistency was definitely lacking in terms of match bookings, his newfound attitude mixed with his in-ring abilities made him a must-see superstar. I had no idea Bret was leaving when I watched this as a kid. I didn't even pay attention to the numerous WCW Bret Hart or NWO Bret Hart signs in the arena. Montreal certainly knew that Bret was leaving though, but fans in attendance had no idea that they were about to witness the most talked about and infamous match in the history of professional wrestling. We see both men's journey from the locker room to the ring and Sean's entrance is something to behold. He knows what's going to happen going in. He said years later it really wasn't fun being the guy who had to do this shit and it was easily his lowest point but you sure as hell wouldn't think it when he steps out into the arena. Fans are throwing drinks all over HBK and they boo him relentlessly but Sean doesn't care. He grabs a Canadian flag and he disrespects it in a way that only Sean Michaels can and it genuinely feels hostile inside the arena. It's already super intense and we've only seen one guy's entrance. 
The crowd pops as soon as Brett's shown on the big screens leaving his locker room and he comes out to a thunderous ovation. There are fans who weren't happy with Brett leaving too of course, but overall Brett gets a great reception from the audience. Sean's acting like an asshole on the outside, taunting fans and playing up to the camera and Brett just watches him for a moment. He then hands the championship belt over to Earl Hebner and Sean launches an attack on Brett before the bell rings. The crowd pops when Brett fights back and Brett floors Sean before delivering even more punches. Brett headbutts HBK as Jim Ross says the technical expertise of the hitman has been thrown out the window. The hitman then sends Sean over the top rope with a clothesline that had a bit of force behind it. The bell still hasn't rung as Brett does some damage on the outside with HBK bumping on the ring post and the ring steps. Brett then throws Sean right into those same fans that HBK was ripping on before the two started fighting. It legitimately looks unsafe as referees get crushed in the middle of the fans and it isn't long before Brett throws Sean back over the guardrail. And then, for some reason, Vince McMahon is showing up along with Sergeant Slaughter and Pat Patterson. Alarm bells should have been already ringing. Jim Ross confirms there's speculation regarding Brett's future as Sean finally fights back. Brett gets his head smashed on the ring steps, the crowd boos as Sean chokes Brett with an American flag, and Sean decides to take it back into the audience, showing absolutely no fear though to be fair there's more officials now. Sean tries a pile driver but he ends up getting backdropped over the guardrail. Brett kicks Sean in the balls, McMahon screams to get back in the ring but these two are going to fight on the entranceway where Sean takes another backdrop. It's absolute chaos here as officials surround Brett and Sean and they're seriously limiting the space available for the competitors. Even the camera crew have a tough time getting clear shots because there's just too many people. Sean gets suplexed on the rampway, he gets up and he punches Pat Patterson and he throws Brett into referee Tim White. Jerry Lawler says this is nothing but a good old fight and he's absolutely right. The bell still hasn't rung as Brett throws Sean over another guardrail set up beside the entranceway. We then see Vince McMahon telling the guys to get in the ring but Brett continues to throw punches at Sean and at referees. McMahon then gets agitated, he screams at Brett to get back in the ring and Brett agrees. Brett grabs Sean by the hair and the two make their way down to the ring with Sean taking a few shots for good measure. The bell finally rings and Brett chokes Sean with a Quebec flag. We see an inverted atomic drop from the hitman but Michaels replies with his flying forearm and the crowd boos. Sean kicks Brett right in the face, he stumps on Brett's head and Sean then chokes Brett with that Quebec flag. Sean's now taunting the crowd in between offense. He throws Brett in front of some rowdy fans and the language from the fans is quite colorful. HBK's eating it up though, he's beating up their hero and he's getting a kick out of the negative crowd response it seems. Sean performs a front suplex while standing on the ring steps and Brett gets his head slammed on the steel. And Sean breaks a Canadian flag before driving the flagpole into Brett's throat. Back in the ring, HBK lands a double axe handle and he applies a front face lock, the first rest hold of the match. Brett gets out by launching Sean and HBK slams hard on the mat. And then we see some classic hitman offense, he goes for the leg. Unfortunately, that doesn't last too long because Sean rakes Brett in the face before the hitman could truly get started. Brett tries again but another rake in the face stops him in his tracks. The hitman's gasping for air in the corner, HBK goes for a crossbody but Brett rolls through, only getting a two count. Brett though finally does a little damage to Sean's knee and he manages to wrap Sean's leg around the ring post. He then applies the ring post figure 4 and the crowd goes nuts. The damage is now being done. Brett wants to make sure though so he punches the leg, he drops his body weight on the leg at the ropes. He locks in a figure 4 though instead of a sharpshooter but Sean won't give up. HBK screams in pain before reversing the pressure and Brett grabs the bottom rope. The crowd are chanting Brett's name as the hitman lays in more punches and we see the flare corner bump. Brett then performs the Russian leg sweep, the snap suplex and the backbreaker. He then goes to the top rope but Sean grabs the referee and Hebner takes a bump. Sean rakes Brett in the face, the hitman's now down on the mat. Sean applies the sharpshooter and while Brett's in his own hold, Earl Hebner instructs the timekeeper to ring the bell and so does Vince McMahon. Brett grabs Sean's foot for the planned reversal but the match has ended. Shawn Michaels wins the WWF Championship even though Bret Hart didn't give up. The hitman was fucked over, he was screwed. He and Sean look at Vince wondering what's going on with Sean acting like he had no idea why the match ended. Brett spits on Vince and McMahon orders Sean to get the belt and get out of the arena. Sean's escorted back up the rampway by Triple H and Jerry Briscoe and the show fades to black. This is how the pay per view ended right here. 
leaving me completely confused as a kid because I thought Brett just gave up. I, like everyone else who recorded Survivor Series that night, watched those final moments again about 10 times to try to make sense of what happened, and it did start to make sense after watching it over a few times, though I still didn't know Brett was leaving for WCW, and I thought this was going to be some sort of storyline that got resolved on Raw. When the show goes off the air, the Hart Foundation come down to talk to Brad and the hitman's close to tears. He looks absolutely devastated. He eventually lets fans know where he's headed by finger tracing the letters WCW, and he then proceeds to destroy monitors and cameras set up at the commentary tables. He gets brought back to the dressing room by arena security, and when he gets backstage, he asks Sean straight up if he had anything to do with what happened. Sean swears that he had no idea. Sean, you weren't in on that? Fucking idea. I got no place. God's my fucking witness. My hands are clean of this one, I swear to God. He, he's yelling me out there. I gave him a belt when I came back here. I will not have any part of it. Brad takes a shower, he's told by Rick Rude and Davy Boy Smith that Vince is waiting to speak with him, and Brad wants a message delivered to Vince. If McMahon's still there when Brad gets done, he's gonna knock him out. Vince decides he's gonna give Brad a shot, he doesn't leave, so Brad makes good on his promise and according to Brad, he floored Vince with a single punch. Vince fell on Jerry Briscoe and twisted his ankle too or he done some sort of damage to his foot, but Brett's documentary crew managed to record Vince walking away from the dressing room. For now, that was the end of Bret Hart's relationship with Vince McMahon and the World Wrestling Federation. And what can I say, that's Bret done and the company are going to carry on with HBK as champion. It was so shit being a Bret Hart fan and seeing this happen, and even if you weren't a fan of the Hitman, you can still see why it would suck. And yes, I know, as mentioned, people thought this was all a big setup, but even if you fully believe that, it's still a shit way for a legit legend to leave the company. I was devastated. I couldn't, I was, was, I can't even put into words. Join me next week for Reliving the War and we'll see how the company moves forward without one of their biggest superstars. Over on Nitro, the NWO are already getting ready to welcome the Hitman into the family, as WCW now have the most talked about wrestler in the world getting ready to jump ship. Surely they can't fuck this up, right? Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this one and take care. Generation X in your house is the final WWF pay-per-view of 1997, taking place on December 7th. The event drew just under 6,500 fans to the Springfield Civic Center in Massachusetts and are reported 120,000 homes bought the show on pay-per-view, though the exact number isn't confirmed. Whatever it was though, it was low. I do like the concept of wrestlers or factions getting their own pay-per-views, but they never seem to do well in terms of numbers. The matches at DX didn't have much time to build up either though, and it does feel like a show that was kind of thrown together. Shawn Michaels defends the WWF Championship tonight against Ken Shamrock, while Triple H takes on Sergeant Slaughter in a boot camp match. We also have an IC title bout. Steve Austin defends against The Rock. Let's get started and we'll see if D-Generation X in your house was any good.
Our event kicks off with Brian Christopher vs Takamichi no Ku, the WWF are bringing back their light heavyweight championship, and this match right here is the finals of a tournament that's gone on over the past few weeks. Even though the company are crowning a new light heavyweight champion, there still wasn't really a light heavyweight division in the WWF. The company were bringing guys in for a match and we'd never see them again. Taka and Christopher have been the only real consistent light heavyweights, and both guys do have WWF contracts, so it makes sense that these two would meet in the finals. Takamichinoku is the clear fan favourite here, but I really liked Brian Christopher back then. I wanted to see Brian win this one. Taka gets body slammed at the opening bell and Too Sexy laughs at his opponent. Brian laughs again after an arm drag, but the smile gets wiped from his face when the audience chants Jerry's kid. Jerry Lawler's still denying that he's the father of Too Sexy Brian Christopher. Brian's extremely proud of his hip toss and Taka isn't getting a chance to get started here. A German suplex counter though finally gets Taka into the match and the crowd pops after a spinning wheel kick, a drop kick and a clothesline to the outside. We then see Taka's springboard plancha and again the crowd goes nuts. Speaking of the crowd, there's a ton of empty seats at this pay per view. Taka gets crotched on the top rope and Christopher sends Taka back to the outside. Brian's attack from the top turnbuckle totally misses though and Brian legit smacks his mouth on the guardrail. We can see the damage when the two get back in the ring. Daddy Lawler wonders if Brian's lost the tooth as Christopher lands a few punches in the corner. His running attack misses its target though and Taka pulls off a tornado DDT followed by a Hurricane Rana. Taka then performs a springboard moonsault to the outside that looked awesome, and Jerry Lawler says he needs to check on Christopher. The King cleans his son up a little, but Taka knocks Christopher back to the outside, and King tries to fire Brian up a little. Jerry throws Christopher into the ring, and Brian's able to perform his full Nelson face buster. Brian follows this up with a sit down powerbomb, but his cocky pin gets countered, and Brian almost loses the match. Brian goes upstairs, and a missile dropkick finds the back of Taka's head. Brian creeps over to Taka, and he performs a Famouser, and then he says, I think. Think the boy's dead before performing a backbreaker. Taka kicks out at two. Brian slaps Taka across the face, twice. He rakes Mishinoku's face while mocking him with a few crane kicks, and Taka almost goes back in control with a waistlock counter, but it's no good. Taka takes a German suplex, but Christopher's also wasting way too much time in between pin attempts. Brian hits a power slam, he signals for the Tennessee jam, he goes upstairs, and Brian misses his finishing move. Taka performs the Michinoku driver, and that's it over. Taka becomes the light heavyweight champion. This one wasn't bad at all and I thought Christopher was especially good in this match but it wasn't the outcome I wanted. Tony Gurria, Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe present Taka with the light heavyweight championship, Japanese reporters are on hand to snap a few photos of Michinoku, and yeah a good start to the pay per view. The gang wars continued next to Degeneration X in your house. No story, no developments, it's the same shit we've been seeing for months. Los Bariquas vs the DOA in a 6 man tag. Crush and Savio Vega are not involved in this bout. During the match, Miguel Perez Jr seemingly hurt his leg after coming off the top rope and he rolled to the outside. Savio Vega tried to take Miguel's place but the referee wouldn't allow it. Turns out it was all a big setup and Miguel snuck back in the ring after Chains performed a death volley driver on Jose, and this resulted in Los Bariquas winning the match. These gang war matches have become nothing but fillers at this point. Nothing's ever at stake, there's no storyline changes after the bouts, and things remain exactly the same as we head into Raw's War tomorrow night. And hey, not every match on the card can be a main event, there's nothing wrong with the action inside the ring, but fans should be given a reason to care about the match outcome, there's no consequences here, win, lose or draw, and again, it's the same old shit. Doc Hendricks interviews Butterbean. Butterbean's gonna fight Mark Merrow next in a tough man competition. This all started when Merrow's insecurities got the better of him on Raw and he thought Big Butterbean was checking out his wife Sable. Merrow said that Butterbean isn't a real boxer but Mark Merrow is. Butterbean hasn't beaten anybody special whereas Merrow's a former New York State Golden Gloves champion. Butterball says he has been waving at Sable and being a little friendly but only because he feels sorry for Sable. During this interview he gets so angry that he struggles to to finish the promo. The way he treats Sable, I'm ready to. I I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> All right, buddy, we'll just. Michael Cole wonders if Sable's gonna stand in her husband's corner tonight, or does she want some of the big bean in her life? But Sable confirms she's coming to the ring with Mero. Mark shows up, and he wonders who gave Sable permission to give this interview because it certainly wasn't him. Mero tells Sable to stop stealing his spotlight. Mero's gonna destroy Butterbean right now, and the marvelous one makes his way down to the ring for what can only be a complete fucking disaster. At least we get to hear Mero's theme music, though. 
As mentioned, this one's going to be contested as a tough man contest. Tough man contest formats vary from state to state, and the WWF, of course, isn't going to bother looking up any state specific rules. This is a worked match after all. So we've got four two minute rounds, and if it goes the distance, the referee will judge the winner. That seems fair, doesn't it? We get an intense stare down at the beginning of the bout, and Mero starts hamming it up. Butterbean's the aggressor right out the gate. Mero keeps going to the ropes and forcing Butterbean to back off. The crowd chants boring and they chant sable, and then Butterbean lands a punch when Mero once again goes to the ropes. Mero falls out of the ring and the crowd did cheer for this by the way. As soon as the fight resumes, it's back to silence from the audience. The first round ends and you'd probably give it to Mero seeing as Butterbean got in a cheap shot, but Mark gets in a cheap shot of his own after the bell and that's gone in the gate things. Round 1 then, in my book, goes to Butterbean. Round 2 starts with a running knee strike from Marvelous Mark, and Mark chokes Mr. Bean with the tape from his gloves. Mark gets in a few shots, but Big Butt Munch comes back and Mero gets fucked up. Mark then rakes Butterbean's face while wearing gloves. Butterbean's been blinded, and again, Mero gets in a few free shots as the crowd continue to chant boring. This is absolutely shit. After round 2, Mero gets in another cheap shot, this time it's a dropkick, and the crowd doesn't care. Round 3 begins and the mean bean machine presents his jaw to Marvelous Mark, but Mero can't take advantage. Butterbean's all angry here and Mero gets rocked in the corner. Mero clinches the bean and the two then slug it out. With 9 seconds left of the round, Butterscotch lands a haymaker and Mark gets saved by the bell. Mark's on Dream Street right now and Butterbean wakes Mero up with a bucket of ice cold water. A big old right hand knocks Mero down at the beginning of round 4. Mero replies with a low blow and the referee disqualifies Mero. So everything Everything else in this fight was perfectly legal except the low blow. Got it. Mark attacks Butterbean with his corner stool and Mark falls on his ass while getting out of the ring. The crowd laughs as Butterbean throws some shit at Mero like an angry gorilla and Big Butthole chases Marvelous Mark back up the entranceway. I can't say enough bad things about this match. This was awful. The artist formerly known as Goldust comes to the entranceway with Luna and they're wearing something, and Luna says the artist wants to express himself tonight. Golda says this is a little ditty he wrote, but the crowd needs to shut up if they want to hear it, and he begins reading I am Sam, I am, based on Dr. Seuss's green eggs and ham. The crowd boos this, they don't know what to make of it. Golda tells the fans to shut up as he continues reading the book until eventually Luna pushes him on his ass, before grabbing his chain and telling him to quote, come on you scum suck. <laughs> JR and the King have no idea what they just witnessed. Between the Tough Man contest and the Goldust promo, the commentators seem to be just a little confused. Two weeks ago, the Road Dog Jesse James and Badass Billy Gunn defeated the Legion of Doom for the tag team titles. They won the belts and they ran away like thieves in the night, and the following week they took great delight in mocking the Road Warriors for being yesterday's news. Hawk and Animal want to win those belts back tonight. Animal says the Legion of Doom are still the best tag team in the WWF. And Hawk? Uh, Hawk talks about how the current tag team champions remind him of Boogers. Boogers stuck up Hawk's nose that the Road Warrior can't reach, but when he does, he picks it and he flicks it. Yeah. Road Dog and Badass have their familiar music. Road Dog talks smack on the way to the ring. The only thing missing still is the name of their tag team. They still haven't been named the New Age Outlaws. Road Dog tells the fans not to feed the dinosaurs during the entrance, and the Road Warriors chase the champs back up the entranceway. Officials have to block the curtain, and the Legion of Doom end up bringing the heels down to the ring where Road Dog gets whipped with his own tag team belt. Animal hits Road Dog with a clothesline, Haw comes in and he lands a dropkick. Road Dog tries to fight back, but he takes takes a neck breaker and Hawk wipes out both champs with a clothesline from the apron to the outside. Back in the ring, Hawk pulls on Road Dog's nose and James gets his head whacked on the announce table. Animal comes in and Road Dog gets powerbombed after trying to leapfrog one too many times, and Billy Gunn's forced to run in and break up the cover. The champions find themselves on the outside where the Road Warriors do more damage and the future New Age Outlaws decide they've had enough. They try to leave the arena but they get caught again and the commentators are now confused about who's the legal man. Road Dog smashes a WWF ice cooler over Hawk's back and Billy Gunn uses a two over Hawk's head. Gunn and Hawk then eventually resume the action back in the ring with Billy slowing things down on the mat. The two then take each other out with a double clothesline and an accidental bump in the corner and this leads to Animal and Road Dog getting tagged in and Animal cleans house. We see clotheslines, part slams and shoulder blocks from Animal and Road Dog ends up in the ring all alone with the Road Warriors. 
James gets wiped out with corner clotheslines, the Legion of Doom signal for the Doomsday device, but here comes Henry Godwin with a slot bucket. Didn't we see this already months ago? Animal gets whacked by Godwin, but Hawk grabs the bucket. Road Dog and Billy Gunn get taken out. The referee calls for the bell, and that means Gunn and James get disqualified, but they also keep their tag team championship belts. This match wasn't bad, but it wasn't very competitive either. Basically, it's the Road Warriors wanting to kick another tag team's ass, and this is all it needed to be, really. Sergeant Slaughter returns to the ring next for a match against Triple H. Hunter got personal with Slaughter a few weeks back by talking about Slaughter's wife and saying he'd make Mrs. Slaughter see what standing the attention was really all about. DX also attacked Slaughter, but the Sarge didn't really care about getting pedigreed. He was more annoyed about the personal comments Hemsley made. After the bootcamp match was announced, Triple H didn't seem to care all that much, saying that Slaughter's announcement promo was the same old thing he watched as a kid and it's still as lame now as it ever was. So let's see if the Sarge can teach this maggot a lesson in this no disqualification contest at Degeneration X. Hunter says this isn't Slaughter's generation, this isn't the next generation, this is the generation. X marks the spot, and when Hunter gets done, he'll show there's no hard feelings by visiting Slaughter's house and letting his old lady smoke on Hunter's peace pipe. How very edgy of you, Mr. Helmsley. Slaughter, meanwhile, says he may be old, but he's not dead. This old jarhead's gonna beat that puke Triple H up pretty bad, and that's an order. So Slaughter's ordering himself to beat up Triple H, I guess. Sarge makes his way down to the ring, Hunter tells him to get his chin on these balls. And here we go, Slaughter took a stone cold stunner on Raw like a champ and he took the pedigree well too, so let's see how well he does tonight. He's around 49 years old here, but moving around well while hitting Triple H with a riding crop. Triple H gets whipped across the back, across the face, Sarge kicks Hunter in the midsection and he pulls off a gut buster. Expectations were low, not gonna lie, but Slaughter's keeping it simple here and staying within his limits. On the outside, Triple H gets his head slammed on the ring steps and the punishment continues when the commissioner drops Hemsley on the guardrail. Slaughter then covers Hunter on the outside and the referee refuses to count. It's kind of funny how this is Slaughter's speciality match and he forgot the rules, although they're probably making it up as they go along. The belt comes off in the ring and Hunter gets whipped. Hunter's done absolutely nothing so far and he better get his act together as Slaughter tightens the belt around Hunter's neck. Slaughter then hits a clothesline and he signals for the Cobra Clutch, but Hunter kicks the Sarge away and the commissioner gets sent over the top rope after a pretty impressive corner bump. Man, Sergeant Slaughter wasn't afraid to bump in 1997, not afraid at all. Hunter sends the Sarge into the ring steps and Slaughter finds himself on the wrong side of the guardrail. One punch sends Sarge back over and Triple H decides he wants the ring bell. Mark Eaton though fucking loves that ring bell and he doesn't feel like handing it over, so Triple H clocks him with it and he goes to attack Slaughter. Slaughter counters with a clothesline, we see a shot of the timekeeper and he's out cold. And when we cut back to the competitors, Triple H smacks Sarge with the ring bell, so it wasn't all for nothing I guess. Back in the ring, Hunter uses Slaughter's belt to launch the commissioner across the ring, China hands Triple H a small chain, and Sarge gets rocked in the face, twice. Sarge kicks out of the follow up cover and he tries to use the chain himself, but he gets backdropped out of the ring. The competitors had the crowd at the beginning of the match, but it sounds like they're losing him. There's a hush in the arena here and it's not good. They do get the crowd back a little when Hunter jumps off the top rope and Slaughter gets a boot up. Slaughter's absolutely wrecked though and he doesn't have the power to body slam Hemsley, but he does have the strength to counter his suplex. You could hear Triple H calling the spot here and you can clearly see Hunter telling Slaughter his next spot. Slaughter goes upstairs and Triple H counters with a big slam. Hemsley then applies a sleeper, the crowd's dead once again. This sleeper stays in for a pretty long time, but the crowd get back into it when Slaughter counters with the Cobra Clutch. China gets in the ring, she shoves the referee and she rakes Slaughter in the eyes. Jack Doan tries to send China out of the ring, but he takes a forearm to the face and China decides to grab a chair. She lines up her shot, she lifts the chair high in the air, but the Sarge has only gone and dipped into Sean's funny pack and China gets blinded with that sweet, sweet white powder. China falls out of the ring, Triple H attacks Slaughter with his boot, the stench knocks Slaughter down, but he gets his ass up and he locks in the Cobra Clutch again. This should be it all over, Helmsley's fading away, but China hits Slaughter with a stiff kick right in Slaughter's privates and that's the end of our match. Triple H pedigrees Slaughter on the chair and Triple H wins the bootcamp match. 
It wasn't great to be honest, but as mentioned, expectations weren't high going into this one either. A member of DX has just defeated the WWF's main authority figure though, and it's kinda symbolic of the whole you make the rules and we'll break them mentality that DX has. If only there was another authority figure who could step up and try to restore some sort of order. Someone who would give his detractors no chance in hell. Jeff Jarrett's finally going to wrestle when he steps into the ring with The Undertaker. Jarrett put himself over big time when he returned to the World Wrestling Federation, acting like the second coming of God himself by ripping into the current roster while also tearing into Vince McMahon and Eric Bischoff. Jarrett wouldn't wrestle on Raw after getting booked twice. He wasn't happy with his locker room, the food, the water, his selected opponents, and the lack of promotion the WWF put behind his TV matches. So Commissioner Slaughter gave Jarrett exactly what he wanted, a big match on paper review against a legend of the WWF, the phenom himself, The Undertaker. Jarrett says that winning tonight's match will be his ticket to the WWF Championship. Jarrett beats the dead man, he becomes the number one contender, and it's just a matter of time before the world's greatest wrestler wins the big one. Jeff comes out in his dog shit gear and gotta say, his theme music's pretty good. It could do without Jeff talking over the top of it, but it's a pretty good Jim Johnson creation here. The Undertaker makes his entrance and the mood instantly changes in the arena. Like The Undertaker or not, the man had the crowd in the palm of his hand as soon as he stepped out on the entranceway every time he was booked for a show. So there's maybe a bit of intrigue here, would Jeff wrestle a different style, would he change how he goes about his matches, or is this the same Jeff Jarrett only now with questionable ring gear? Well he's still cocky, that's for sure, he manages to punch The Undertaker but he won't follow up, instead he gets backed into a corner where he has no choice but to fight back but he's doing no damage at all. The dead man destroys the self-proclaimed world's greatest wrestler and Jeff realises he may have fucked up by coming back to the WWF. Undertaker hits a clothesline on Jared and Jeff gets his head whacked on the top turnbuckle. The dead man performs old school, always good to see, and Jeff gets choked in the corner. Jared's able to stun Taker with a back elbow and he tries an aerial attack but the dead man grabs him by the throat and this really could be the end. Jeff readjusts his strategy though when he remembers what Ric Flair taught him in the Four Horsemen and he escapes by going after the leg. The leg and knee then become a target and this seems to be an effective game plan, but one that Jared can't fully deliver. Taker shakes off quite a lot of punishment and he delivers a backbreaker followed by a big leg drop. We then see a big boot, Jared gets thrown in the corner and the lights go out in the arena. The Undertaker's little brother's here and he's gonna step into the ring to confront the dead man. This is the first time Kane and Taker have stood in the ring together since Bad Blood. It's pretty intense here and we're unsure what's gonna happen. Kane decides to take out Jarrett first with a choke slam, allowing the devil's favourite demon to get a little closer to the Undertaker and look at his brother right in the eyes before slapping him hard across the face. Kane's trying to bait his brother into fighting him but Taker already said he wouldn't fight his own flesh and blood. Kane sets off his pyro, The Undertaker doesn't flinch, and Kane leaves the ring along with Paul Bearer. Let's just call it as we see it, Kane bitch slapped his bitch brother. Jarrett wins via DQ, there's an awful lot of DQs in this pay per view, and he celebrates by trying to put The Undertaker in the figure 4. But Taker grabs Jarrett and he's so fired up that he almost throws Jarrett over his head when trying a choke slam. It results in the choke slam looking a little weak if I'm honest, but still, Taker leaves the ring and Jarrett celebrates a DQ victory. In terms of re introducing Jarrett to WWF audiences, I'd say this wasn't good. It's the exact same Jeff Jarrett we have watched over the last year on Nitro, trying to convince people he's better than what he truly is. Thankfully though, he will get involved in something a little more interesting very soon. Speaking of reintroductions, Michael Cole interviews Mark Henry in the audience. Mark's been away for quite some time but he's remained under contract and he's getting prepared for a return to WWF television. Henry's hanging out with the sponsors, the boys at Milton Bradley. Mark says he's looking forward to his big return but right now he's rooting for Stone Cold in the next matchup. The IC title's on the line, it's Austin vs Rock, though Rock has possession of the IC championship belt. 
The night after Survivor Series, Austin granted Rock a shot at the IC title, but Rock decided to steal the belt the following week while Austin was dealing with other members of the nation. Stone Cold tried to get it back by surprising Rock with a 316 message on Rocky's pager, but Rock was still able to escape with the title. And just this past week on Raw, Austin sent another message to Rocky by driving into the arena in his pickup truck and blaring ACDC's Back in Black during Rock's match with Vader. Shit's on tonight, this is the first Rock vs Austin match to take place on a WWF pay-per-view. Rock cuts a promo before the match and it's Rocky doing all the talking now. Farouk doesn't say a word and you never really saw this during Nation promos before Rock joined the group. Rock says he's gonna show why he's the best damn intercontinental champion there ever was before making his entrance and Rock's got all the heat tonight. Have a listen. The crowd lose their minds though when Austin drives right up to the ring in his stone cold pickup truck. Austin gets in the ring and the fight's on. Look at the crowd standing on their feet. The nation attack Austin, it's an absolute beatdown before the match even begins. Dilo tries to run at stone cold and he gets backdropped onto the truck's windshield. Austin then hits a stone cold stunner on top of his ride and good god this crowd is finally waking up, this is awesome. Stone cold gets back inside the ropes, the bell rings and we see the Luthez press as the crowd continues making noise, but Austin quickly finds himself on the outside again and the nation launch another attack. The faction bring Austin to the pickup truck, Kama grabs a chair, Austin moves out of the way and Farouk gets cracked. Kama then gets whipped hard into the truck and a loud Austin chant breaks out in the arena. Back in the ring, Rock's able to take advantage and he hits a low blow while Kama distracts Mike Kyoto. Austin gets hit with a hard right hand, he gets choked at the ropes. Rock kicks and punches Austin in the corner but Austin fights back with a few right hands of his own. Rock's able to body slam Austin in the middle of the ring, we see the people's elbow and there's a chin lock from the future great one. Could this match get any better? The crowd are now chanting 316 and this could possibly be Austin's biggest babyface reaction we've seen so far in reliving the war. Springfield loves Stone Cold and this match really feels like a shot of adrenaline to this pay per view. Rock goes for a second people's elbow but Austin moves out of the way. More more right hands from the rattlesnakes send Rocky to the corner and Austin proceeds to stomp a mud hole in his opponent. Austin then ducks a clothesline, he goes for the stunner but he's distracted by Kama on the apron. Austin takes out Kama and he tries to pick up where he left off but he ends up accidentally stunning the referee. The cameras unfortunately miss this. Rock puts on some brass knucks, he swings at Austin but Austin ducks it and we see the stunner. Another referee runs down to count to three and the bell rings but if you look closely Mike Kyoto is waving for a DQ. Either way, Austin got what he came for, he got his IC championship belt back. The finish of the match is quite important though and often overlooked because the controversy surrounding the ending leads to Steve Austin making an important decision tomorrow night on Raw. Good match though and definitely the match of the night so far. Shawn Michaels won the WWF Championship at Survivor Series and Shawn's biggest rival left the company following the infamous title match in Montreal. Sergeant Slaughter announced the next night that Ken Shamrock's the number one contender for the title and Ken gets his shot tonight at D-Generation X. The build up has been terribly basic with the best moment being Sean getting in the zone and showing the world how he's prepared himself for the ankle lock. Triple H twisted Sean's foot a full 360 degrees while Sean sucked a lollipop, but later in the night Shamrock applied the ankle lock and Sean topped out, still sucking the lollipop. I mentioned on Reliving the War that I really didn't feel Ken should have been in this title match, he did an amazing job at Survivor Series in a pretty much forgotten traditional Survivor Series match against the nation and he was getting good crowd reactions to but let's face it, he wasn't gonna win the belt at an event named D-Generation X and he and Sean didn't have much story going into this one either. Sean did mention that Shamrock was a friend of Bret Hart's on TV and Sean wanted to wipe out the hitman's friend seeing as he already took out the whole family, but that's all there is here really. Shamrock says when he gets in his zone tonight there'll be a lot of hurting going on and HBK's gonna squeal like a baby. HBK's got on some sweet ring gear and he says tonight he shows Shamrock why he's the number one one guy not only in the WWF but in the entire wrestling industry. Girth Brooks, you fat tub of goo. Thanks a lot. Sure, anytime. The confidence is pouring out of HBK as he, Hunter, and China get prepared behind the curtain. The D Generation X team plays in the arena and Sean makes his entrance, getting a surprisingly decent crowd response. 
I'm hoping this match surprises me though, I haven't watched this one in a very long time and I've got it in my head right now that it's nothing special. I thought the same thing about other matches I've covered on the channel and the matches turn out to be way better than I remember, so let's see what happens when HBK meets the world's most dangerous man in tonight's main event. Sean immediately mocks Ken's fighting stance but he quickly backs off when Shamrock goes to attack. The veteran then lays in a few right hands, there's a lot of speed as Sean hits the ropes and it makes Shamrock's kick look all the better. Sean takes the kick right on the chest and the WWF champ's gonna get a little reassurance from his DX teammates on the outside. HBK tells JR and the King where he's hurting, right below the pecs, JR says he couldn't care less. Earl Hebner calms Shamrock down as Sean gets back in the ring, Sean hides in the corner, the two go back to work with HBK applying a wrist lock and Shamrock grabbing Sean by the throat and throwing the champ in the corner. Sean gets launched across the ring, he takes a back body drop, the flare corner bump then sends Michaels back to the outside and the damage is so bad that Hunter decides to give HBK a quick massage. DX huddle up and they come up with a plan. China's gonna distract Ken on the apron, Sean's gonna sneak up and yeah that didn't work. Sean holds onto the ropes after an Irish whip and he decides the best thing to do in this situation is to spit on your opponent. I like how Earl Hebner acted like it was reptiles acid spit from Mortal Kombat. Sean then lays in the punches in the corner but he gets pie faced, twice. Ken brings Sean down with a body shot, we see a vertical suplex from the world's most dangerous man and there's a ton of velocity as Michaels gets clotheslined out of the ring. Sean rocks all fired up tonight at Degeneration X, so much so that he almost smacks Earl Hebner but he focuses his anger and he smiles Smashes Sean and Hunter's heads together. Still, Sean rakes the eyes and he slides back in the ring, going on to lay in more punches but getting stopped in his tracks after a sunset flip attempt. Shamrock again grabs Sean by the neck and Ken goes to work in the corner. Sean loses his smile once again after getting his little degenerate smashed on the top rope. Ken then tries to end it with a belly to belly but Sean holds on to Earl Hebner, eventually hitting Ken with a low blow and sending Ken out of the ring with a clothesline. Sean skins the cat and he distracts her long enough for Triple H to get in a few cheap shots. HBK then delivers a flying crossbody from the top to the outside and Michael seems to be in control now for the first time in this match. Sean hits a baseball slide but he misses the second. The numbers are too much though for Kenny Boy and China sends Shamrock into the ring post. Sean gets back in the ring to distract the ref and Ken gets body slammed by the ninth wonder of the world and Sean delivers a splash from the apron. It's 3 on 1 here and it looks like it's all over for Ken Shamrock. Ken gets thrown back inside the ropes and Sean lands his elbow drop to Shamrock's back. We see a drop kick from HBK, Sean chokes Ken in the corner and on the middle rope, giving Triple H another opportunity to punch Ken in the face. Shamrock gets a chance when he rolls through after a crossbody but he only gets a two count. The heartbreak kid rakes Ken in the face again and he brings it down with a chin lock. Shamrock breaks free and he manages to cover Michaels but Sean kicks out, HBK hits a clothesline and we then see a sleeper from the champion. Ken breaks free by ramming Sean into the corner, HBK gets hit with a few hard clotheslines and we see a big back body drop from Ken. The challenger then delivers a jumping back elbow and a power slam and Ken's now in the zone. We see the Frankensteiner, this usually gets followed up with the belly to belly and the ankle lock, but Sean manages to perform a crucifix, Ken counters with a cover, but a thumb to the eye stops Ken's momentum and then this happens. Shamrock's head snaps across the top rope and it didn't look very pretty. Shamrock looks dazed as he counters a Hurricane Rana with a sit down powerbomb. Sean then decides to distract the referee again, allowing Hunter and China to pull Shamrock out of the ring. And I could be wrong here, but I think an audible might have been called and we're going straight to the finish due to Ken's accident on the top rope, but don't quote me on that. You do see Sean communicating with practically everyone after the powerbomb though. Shamrock gets back in the ring, Michaels hits his diving elbow, he then warms up the band but Ken counters with a belly to belly. Ken then applies the ankle lock and Hunter and China hit the ring. It's a DQ finish and the crowd boos. You can see fans filing out right away, they don't care to hang around but they're gonna miss something pretty good here. Shamrock takes a beating inside and outside the ring and Sean celebrates on the apron. Someone then pushes Sean and HBK goes through the announce table and it's Owen Hart. Owen beats the hell out of Michaels with a ton of right hands and he escapes just before Hunter and China grab him. And look at that push again on the replay, that looked pretty good. Shamrock gets brought back up the entranceway by officials and even after getting jumped by Brett's younger brother, Sean still gets back in the ring to celebrate. 
There's so many empty seats as the cameras continue to roll, but there you have it. Owen Hart's back in the World Wrestling Federation, Sean retains the title, and yeah, the match wasn't really any better or any worse than what I remember it being. I think HBK relying on Hunter in China kinda takes away from the match, and I know he's a heel and all that, but you kinda prefer seeing Michaels go one on one with no bullshit. The pacing felt a bit off in this one, and I do think they went home a little earlier than planned, but in all honesty, it's not a match I'd rank very highly. It's possible, but both guys have had way better matches. Are you ready? Degeneration X in your house wasn't great. I thought Rock vs Austin was good though and the opening light heavyweight match was pretty fun too, but that's about it. Half the matches on this show end in disqualification too, and that lends itself to the idea that this show was kinda thrown together without much thought as mentioned at the top of the video. Again, I like the idea of a DX pay per view and I like the idea of NWO sold out also, but clearly I'm in the minority because both shows didn't do too well, and it's funny how the actual in ring action on both shows wasn't great either except for one or two matches, so I'd say go out of your way to watch Rock vs Austin just for the energy in the crowd, but you could probably skip the rest. Thanks for watching though guys, and hopefully I'll see you all next Thursday for Reliving the War. Take care. Yeah, a little.